to Andy to start with a karakia for the morning. Uh, Thank we, we stand for the karakia? Yeah. Please stand, everyone. Kia ora koutou, nga mihi mahana ki uh, koutou kua hui hui mai tēnei rā. No mai haere, rā, haere mai ki tēnei hui. Oh, look, it's going to be a big one. Good morning, warm welcome um, to this meeting, to all our visitors and uh, greetings to staff and councillors. It's going to be a good day. Got a lot to get through, so... First of all, apologies. I have apologies from Councillor Gallagher for uh, lateness and an unapology from Councillor Bunting, who's actually really here, so that's good. Apologies for being here, mate. we accept anyway? So move and second that Bunting is here and Martin Gallagher is not at the moment. But all, all in, all in favour? Uh, confirmation of the agenda is as it's been pre-circulated. Someone please move. Councillor O'Leary, Councillor Wilson, all in favour? Any declarations of interest, members? There being none, we'll move past that. And now we move into our public forum. Welcome to everyone who's taken the time to come and speak with us today. I think this is a really important part of democracy and I always welcome this opportunity for the public to come and speak to topics on the agenda. So I'll go down the list as I have it. You have five minutes to talk. Um, if you go a little less than that, uh, that leaves a bit of time for um, some questions from the floor. Now, the questions won't be in the form of debate. They will just be around making sure they fully understood the message that you're bringing with it to us today. Um, I like to enable councillors to have questions because I think that's really important. So. I won't be too strict on time, but we do have a long day ahead of us, so that we'll have to pretty much stick within certain time boundaries. So first up today, we've got Roger. Welcome, Roger. You're talking on item seven around the proposed budget. Yes? That's correct, Your Worship. Reflecting on the proposed budget changes, want to, I, I wanted to comment on the, especially about the six mayoral proposals. I note that three of the proposals are relatively high in terms of extra funding over and above the 10 year plan for the coming annual plan 2020-21 year. That's economic development, environment, community engagement. So on your brochures would be A1, A2, A5. Now they're, they're rather, rather especially high and the $75,000 allocated for the Maori strategy, I, I thought could be, a, could be tackled this year with a it's, it's relatively low, and I would prefer money going to the community engagement to go toward the Māori strategy in preference. Now, I understand that there's a one-year delay to balancing the books as a result of these proposed changes. I just wanted to point out there may be some more risk than indicated. If we look overseas, what's happening in like-minded countries such as the United Kingdom, for instance, we're seeing that they're racing full steam ahead with resolving their and wrapping up their lingering issues and I'm referring, of course, to the Brexit deal. So we are, the 10-year plan discussions, we've been 
you have been wanting to balance the books as your top priority, or at least the previous council under the previous mayor. I finally, I believe that the idea of the business council partnering, which her worship has raised, should be canvassed thoroughly with the public. That's all I have this morning. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Roger. Any questions on that? I, um, it's not the right time of the agenda for me to talk to the annual plan changes because it doesn't come up to item seven, but just want to uh, make some opening comments that might be helpful in terms of the um, commentary around Mayor's proposals. The, um, I think Ewan had the best way of describing the other day when he said there are no protected species in this plan. So all of the proposals, whether they come under the banner, which is a little bit of a um, uh, little bit off, mayoral proposals, councillor proposals or others, all of those are open for consideration today. The mayoral proposals, I guess, indi are an indication of those projects that have been socialised with the senior management team and the chief executive and are top uh, priority for the discussion. Having said that, the councillor's proposals and anything else have the same degree of weight attached to them for this conversation because this is to inform the draft plan. This is not the final um, decision-making point for council. So this is about what proposals might go forward to, to the draft plan when we'll have all the financials um, with us. Uh, and we'll be looking at those all in depth. But there's no one project that rates over another in the discussion today. Oh, well, thank you very much for clarifying that, Your Worship. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Annie Williams. Kia ora. And may I say, while you're getting comfortable, thank you for the excellent work that you're doing in the Enderley community. Oh, oh. We acknowledge it. We know that the community is much better off for the work that you do. Thank you. Kia ora. Thank you, Paula. <coughs> uh, kia ora, everybody. <coughs> Sorry, I got thrown under the bus on this, so I've got to just put that on the table first. But never mind. You know, at the end of the day, it's about our, our, um, our home. It's about our community, it's about our neighbourhood and about the well-being of each and every one of us. But anyway, so I'll get on with it. Five minutes? Oh, gosh. <laughs> All right, so um, <clears throat> most of it's in here. Uh, and, that, and this is my friend, Tracy. Uh, and that, and uh, we represent Enderley um, uh, community uh, and uh, specifically the Annie's Corner, Hamilton, New Zealand. Um, kai kaupapa, clothes, kaupapa, shoes, you name it, we have it for free to um, anybody that is in need of, of these kinds of things. Um, and that, you know, thank you to our wonderful donors who fly, st throw stuff into our, our, our gate every day. Yeah. Uh, and that, and um, we, we operate with a team of volunteers from right across the city. So that's Annie's Corner. Just a short update there. So, um, you know, getting straight on to it, um, the submission. Now, um, our submission is uh, taken from the Enley Park Community Centre business case, um, uh, with B2, attachment 8, and item 7. Um, the Enley Park Community led development. So uh, we're, we're only a couple of streets away from our community centre, and um, what I've got two points to raise today, uh, and the first one is I was very concerned about the we were very concerned about the community profile snapshot um, in that in that um, in that uh, draft plan, and you know those statistics um, were concerning that our community um, well-being is not in a good state. Um, and that, and uh, I, I, I'm not quite sure whether you councillors have looked at those stats, but you know we were immediately um, 
taken back by those stats. And, and immediately it tells us, of course, yes, we agree with council that um, you know it is our well-being, um, and that it's not actually, it's not a building, it's a people, um, and that so uh, uh, because I will get onto the building in a minute. That that is my corridor number two, um, and that so so it's a well-being. So you know what what we are saying is that. Um, Rather than uh, council focusing on throwing us some money for our building, we we really need the money thrown at us for our well-being. Um, Annette, you know the bottom line is, and please, I need to do a bit of a growl here. You know our building has been falling down for a long, 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 long time. Uh, we've had money thrown at it here, there and everywhere. Um, and that so now we've got quite a bit of money. I mean, $60,000 is actually not that much. And, and, and if we're going to be talking about repairing our building, then where does the welfare and well-being and health of our community lie in that, in that picture? Um, and that, so, so um, you know, what we're saying is, number one, uh, the profile snapshot stats are not good. Our community uh, is unwell, and um, we need to step up there. So, uh, what we're saying is, we support. A, we will support a deeper engagement. Uh, we feel is needed on the ground to gauge from community neighbourhoods the aspirations for the immediate future and long term. Uh, uh, going forward, um, and that so uh, now I'm going to get onto that building. Um, I've already done my growl about the building, so that that was it. That was being very polite. Uh, yeah, um, but but you know, let's get to the building now. Number two, we feel that the building has been left for so long now. What's another five or ten years? Uh, when it is at the cost of the welfare and well-being of our community, our neighbourhoods, what uh, people need uh, happening um, uh, for for the to get us healthy and well, um, and there have been suggestions flying around, and we support the council's uh, notion. Sorry, it's coming off my head now. Um, in regards to. Uh, potential ownership deals, um, and that we 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 like the idea in our neighbourhood about being your own boss, because mm. we are our own bosses at Annie's Corner. Um, and the secret to that is we don't we don't operate on money. You can be your own boss without money. That's what we're saying. Um, and that it's the difference with our our co-papa Annie's Corner is that we don't turn over revenue. We don't turn over money, um, and that. But I think it's a be your own boss thing. Uh, Tracy here um, has been looking and searching for somewhere, for example, that she can set her retro wand clothing up. Um, and that we have another lady in our community who is looking for somewhere to set her Maori restaurant slash cafe up, um, and her. Unique difference would be she would be encouraging Korero Māori ka nuhi ki te ka nuhi i roto i te reo Māori. Mm -hmm. um, and, that, and a family atmosphere type. Mm. And, you know, she's been looking at the Endley Centre, which has a registered kitchen. A good kitchen. And a good kitchen. Huge kitchen. Yeah, I, I've, I have been around that kitchen myself over the years. So... Um, those sorts of things. So be your own boss stuff um, is is part of the welfare and well well being and uplifting our community. So so pretty much those two, um, those two, and that. So um, yes, we do support uh, the sixty thousand um, uh, for council to approve that, please, for our, our community. But I, I believe that our focus would be on supporting the Papa Nui Trust. Mm. 
that is there at the whare. Um, and that, so we need to um, engage uh, in them, with them. And uh, yeah, we need to throw some money there, to be honest. Um, in that year. So we need to throw some money there at Te Papa Nui Trust. You know, at the end of the day, we all don't like to throw money around when we don't know who we're throwing it to and how that money is going to be entrusted in those people or that person. Um, and that sometimes we've got to rise above those that mindset and to Papa Nui Trust, albeit that they're only newly formed, we need to give them the chance and the opportunity to take that leadership role. Um, and in doing so, we allow the community to, um, you know, to uphold what, what Papa Nui Trust uh, uh, stands for, and they're all about the welfare and well-being of, of our people in our community. So I'm going to end that there now. Um, and that, yeah, thank you, Keish. <laughs> oh, yeah, so thank you very much, guys. Pretty much, that, that's pretty much it. Yeah, the facility can wait, please. You know, we, we can all, we can have a community, big, huge fundraising thing. Um, and that, but we really do need the money for other things. That 60 grand is really not much, is it? Yeah, not enough, yeah. Really. and we've been waiting long enough, please. There's so many projects that people want to do, but I do feel that, um, uh, um, yeah, my friend, yeah, it needs to be a face to face with people on the ground. Yeah. So I'm putting the invitation out, Annie's Corner is, for councillors yeah. to come down, uh, put their tents up when we're running. We get 300 people in our gate on Sundays. Uh, and that, so when we're running and they can capture the crowd and ask them directly to their face what, what is it that they need in, in, in our and getting well, we've Ooh, got to get well. Okay. All right, so <laughs> kia ora. Thank kia ora, you. Kia ora. Thank you for coming, appreciate that. Moving on to the next presentation. You have a question, a question for clarification on that? Yeah? Councillor Hamilton. Oh, is he on? Oh, sorry. Hey, Sorry about that. <laughs> What was that? Oh, kia ora. And Annie, I just had a question yes. for you, and thanks for your corridor and um, the kaupapa that you're involved with. You just mentioned don't throw money at it, don't throw money at buildings, throw it at us. I was just yeah. wondering what sort of things would you best see that money enabling you to do to achieve impact in your community? Um, well, I think, you know, the, our, our councillors, that, um, our, our, the ones that work out, out in the community, you know, of course, they will need money to actually start to do what they need to do. Um, and that, so that's where I see the money going to. The money needs to go to them to start up what they need to start up together with the Papa Nui Trust. And could you just elaborate, the, what, what sort of things could they do that would best help the people? Oh, you, now you're talking about something else now. I, th I think um, I think because of time today, I think it would be yeah. good to take this offline and have a conversation with Annie and um, okay. yeah. Mark and Kesh about what they know around the way that Te Papa Nui Trust works and the activities it's involved in. Yes, I'm up for that. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Rex. Rex. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, just, I'm here um, to just to introduce yourself so that oh, um, the new councillors might know. Yes, I intend doing that. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm uh, here. I'm actually um, the coordinator for Mungiji Gully Restoration Trust, uh, but I'm here today to speak on behalf of the Kirikiri Ra um, Restoration Forum. Um, and I'll just now the forum have put together um, a one-page document for me to present today. Uh, I would prefer speaking um, ab, ab lib, but uh, because it's a, a forum document, I feel as though I should read it. So bear with me. Uh, you worship the mayor, councillors, and council staff. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. 
As I've just, just said, I'm Rex Bushel Coordinator of Mangiti Gully Restoration Trust. And I'm here on behalf of Kirikirira Restoration Forum. Uh, I'm supported uh, here by Lynn Garnham from Tui 2000 on my left here. This forum is made up of nine restoration groups and is uh, organising support from Go Eco. Now, this, um, the actual forum has only, hasn't even been running a year, but I do stress that the members of the forum have been uh, running for some time. Our trust has been running 10 years, and I know Riverley and uh, Munga Tukituki is certainly well before us in Tui 2000. So uh, I'm not sure how far back they go, but certainly well back uh, beyond 10 years. We commend the Mayor and councillors for their support of the restoration groups and hence the various proposals being worked on by parks and open spaces. We refer you to item seven in today's agenda, the proposed budget change, page 27, number 2B1, mayoral proposal. We speak in support of A2, uh, resourcing to support the development of the Environment and Climate Change Work Programme 280,000 increase on operating expenditure. And further, page 31, table three, other elected members' proposals, B1, natural areas funding to assist community work, 100,000. These two proposals of funding changes are important steps. The first ensures that sustainability is developed and embedded within the council operations through a dedicated staffing resource. The second, that the community group, groups are supported to undertake more intensive work in the nature space that they work in. The proposed Nature in the City programme will, in its most basic form, direct work to achieve an increase in the natural flora cover of Hamilton City to, uh, from 2% to over 10%. And I just emphasise here that that 10%, which uh, many of you may well be aware of, is not a target. That is a minimum, and I'm sure Bruce will emphasise this shortly, that is a minimum uh, to, um, for the biodiversity to actually survive and, and progress. <coughs> and, to, uh, and to further in the notes, to protect and enhance the indigenous fauna, which is the animals, uh, with a robust pest control program. Achieving this must be a team effort. On the ground with Hamilton staff, contractors, volunteer res uh, restoration groups and the community, <coughs> particularly the communities that live on the gullies, all pitching in in a coordinated way. Now many of these restoration groups have legal entities. This enables them to apply for funding for vari uh, from various sources throughout New Zealand. Go Eco, acting as a hub, can provide administrative and coordination support in this regard, ensuring that the funding is well coordinated. Hamilton City Council has the opportunity to co-fund some of this restoration work to, to maximise the impact of the efforts on the ground. The proposed 100,000 is a step in that right direction. It will improve the capacity of our groups to to get work done this coming year. We plan to use the funding in a coordinated way across our projects to improve our weed and predator control, achieve administrative support and bolster uh, volunteer participation. In terms of the bigger vision and work program, Nature in the City strategy will direct this. We want to feed into this strategy uh, with our own um, on the ground knowledge and we appreciate the efforts council staff are making in this regard. It's going to have to be more than a partnership, it's going to have to be a co-management with restoration groups for this strategy to work. This proposed funding that you'll be debating today will ensure that sustainability is embedded into uh, your operations and your strategy. It will support restoration groups to have the capacity to get on with and expand their important work. Given the urgency of climate change and the significant threats to biodiversity, supporting this fund is vital 
We urge you not to miss the opportunity to bolster biodiversity in the city and take action with the committee, uh, within the community. Now I'd like just to, just to finish to say that climate change and uh, indigenous biodiversity enhancement you know, run parallel. And we appreciate that both are going to push council outside their comfort zones. There's a lot of science behind both these that, uh, and, te and technology that takes a bit of getting your head around. So we want to actually work with council in the biodiversity side of things and we feel that we've got a lot to contribute and, and make this happen. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. And um, can I, did you want to say a qu quick word, Lynn? We're really getting close to time. But no, I'll no, just fully support the whole proposal. And it's really good now we're actually going to have coordinated and, um, efforts and sharing information between the, the nine groups. It's going to be very helpful, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And that, that's a, a recent improvement to the individualised approach that was being taken, isn't it? Yes, mm -hmm. it is. Mm -hmm. yes. Excellent. Thank you. thank you, and thank you both for the work that you do in your collective patches of the city, without which we'd be far worse off. Um, so that gully restoration project is amazing. Waifakareki, of course, is also a gold star for the city. So we thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. And Bruce, on the same topic, and uh, welcome back. You, Bruce has been uh, um, a tireless advocate for biodiversity and restoration for <coughs> at least the full 18 years that I've been involved in politics, if not more. Don't it? remind me. I <laughs> know <laughs> oh, we do have your submission here, so yeah. we will read that in full. Yeah. So if you yeah. want to just go over the most yeah. important parts. Yeah. Your Worship, the Mayor, Paula, and elected members, I just wanted to first thank you for this opportunity. I'm not going to read out the whole of my document. I'm going to try and go for some key points and emphasise what I see as an emerging trend in this new council of taking a broader, more environmentally focused approach. So I am here today in my capacity as the program leader for a, a research program running out of the University of Waikato called People, Cities and Nature. Um, I'm also um, the chair of Waifakariki Advisory Group, and of course I'm also a ratepayer of Hamilton City. You referred to my numerous submissions over the years already, Mayor. I won't say anything more about those, but I wanted to first congratulate the Council, the Mayor and the Council, on the creation of an Environment Committee. This is fantastic. And also on reaffirming the representation of the Mangai Māori. In the environmental area, Māori, of course, have the longest database on how the environment operates of anybody. And because of that, they, and because they are the kaitiaki of, of our land, water and ecosystems, we need to take notice of what they've got to say. So we support a, an approach which is also being taken in the New Zealand Biodiversity Strategy, and that is the joining of Mātauranga Māori with Western knowledge systems to support actions and innovations that result in thriving biodiversity enhancement and regeneration. For that reason, we strongly support the proposal A3 option two to increase funding for Māori partnerships. I wanted mostly though to obviously focus on the other elected member proposals contained within the attachments seven, nine and 10 of the council paper. And, and we do understand that it's going to take time because we have an existing long-term plan that's been ratified by a previous council to progressively start thinking, have we really got the right balance and right mix of funding in that long-term plan? Um, we're also aware, of course, that development is proceeding apace in Hamilton, and because of that, the impact on natural capital on our environment is increasing and we really do need to do more to compensate and mitigate for making, making up for what is actually an increasing deficit. I'm not going to give you the details of what's happening in our city. I'm sure you're aware of it in relation to particularly to infill development and the loss of trees and green space and also the 
previous removal of the gully protection overlay, which has left some of our gullies exposed to development. And I mean, one not too close from where I'm based has been removed and completely re-engineered. So I'm just making the point that, you know, things are actually still declining. And so our response has to be of an order of magnitude to do something about that. Um, also, I need to note that previous investments made by the council and by the community, all of these hard workers that have already spoken today, have, have been somewhat eroded by the um, policies of the last three previous um, councils. And, and to put it crudely, the gap between development and what is sustainable development is still widening in Hamilton City. Um, for that reason, uh, we strongly support the, the, the lead for the Council to approach the issues of climate change, sustainability and environmental issues, business case A2, option two. Because only with a whole system approach can that gap that I've just mentioned actually begin to be closed. So again, we welcome the early signs of a Council change in direction. Getting right now to the, um, the critical um, other elected member proposals, uh, the point here is that if you take together A2, the mayoral proposal, A3, and the other elected member proposals, B1 and B3, they are at the core of an approach which is now being widely advocated in New Zealand, including by members of Treasury, uh, which is the key to developing sustainable and livable modern cities for the future. That approach emphasises the need to build natural capital along with the other capital, social, human, econ <laughs> economic, of course, which involves financial aspects and infrastructure build. So um, in terms of our recommendations for the other elected member proposals, so we, we consider that the staged approach to the development of Waipakariki, which is presented in business case B3, is the right one and therefore support option three as recommended in the business case. You all know how important Waipakariki is. is. You can read my, my submission. And I, I just, because I don't have time today, I also wanted to signal that we, when I say we, members of the advisory groups and the wider environmental um, groups of, of the city are open to exploring other governance and funding models that might be needed to help address the latest stages of Waifakariki proposal. So um, the case that we've just heard about for supporting um, uh, the natural areas <coughs> proposal, we also strongly support. It's important to reflect now that it is almost five years since the Environment Court order with respect to the Hamilton District Plan, which actually spelled out a number of requirements for this council. I'm not going to read them out, they're there for you to read. By instituting a fund for supporting community-focused programs like those listed in the business case, we'll be keeping the faith with the community, the people you've just heard from. Um, one note of caution, though, is that it's, it's bigger than the six that are listed in the business case, and that's where the network becomes really important, making sure the smaller, less visible groups don't get forgotten about. And I also need to signal, of course, that the implementation requirements for the Ministry of Environment draft national policy statement submissions close this Friday, mm -hmm. and the the development of uh, oh, and the intent of the Environment Court order is that there will need to be a significant upscaling of gully restoration activity, and that should be <coughs> scoped out as soon as possible. So the notion of the 100k as an immediate input is fine. But please don't forget that there's going to be more work needed after that if we are going to achieve the 10% required in the Environment Court order and that is contained within the National Policy Statement. Thank the, you. We need yeah. to... Yeah, sorry. So, yeah, look, thanks for, thanks for the opportunity. <laughs> I've been going a bit too long. I'm just hoping that in your final decision-making you'll take a balanced approach and ensure that all four types of capital are adequately catered for. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. And you've raised a good point for councillors to be aware of because it has been circulating and Sarah's been doing a lot of good thinking on this also around the um, 
biodiversity, the submission on biodiversity and PS. Really important piece of work. Thank you, Bruce, and thank you for all of those many years of work that you've done uh, making our city a better place through uh, your knowledge and expertise. We appreciate that. Joe. Good morning, Joe. Oh, good, Tracy. <laughs> Tēnā koutou, morena. Um, nice to see you again. I think it's the third week in a row. Um, I shouldn't sound so resentful. I thank you for the opportunity. Um, I'm going to cut to the chase this morning because I, I can see the clock ticking down and, um, and be really clear that we support the submissions of the restoration networks as presented by Lynn and Rex and, of course, uh, the good Dr Bruce. Um, we speak in support of the proposed budget changes, specifically the mural changes listed as A1 to A6. The recommend recommendations exemplify the intersectionality of sustainability and wellbeing across cultural, economic, environmental and social domains. It's been 11 months since we delivered our EnviroScan report to the Community and Environment Committee. The EnviroScan sought to bring attention to the systemic issues that created barriers to achieving um, things like a minimum of 10% biodiversity and a preference for double that. We hope to amplify the voice of mana whenua and to create conversation and change for the environmental sector at that time. We acknowledge the efforts of diverse environmental and sustainability communities over the past year to raise the flag for greater resourcing to support and grow well-being. The decision of the previous council to treat climate challenges with urgency upheld the urgent actions and crisis recommendations of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and encouraged many stakeholders to look forward and collaborate on solutions. We commend the Mayor, councillors and council staff on the documented recommendations tabled today and urge this council to consider each of these recommendations as part of a complete set. How they intersect with each other and as a package deal, the impact that they will have on progressing Kirikiriroa, Hamilton and the transition to becoming a truly sustainable city. We are hardened to speak in support of A2 and look forward to working with this very fortunate person. The resourcing to support the development of the Environment and Climate Change Work Programme of 280,000 is an increase in operating expenditure and we note that the relative parity between the economic and environmental proposals, it brings joy to our heart. Um, our experience, though, is that we progress community-based engagement and partnerships. There's an inequity in regards to the resourcing and capacity for engagement with the explicit inclusion of mana whenua. In order to progress towards authentic titidity relationships, we ask that you consider today's proposal A3 as a minimum increase in financial resourcing for Māori engagement and participation in the work of this council and our communities. One way of socialising this work is to address the resourcing with an equity lens. A4 and A5 city engagement events and communications are vital supports for A1 to A3, and A6 is another step towards development and wellbeing for a sustainable city. We also support the elected members' bill proposal B1 for the establishment of the Natural Areas Fund to assist community group work. $100,000. Community organisations and associated groups have maintained ground for 30 plus years on the sweat and tears of volunteers, good will and a deep respect for nature. The establishment of this fund is vital in order to support coordination skills and the life-giving flax roots work of restoration and the protection of natural resources. Approval of this funding proposal will ensure the Council are moving closer to that goal of over 10% biodiversity in the city, real climate action, and for improved environmental and social wellbeing. Ko te mutunga, ora, oranga, he timatanga, he timatatanga kaha. Winning starts with beginning, and we want to take this opportunity to say that this, this 
is a great beginning. Namahi nui kia koutou. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. <coughs> no questions? Thank you. Thank you very much. And that brings us on to, can't quite read the right hand, right? Era. Kia ora koutou. Good to see you here today. Thank you. Um, Morena councillors, um, my name is Ira Peihopa, and in absence of our chair Joe Koti, I'm here representing Te Papa Nui Enderley Community Trust, um, alongside my fellow trustees Wayne Mako and Ngako Makona. Um, so aside from being the deputy chair, I'm also a solo mum raising my teenage daughter in Enderley. And like my um, trustees, they either live in Enderley or they've grown up there, so they've got a special affiliation. And um, we are members of our community who can't ignore the strong need for change. So some of you may be shocked to know that the Waikato plan found Enderley to be the second most deprived community in New Zealand. Um, when comparing national income levels. Um, poverty and all the issues that stem from it is a daily reality for our neighbourhood. Um, we are here to advocate on behalf of our community for council to allocate funding for the um, long-term plan um, around community-led aspirations in our neighbourhood. So who are we? We've um, a newly formed trust in um, as expected, we have had our ups and downs um, getting things started, but we are pretty um, pr pretty excited about the things that we have achieved so far. So, for instance, we've updated our trustee to reflect the aspirations and wants of our community, <coughs> and we've gained legal status. We've built relationships and partnerships to offer meaningful programs, and um, you know, a really short-term priority for us is to see some staff members um, for our community centre. So that would be a centre manager whose um, purpose is around compliance and um, funding and reporting and policies, and a community transformer whose main purpose would be community engagement and programs coordinator. So we know that we can't achieve everything ourselves and we rely heavily on making partnerships. We're in a position now to work with local and central government to um, engage what our community are wanting. So what are we wanting? Our strategic plan outlines that we're all about striving for thriving whānau and strong communities and growing um, our future leaders to restore the well-being of Te Papa Nui, so making Enderley a place where leaders call their home. And we do this through um, creating a community hub at Te Papa Nui, focusing on our kids and making them community champions, um, growing, striving for, sorry, strong whānau um, with the services that we connect to be delivered at the centre and also to strengthen and build cultural awareness because there's a lot of healing in that. So we're here to urge councillors to vote for option two um, for community-led change and enabling your staff to um, investigate community centre options for the wellbeing of our neighbourhood. Aside from um, everyone knowing that our community is in a desperate state, we feel like our community is special because our rangatahi are training for international level competitions. Um, our whānau are improving their health and wellbeing through programs like Rhino Sports Club and um, Patu Kirikiriroa. So that's some kind of 
physical training in the mornings and afternoons. Our tamariki has shown really great promise as leaders in our leadership program that we run after schools, and our rangatahi are growing as confident performers with the likes of Ngākoma, who's um, in the Waikato Hip Hop Academy, um, who make them confident performers that can actually translate off the stage as well. So kia ora koutou. Thank you very much. Thank you. Questions? Quite a few. Oh, yeah, there we go. So it's, uh, sorry, I've got um, Mark first. Questions? Thank but you. These are just for clarity. Yeah, absolutely. Um, kia ora. Thank you for your submission. Can you uh, just speak to the group a little bit about the resilience of your trust, how long you've been um, in action and where you need to go next? Sure, so we've been probably um, established for, we've been running for three years now, but um, we got our kind of legal status probably a year ago. Um, so like any trust, you have challenges and we're wearing both hats sometimes as governance and operations, and we also, all of us, have our own full-time jobs. So we're not quite where we want to be, and that's why we realise we need staff to be able to <coughs> handle um, and take our vision forward. Right, right, cool. Thank you. And just um, how wide is your reach? Is it just Enderley? But to Papua Nui is Enderley Fairfield, isn't it? Well, so we work in partnership with our sister organisation, Te Whare o Te Ata, right. and would acknowledge Isaac's, um, sorry, Shep has left now, but he's done a lot of work bringing that um, whare together. Yeah. Thank you. Hello. Thank you. Councillor Hamilton. Uh, thanks, Chair. Just really, I, I tried it with the previous speaker, get a sense of how we support you and the work that you are doing. What are some of the tangible ways that you guys, as a trust, um, will help to change that deprivation and, and have an impact in individuals' lives? What are the key sort of things you do that we can resource? For example, Morena, um, for example, with our leadership group, we asked them what they wanted, and that's been able, we've been able to use what the feedback from the tamariki to include into their program, which has helped them to thrive. So our plan is to have a whānau led engagement to find what they want and we're developing that now so that we can put their voices forward to be heard and implement that into the plan. So we don't have a response to that question to know exactly what they need because we prioritise a whānau led engagement strategy. Fantastic, thank you. Councillor Forsyth. Uh, thank you all for um, your presentation this morning. Can you just tell me who else, uh, who your other trust members are? Who our other trust members are? Um, so we have Joe Koti as the chair. Um, we have Ira, myself, and Nakuma, and we also have Dominique, um, Dominique Haimwan, Haimona, mm -hmm. and we also have Vicky Young. Okay, and you're all local, you're all... Great, thank you. Um, I just want to understand the, the makeup of your trust and whether you have externals or not, but it sounds like you're completely um, from the Enderley community. We believe in building the capability and capacity of the community. Okay. Yeah, so Do my, all of us, but except for one, um, don't live in... Oh, we all live in the community pretty much, except for one of our trustees. Okay, yeah. cool, thank you. And secondly... Uh, there are other successful community trust groups at the, operating very well in the city. Have you reached out to any of them? And come front of mind for me are Kote Pacifica, uh, Western Community Centre. Have you been able to reach out to them, either formally or informally, and ask uh, what's their secret to success or ask for um, just support around governance, around... Uh, how to make things happen and, and what do they do to shift from where they once were to where they want to be? We recently, last weekend, um, had a governance training with Te Whare o Te Ata, so we're in strong partnership with them and we've met with Andy behind us from Council who has given us some um, actions and that's one of them on the list to speak with um, 
based in community centre about their model, but also we're a part of the Fern Network, so Fairfield Enderley Community Network, which involves about five other community groups in the area, and for us it's about strong partnerships. We're always going to focus on that. Great, thank you. Cool. Thanks. Councillor McPherson. Morena, um, thanks for your presentation. And following Margaret's question, actually, similar lines. Um, last time Enderley Community Centre was operating, it was had staffed by council, and council was doing things for the community. The difference with other community centres, some of which Margaret has just mentioned, including Te Whareha Otaata, is that the community is doing things for themselves through the centre, with some support, perhaps, from council. How you're wanting council to staff, to put in some staffing to start with, but or funding for that? How do you ensure that? Well, sound like that. Sorry, from what you were saying. How do you ensure that the community not only uh, is in control of what's happening there, but builds its capa own capacity without so being just to clarify what Etta said? Um, she mentioned that our priority as a trust is to get to staff initially. We've worked with um, seven funders, philanthropic and some government agencies to be able to source that funding and hopefully we'll get that this year to initially have that. The funding is not from Hamilton City Council. What support do you see, what do you need from the council then? Is it cash, staff, but what, what? We, as mentioned earlier, want to find what whānau are wanting, and then we can possibly bring that back to talk with council and what that looks like. Okay, so not here to specific. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for the questions. Thank you for coming today and giving up your time to to share with us your vision. We appreciate it. Councillors, that brings us to the end of the public forum, and we're now on to item five, which is the comp confirmation of the elected member open, open briefing notes of 19th of February, which are there attached, if I can have someone so moved. Thank you, Councillor Wilson, seconded. Councillor Bunting, all in favour? Opposed? Carried. Okay, that brings us on to the next item, which is uh, we, we are doing before we go into the um, annual plan considerations, uh, which is the infrastructure funding and finance bill. And you will uh, t well, take it largely as read because it has been circulated and discussed, Greg, but if you would like to highlight the key points and lead us to the um, key points of the recommendation as well. Sure. Th thank you, Mayor Paula. Um, good morning, Mayor and Councillors. Um, I'll take the report as read, um, as the Mayor just uh, indicated. However, I'll make um, several introductory comments before taking questions. Um, HCC is a high growth council, um, as we well know, and access to funding for infrastructure to meet future demands is constrained. Um, the IFF presents the most advanced and legitimate current opportunity to address this challenge, um, not only for existing growth cells, but also future initiatives such as the Hamilton to Auckland Corridor Plan, um, the recent creation of Kainga Order and a potential partnership deal to implement um, long-term out outcomes for the Metro Spatial Plan. Um, importantly, HCC and uh, Rotokauri in particular have emerged as the primary pilot um, for the IFF tool in New Zealand. Um, this presents a unique opportunity for HCC to collaborate and provide valued input to the development of the bill and its subsequent implementation, um, and also to establish valuable and enduring relationships with key government agencies and personnel which will be beneficial um, going forward. Um, I'd just like to note um, here that underway in parallel with the IFF um, and separate to this item today um, are broader infrastructure discussions with various developers in the Rotokauri catchment and a business case um, considering options to develop there. Um, these aspects of the broader Rotokauri conversation will be discussed with elected, elected members at, the, at a workshop on the 1st of April and at the 2nd of April Strategic uh, Growth Committee. So, and now, yeah, happy to take questions on the report 
and or the submission. Okay, are there any questions? I don't see any coming up. Um, Councillor Van Oosten. Um, just uh, one question really, Greg, in terms of um, what pre protections there may be for um, new homeowners and future homeowners um, uh, with regard to the works funded and delivered through um, uh, allowing the uh, growth cells to take um, shape and, uh, and, and specifically in request to um, any over-inflated or over uh, work that might happen, or perhaps even the opposite? Sure. Mr Parsons, I might pass this to you in relation to um, over-inflated costs or over infrastructure that might escalate the levy to um, levy payers. So basically, how do we ensure that the, the infrastructure is best cost and tended appropriately, et cetera? Sure, so, so this is a, um, a still a work in progress as the legislation develops, but largely um, as the legislation is currently framed as it sits with the council to complete the investigation work, land acquisition and designs, um, and the IFF legislation would then would, would kick in at the point of construction start, so that would allow um, the local authority to do quite a lot of due diligence around understanding risks, costs, profile, um, estimates, and um, through that lead-up process. Um, that's, that's probably all I'd say at this point, unless you had further questions. Did that answer your question? Yeah, it does, although um, is there then um, cost risk that we're able to, as a council, to be able to um, recover through any part of that process? It, I can't answer that, that question at the, this point in time because it, it depends on how the final legislation lands and then it depends on the specifics of the agreement that's negotiated between the parties for that particular piece of infrastructure at that point in time. So certainly you know, cost over or underruns would be a significant matter in establishing a levy for a particular area um, and that would... You know, and it would have to be given a lot of consideration in terms of working up a particular proposal. But in terms of what a remedy might look like right at this very minute, all I could offer is that it would be a significant uh, consideration that we would have to make as a council and other parties would have to make before any arrangement was entered to and finalised. So I'll just add to that. Mm. More broadly, the <clears throat> when the IFF, um, you know, the levy is established, it's underpinned by... Um, identified infrastructure and I mean one of the primary purposes of this tool is that that uh, those capital costs are lifted from council's balance sheet and so that means they need to satisfy the um, credit rating agencies that council doesn't have liability in that respect so the once those capital costs are established and embedded in the levy then the the non-council SPV they own those costs, and if there are cost overruns, there's a government support package. Um, but effectively, they're all ring fenced and have to be separate from the council in order for, you know, the, the basically the first principles point of this is to take it off balance sheet and allow councils to do that. So I think there is there is protection. Uh, there is there should be a full ring fence prote protection essentially um, against that once it's into the IFF. And the other piece on that, in our submission, we've we've said that we need to be certain of that. So, you know, that's a, you're raising a critical point. And as we get closer, we would need to be sure that we're insulated from you know any any future risk, which should be um, held by the SPV. And in terms of being the um, pilot uh, for the, uh, should the bill be uh, introduced, and that funding be uh, approved. Um, uh, what would you see as being things that we would need to protect ourselves around, uh, you know, in terms of the risk, particularly? So I guess that our submission, you know, sets out the concerns that we've identified. Um, it, I mean, I guess the, the the categories of the submission, but uh, you know, our um, the elected members. Um, their effectively their say in the approval of the the levy through the various uh, through the the asset and the levy endorsement. 
um, there's a number of quite detailed, um, you know, contractual and, and uh, infrastructure considerations, which we've taken advice on, which are in the schedules. They're pretty detailed, but that's just to make sure all of the various machinations of construction contracts and um, novating contracts and warranties, et cetera, et cetera. So we've taken, we've got really good advice on that to, to make sure we've nailed that shut. And then there are, um, you know, there are things like affordability and which infrastructures it, it, it funds. So, um, and we've had um, engagement with um, elected members on, on several occasions and we've circulated the draft. So I think I'm pretty confident that what the bill's presented to us, we've identified, you know, touch wood, the, the, the critical key things and made our submissions. So um, from my perspective, I think we've, we've addressed that and we'll, we need to wait and see how it plays out with the, when it goes to the House next. Thanks. Thanks, Thank Chris. you. So you're happy with that, uh, yep. Councillor Van Leusten? There was no proposals to change anything. You fix it up. Thank you. Councillor Pascoe? Yes, Chair, um, just one question. Um, is there or has there been um, uh, value in working with the other high growth councils and putting together a submission um, that collectively ensures we get the legislation that's going to work for us and legislation that's going to be reasonably strong? Yeah, so that was contemplated between the high, high growth councils in particular, so Queenstown, Tauranga, Auckland, us. Um, We've actually worked closely together with the government agencies in the earlier stages, and we still work closely with them. And collectively, um, I think we agreed that we, we have the same common views in many respects, but just it was decided that we, could, we, we would submit separately. So that was considered, um, but we think we get it, we've, we're going to get the value out of those four submissions anyway. So, Do you foresee any challenges that the government might that might impede the workability of the legislation once it goes into place in terms of those discussions that you've had with other high growth councils and with the government agencies or are we all on the same um, are we all in the same walker um, I'm positive and uh, and confident um, it's a, I mean it's a complex um, matter just infrastructure funding new legislation guaranteed to be complex in some ways, but the way that uh, the work that we've done, we've had a lot of collaboration with them and, and we're also one of the, the key, um, you know, the key, some of the key advice they're getting is from us because we are the pilot and we're, we're well advanced in this space. Um, and so I'm just positive and confident and we need to um, basically keep going along and, and, and identifying things, uh, you know, as they, as they come about. Um, so there will be complexities and things to iron out and challenges, but I'd just say, you know, we should it's positive and we should continue down, um, continue along the path and there's lots of opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. No further questions, we'll go to the resolutions. Just get there. Um, the recommendations. Receive the report, we're improving the draft um, before the deadline. Okay, so that's, and notice, noted that it, was already has already gone down as a placeholder, but now we're just kind of letting it fly free if we say yes to this. So uh, we'll go to the vote on the board. It's been moved by Councillor McPherson. Oh no, sorry, it didn't. It got moved by Councillor Ryan, seconded by Councillor McPherson. Thank you. Go to the vote on the board, please. Oh, reset. Okay, thanks, councillors. We're going to take the shortest of breaks, just about um, 10 minutes, because it's a natural gap before we go into the um, annual plan. Yeah, just just to read the vote. Sorry. Just Sorry? Just call the vote. Oh, I thought we had. No. Oh, we're still waiting on the vote. vote. Sorry, apologies. Thought it happened. The motion is carried unanimously. Thank you. So we're adjourned till 22. You can bring a cuppa in or whatever.
everyone. If we, if we could come back, everyone, that would be really good. Staff, councillors, we're going to make a start. Oops, yeah, when I open my iPad to the right page. Okay, so we're now on to item seven, um, the proposed budget changes. And there'll be a bit of going backward and forward because the attachments are where they are and the recommendation is where it is. So we'll probably go through, we'll get uh, Sean to have a little talk about it, uh, about the overall scheme of things, and then we'll have a look at some of the items and how that shuffles out. <clears throat> I just wanted to open by saying a few remarks about the long-term plan, and I'm going to ask Sean in a minute to um, tell us what the difference between an annual plan and a long-term plan is, because I think it's really important for the general public out there to understand the context of what we're dealing with here in making decisions for an annual plan versus the more significant decisions that we'll be the changes to things that we might make ahead of a long-term plan, which, of course, as you're aware, I intend to provide as long a lead-in to the long-term plan discussions as possible so that we can get out to the widest cross-section of our community for input. In fact, we're beginning that in late April, early May. Um, we've already started um, talking with the community at a well-being level about what they see as important. So the annual plan is a much more constrained, smaller process, which I'll ask um, Sean to comment on. Ewan made the best comment yesterday in the, in the discussions that we had around this, and that there are no, I think the word you said was, no protected species here. So while you see ahead of you um, a report that has headings that says mayoral proposals, other elected members' proposals, budget adjustments, decisions from the previous council, and chief executive's direction, those are compartments for discussion, but they're not silos within the context of this conversation. We are looking at everything through the annual plan lens, but no decisions are being made today. Hard and fast decisions are being made today. Where we need to get to is a reasonable steer to staff about the proposals that you think have enough merit to go forward into the draft annual plan. And that when we go to the draft annual plan, then we'll need to know the full implications of everything that we've either put, either put into the annual plan or, or taken out. I do want to just make it quite clear to councillors that um, uh, I'm not looking at a rates increase for this annual plan. So we are working within the budget that we have. We have to consider a number of things in doing so. We have to consider the things that we're already committed to doing. In other words, are already underway and big money is being spent on. We have to consider um, our ability to balance the books and when we want to do that. We have to consider the way that we treat debt in this organisation and debt capacity in the future. We have to consider that what we do in the annual plan could have a consequential impact on the long-term plan and what could go in or out of that. All of those things are part of the nuance of this. It's not as straightforward as um, a wish list for people to put things in and out. It has to be seen in that much broader context. And I will just say this, and I said it as a challenge in workshops, if you wish to put new things in to the annual plan, you're within your rights to field that and test the, test the assumptions, set up a business case for it, convince us that that is a good idea. However, you might also need to ask staff to give quite clear advice about how cost efficiencies can be gained or what could come out of the budget, right? Because it's the same bucket. You're either dipping, dipping your scoop into the bucket and taking water out or you're putting water in. It's the same bucket. So um, just want to put that context over it. It is quite important that we understand the implications of good ideas or other ideas that we have. Um, the headings mayoral proposals exist only from the point of view are those the ones that stacked up from a senior leadership team perspective. The chief executive um, had a conversation around those and those are highly promoted or supported by a lot of data and input from the senior leadership team. Doesn't mean that all of them will go through. Doesn't mean that just because the other elected members um, 
wish, it, wish list is under a different heading that none of that can come to the table whatsoever. We've heard from submitters today who supported things in both the mayoral, under the banner of mayoral proposals and councillor proposals. Uh, Richard um, indicated to us through staff that there will be some adjustments come April because so there are some other things being worked at, worked through at a staff level that we'll need to be aware of in April but aren't, can't come today because they're not fully base. What? Fully, they're not fully baked. There you go. There's a technical term for it. But anyway, look, I'm, I'm genuine about having a proper engaged discussion around this, um, and so we will step through it, and we won't rush it, as, because it is important. Um, so just bear with me, because it is actually quite a complex uh, agenda to navigate with a number of distinct issues. So on that, Sean, give us an intro and tell us the difference, first of all, between the um, annual plan and the long-term plan. Thank you, Mayor Paula. Um, so the, the long-term plan is uh, often referred to as the 10-year plan, so that's something which Council looks at every three years, and that's where we capture the um, major budget decisions for the Council. Uh, the annual plan is uh, where we, so the annual plan for this year is changes to year three of the long-term plan, so it's um, essentially budget adjustments to year three of the long-term plan. Um, so that's what we're looking at today. Um, and the primary focus, as Mayor Paula has said, um, is looking at those elected member proposals. Um, so they're listed on um, tables two and three, on pages 30 and 31 of the agenda. And there's a business case proposal for each of those um, on pages 38 to 94. Um, Mayor's already talked about the mayoral proposals and the other elected member proposals uh, and has indicated that we want to work through each one of those um, in order today. Um, and we also want to confirm the budget implications of previous decisions of Council, um, which is listed on Table 4, and the CEO budget adjustments in Table 5. So those um, CEO budget adjustments are primarily changes to phasing or assumptions rather than um, discretionary proposals. Um, I have in, I indicated by email um, to elected members that there are some other potential items to come um, from management or from the CEO. Uh, and they're going to be presented to the Council on the 29th of April um, to ensure that you get to consider all of the budget changes <coughs> in context. Um, I've amended the recommendation um, in the report ever so slightly. Um, so in B, rather than including for the purpose of preparing the draft um, annual plan budget, um, we're asking you to approve the inclusion of these items for consideration at the 29th, on the 29th of April. So we'll um, get that up on the board when we get to it. Uh, and also adding a, um, just amending the uh, note, uh, recommendation E, requesting the Chief Executive to prepare the um, annual plan budget. We're just changing that to a noting recommendation to note that um, uh, there'll potentially some extra items coming to the 29th of April. So I just want to give um, elected <coughs> members assurance that nothing that we um, decide today is um, baked in. Um, and that the substantive debate on the, the full kind of budget will be on the 29th of April. That was um, originally scheduled as a briefing and we've decided to make that a council meeting so that we can um, uh, have those uh, decisions uh, formally um, approved. Um, the, so with the proposals, um, these are staff, this is um, staff's response to our understanding of elected member um, expectations. Uh, so when we're going through each of those proposals, uh, uh, I just wanted to give the context. So this is how staff have understood or interpreted um, the requests of elected members uh, and have responded uh, with uh, the specifics and the budget attached um, to those things to meet uh, elected member expectations. Um, so in terms of meeting flow, um, so we'll consider each of the proposals separately. So we'll go through the, um, the proposals A1 to 6 and then B1 to 3, uh, and then move on to the um, other budget adjustments. Um, and um, that's, that's probably it for introduction. I'm happy to take sort of questions on the overall process and, um, now, um, but I'll just ask that we kind of save questions on each of the individual items um, till when we, when we get to those in the agenda. So just, just one question on process. Um, uh, we'll talk through the individual items and then, um, David, you'll be able to give us 
as we go, the well, by the end of the conversation on all of those items, we'll have an understanding of the financial position, the projected yep. financial position of making those decisions. So we've included. Yeah. We've included but in the, that's when we'll have a discussion about that at the end. Or yeah, I'm happy to do that. Just one point to note is that on the balancing the books graph, that um, given that, um, so so it doesn't show in 2000 and the first year of the long term plan doesn't show what we'd planned um, to achieve in the balancing the books because we've finished that year. It just shows that we we made a six million dollar uh, surplus. But in the back of your mind should be that we actually planned to make a an over $9 million deficit, so we actually balanced the books in that first year, and predominantly that was because we deferred a lot of our capital programs, so interest costs and depreciation were deferred. So you'll see in the year three or next year's in the annual plan that there's a deficit, deficit sitting there of $9 million. That's largely the depreciation and interest that has contributed or been shifted from year one to year three. But if you... But if we'll you, come to that at the end yeah. of the day when we've gone through the propositions. Yeah, happy to give a summary. And um, um, just councillors, uh, good to know that we're working on for the long term plan where we'll have a lot more complexity and movement within the budgets. We're looking at being able to have a, a, um, a tool that will enable us to put things in, take them out. That's correct. So what we'll do in the long term tool. plan discussions is be able to, uh, on the fly, adjust the financial strategy limit. Yeah. Um, and, and you'll be able to visualise on the graphs. We won't Which be able I to think do that will be today. very helpful for yeah. everyone involved. Sure. Look, so I'm going to take questions only at the moment and generalities around the process or what you've heard so far, because we are going to then step through the business cases. So, Councillor McPherson. Yeah, just a quick one. Um, thanks, Sean. On the 29th of April, the CEO's stuff coming to us <coughs> and the decision making that we're going to do, will we have a chance to chew over the CEO's stuff more than just having it? put on diligent two days before, three days before, because that was going to be a workshop where we could discuss them. Yep. So we're we going to be able to do that. It's a bit hard in a formal meeting, and when we've got all of the things from today going forward to then. Yeah, it's a... Sorry, I should have um, mentioned that at the start. Yeah, so we're going to try and get the information on those um, to you as soon as possible. That may be through a sort of workshop or briefing format, but it might, it might not be um, in all cases. It might be through by email or some other sort of form. But what we want to make sure is that um, as a leadership team, we have um, assessed those um, items before they, um, to, to work out whether they can should be deferred to the LTP or whether they can be funded from existing budgets, um, whether um, they need to kind of go ahead. Um, but when we've got um, clarity on those, we want to make sure that you've got that information as soon as possible, so you're not getting it um, a couple of days ahead of the 29th. What if there are ones that um, we heard were coming forward but then get rejected by the overall leadership team? How do we see their, what visibility do we have of them? So the, if it's something which is about a level of service or um, items for, um, for elected members that we know elected members um, would have a view on, um, we'll raise those to your attention. It's probably more the things that wouldn't kind of make it uh, operational matters or sure, yeah. um, kind of transfers between teams and those kinds of things, which are um, probably wouldn't might can, not surface. Can so we? Have have a, the, sorry, oh, it to I was just going to ask if, as they're coming up, could we have a portal on diligent where we can go to and see what the latest state of play is? If you're not, you're obviously talking about them not all coming in at once. Yeah, we'll, we'll do our best to communicate as they go and keep you guys updated as well as try and avoid confusion. So diligent might be the best way of doing that, one one source of the truth. Um, just to be aware, and I, I announced this to the Audit and Risk Committee, all the items will be um, communicated to the elected members. Those items not funded will be putting forward the risk of not funding them. So if there's a particular item where, you know, we've got, we, we decide to suck it up, for example, um, in the organisation, we will let you know what that means and what the consequences of that are and potentially the risk it puts to other programmes of work, is it, you know, spreading resource too thinly and so forth. So um, I want to change the conversation rather than being a budgetary one, but to be a level of service and a risk appetite conversation. What is the level of risk that this elected member group is willing to accept in delivering the various programmes as well? And there's some items in there that if we don't do, have a significant risk. Um, but we need to be able to articulate that to the elected wing to make sure they're comfortable with that decision I've made. Um, and it may not be that you agree with me and you decide to put it back in again. So we just need to have that conversation. Sure. Yep. Thanks. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Taylor. Thank you, uh, Mayor Southgate. I just have a, um, a clarification on a question in regards to one um, issue 
and, and the process with which we're following with it. There has been some discussion about the possibility of a minor plan change in regard to infill issues. And I, my understanding is at present there isn't resource in this budget here to fund that should it, should it, be, should it be wanted. Is it, is it correct that we are, my understanding is we're going to have a workshop on that, I think next week, if there is a will of councillors to, to pursue that or to look at pursuing that, uh, it would come back, uh, if extra resource was needed, it would come back in the next raft of changes, is that correct? Yeah. That's I'd, correct. Okay, thank you. Uh, just, just bear in mind that um, we'd, an annual plan is the way we grab those changes, um, but again, council has the discretion at any particular point in time outside of an annual plan and long-term plan process to incorporate budget changes as they see fit as well. So um, we do our best to capture them at this point in time, and that one will be um, based on the briefing <coughs> outcomes. But again, things change, we re-respond accordingly. Thank you. Councillor Pascoe. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, um, I've got some just general questions. One, is it, is it, um, is it um, permissible from the Chair and from you uh, Sean, that we could talk also uh, in terms of this report, uh, include in that discussion the email, the contents of the email that you sent us yesterday, in terms of the list of additional um, items that are being considered. So, I, my my advice is that that list of items are still being worked through. We don't have um, enough information, I think, to in, to have an informed debate on those. So, I think the focus of today's meeting is about the contents of the here. report okay. in front of us. Okay. Mm. I think you make a good point though, um, <laughs> Councillor Pascoe, we need to be mindful of that, that this is in fact your, f your first good look over, but there's going to be some movement because we're going to have information coming more fully formed that's going to change what things look like. So you're quite right to alert us to it. Um, yeah. and Certainly I guess the way you read that email is that there's further costs still to come. Hmm. Or further costs still to be recommended that we consider. That that would be correct, and yeah. therefore, like yeah. you say, if you and if um, if in your debate on a number of these items, of course, you might bring some of that thinking to yep. thinking okay. into that debate. Do you think there's a number of items, both in that report, in that email, and in this report today, that would be best um, not considered in the annual plan, but in the long-term plan? Uh, so if there are items that we in that email that we think are best suited to the long-term plan, then that's where we would recommend they go. So the items that we think need to be considered as part of the annual plan, we will bring to the 29th of April meeting. Okay, so from the email, but are there items in this report that you would recommend or suggest to us might be better suited for the long-term plan rather than the annual plan? Uh, so all of the, um, C, all of the um, budget adjustments um, which have come from you know, the CER management, um, definitely annual plan um, items, adjustments that need to be made. Uh, the elected member proposals, uh, that's probably a sort of discussion for us to have today about some of those, and I, I think the, um, that is where there's probably some debate to be had as to whether some of these things do need to be done um, next year or whether some or some elements can be deferred to the long-term plan. Right, OK. Um, and a question on um, balancing the books, paragraph 30, which I think David has um, just given us a little bit of an update on, um, because reading that, um, it suggests that in the first year of, uh, sorry, for the 21 year, we are going to have an $8 million deficit over and above what we had originally um, budgeted for in the long-term plan. And in the following year, the difference is going to be about $9 million. Um, Now, David's indicated to us just a little earlier that some of that's the catch-up um, from the 19 year, where we had a surplus. There's nothing showing in there for the 20 year, so I don't know whether that catch-up is in the 20 year or whether some of it is going to be in the 21 year. Um, and I, if I can just finish my question, I wonder whether it would be useful, certainly for the 29th, to split out um, the portion of the catch-up that relates to the work that's being done now, that should have been done in earlier years, and what actually relates to the decisions that we're making in this annual plan. So we know what the, the deficit uh, portion that relates. Sure. Yeah, because there have been a number of um, above-budget um, 
council decisions um, that have come through the finance committee over the last couple of years that wouldn't have been contemplated in their long-term plan. So we'll we'll separate the two. Um, the 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 run rate for if you took if you took the run rate for the three years, um, we would have um, from a long-term plan perspective we would have generated a deficit of eleven million dollars. But our for current forecast is showing three million dollars <coughs> if you add the three years. So we're actually so, eight, so I, eight million dollars ahead. It's a great question, and that's why that was what my question was about. Can we come to that? At the end, in a, when we've got all, when we've got a lay of the land, and I think that's a very good line of questioning to pursue at that time. I think my question is, can we split it out so we know exactly what relates to the spending for this annual plan, yeah. and what relates to the to the catch up? So that's yeah. So that's at, what we and, need to and know. And could right that graph be updated to include what the predictions are for the current year, which ends in June, because it's showing zero on there at the moment. And I guess there's either a deficit or a surplus um, yes. being planned in, in that in that year. Okay, that's useful. Thank you, Councillor. Okay, the, I, and I've got some specific questions which on I, will, on. I will hold over until we work through. Uh, you've got specific questions on the particular proposal. On the particular okay. proposals. Okay, at yeah. the moment we're just talking in general terms. In general yeah. process yeah. terms, Councillor O'Leary. Thank you. Um, I'm just wondering if we can, given that this council, this is our first budget exercise, if we can bring back, and hopefully um, Councillor McPherson will support me on this, and probably Councillor Wilson actually, we used to have an, an unfunded uh, list attached to budgets, and you know our diaries are so jam-packed at the moment, it was quite hard for me to find time to read the agenda, let alone think actually what, or what proposals do I want to put forward, and I know I've got time, but having an unfunded list that runs just parallel to everything, keeps those projects from five years ago, ten years ago in mind, and it means we don't forget them or lose them. I found it very, very helpful. I can't, I, I can't recall exactly how, how it, it, like how much detailed work went into the list of unfunded projects, but um, it always had a budget line next to it, and it just meant when we come up to these things, we don't forget you know, what has been raised in the past with us or what's been forgotten. Um, I'm wondering if, if somebody could work on that, if that would be helpful to other elected members. I think that's a good idea. And, and Sean, you do have a list of all the other ideas that were put up during the induction sessions and things that aren't necessarily going into the annual plan but likely to inform the long-term plan as well because elected members did have a lot more ideas yeah. than you see captured here. Yeah, so. yeah. so absolutely, um, Councillor Andrew, I think yeah. it's a really good idea. Um, so we've got, so when we had the briefing um, on this uh, last week, week before, um, we included in that the list of um, items that have been raised by elected members which were on a different path or had been mm. sort of agreed to be um, long-term plan consideration. What we can do is surface that, and also the um, items that were considered, say, as in the um, long-term plan, that were considered but didn't receive funding. So there is a list of um, those projects um, mm. sitting um, yeah. there as well. So, so it might, that, might be a little bit of work to pull it together, but we can yeah, keep that. Yeah, yeah. But if life. that if that could be part of the documentation <laughs> for all of our budget exercises going forward, that would be really great. And then it also means, you know, for whatever reason, when we're in the the pointy end of things and we, we're fighting for proposals, if it's a great proposal but possibly not right now and it gets defeated in the chamber through the voting, that there's a mechanism to quickly pop that on, well it's an un, you know, it's a not right now but it's an unfunded project. So yeah, not an email but actually formally part of our budget documents would be yeah, really I think it's great. A really good idea. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Councillor Naidu Rowe. Thank you. Um, I just had one follow-on question from what um, Councillor Rob had asked um, in terms of balancing the books. Um, it would make sense to split it. And um, if we didn't make any decisions to add any more expenditure, uh, in terms of the interest and depreciation costs that David just spoke about, are we already a year late in balancing the books? So I wouldn't say we're a year late if we take into account the fact that in year one where we weren't going to balance it, we balanced it by, and we we're in surplus by six, um, $6 million. So 
um, and then we've dipped down again for a couple of years. So balanced in first year, dipped down for the next two, and then balancing in the fourth as we were currently at. Where we, when we went through the long-term plan, we weren't going to balance it until year four. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to yeah. that. Thank yeah. you. Actually, you're right. You're fine. Thank you. Um, let, right. Now, um, we will go to the... Um, it's probably best to look in the attachments where the business case details are. We'll talk about the economic development resources. The business case A1. Oops, sorry. Just click the page. Um, pardon? We're going to discuss them. We, we can could vote on them as going forward one at a time, remembering it's only voting for them to go into a draft position. Um, okay, the economic development resources. Um, take it as read. I'll just say something on that, and then staff might like to support this as well. Um, we've established a flatter structure at council with two new committees, uh, both of which didn't um, have any resources attached to them because they didn't historically exist. And uh, they do need some internal staff support and professional advice to be able to, otherwise they can't really get on with any of the uh, important work that they want to do. So this is um, being worked out by staff to be the amount of resource that would get those two new committees up and running. Any other comment from staff? No? Uh, there you go. Any questions on that one? Councillor Hamilton. That committee's getting an extra 10. <laughs> <laughs> it's, more important, it's more important. <clears throat> I, I didn't do the figures. Staff came up with what they thought was needed. And I suppose it also is based on what other staff are already doing in the organisation. Hmm. OK, so, um, Councillor Pascoe. Thank you. I'm not questioning the needs of those two committees. I presume we're considering A1 and A2 at the moment. Well... I was just doing A1 at the moment. Oh, OK, well, I thought A2 was also discussed. But if, if it's A1, I don't doubt that there's a need for um, a resource for that committee. We did have a similar committee um, in the earlier term, um, and um, I have no idea how that was resourced. But I'm just wondering, we have had people within the organisation who have acted as you know, key account managers with working in the in the um, economic uh, development area and the community. And I'm just questioning why we have not got that resource available to us within the existing $70 million worth of personnel costs that Council is incurring. Uh, Councillor Rob, so the way, the way that we manage uh, staffing resources, that uh, th things change over time. <coughs> Um, and as things change, we make the changing needs of council work as much as we can within the budgets and the FTEs that we've got. So we, we still have people working in these spaces. Um, where we're at is that we have quite an ambitious agenda in economic development and the central city, so we just need to make sure that we're delivering the right kind of um, support into that. Does, does that answer your question? Okay. Well. Okay, thank you. We'll Explanation given, but I'm not I'm not we'll altogether get, satisfied. You can but, you can debate yeah, it in a minute. Yeah, okay. Okay. And there any other questions, Councillor Bunting? Yeah, thank you. Um, just just um, based on Jen's answer there, thank you. Um, I presume this person would feed into uh, Deputy Mayor uh, Taylor's committee as well and uh, add support there. Is that right? Well, there's overlap about? between committees that yeah, um, yeah. you know the resource will be used to strike the right strategic direction that the committees choose. Cool, I'm happy to move it. <coughs> so, um, yeah, how are we going to do this? Because it's not... It's, so what we'll do is we'll move each one as a proposition as they come along. This is, all you're being asked to do is to move whether you would like to see this in the yeah. draft annual plan meeting in April. That's it, OK? I'd like um, to move that So it we'll go... Uh, yeah. It's moved by Councillor Bunting, seconded by Councillor Hamilton, and the debate... Oh, sorry. I sent um, the chair an email, but he hasn't checked his emails because he's very diligently paying attention, um, of this committee. I was just interested, just a query on what the Central City Advisory Group was. As well, that's the one that's led by Councillor Taylor. Your Honour. Oh. <laughs> oh. oh, so it's changed its name. 
Yeah. So no? Mm. Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, that, that's actually coming it's back to council. It's not with the river. Oh, okay. All right. No, good. Thank you. Sorry, I didn't want to take chamber time up. Never mind. Well, that's okay. That's fine. That's fine. Um, so, um, anybody got anything they want to discuss about this debate? It sort of stacks, or if not, we'll go to the vote. Oh, Councillor Taylor? Yeah, I do. just want to speak briefly, just, just supporting you on that. You, I mean, uh, I, I heard Rob's question there, but we, we, we have set up these new committees um, to do a job, and, um, you know, I think it's, it, it would be irresponsible not to resource them appropriately. Um, it's, uh, it, it's really unfair, I think, on staff and councillors if you set up a new committee with a significant tasks ahead of them um, and um, you ask them to do a job but they actually lack the horsepower um, and the resource in the, in the organisation to get the job done. Now, to me it's a, you know, it's a pretty simple wrinkle really. You've got, you've got new, new committees with <coughs> new jobs and uh, they need resource so I, I, I totally support it. Thank you. Councillor Hamilton? Yeah, just, just following on from that. I think it's, um, it's, it's obvious that these, well, speaking of economic development, but the next one too needs resource to, to do business as usual and to have the opportunity to um, use Ewan's word to hydrate. He's very good with words. Um, what has been in, in, in the, current, the current fit for purpose need that is around economic development. Um, and i just come across some research recently. For every dollar that goes into economic development, 17 come out the other side in terms of a wider benefit for the community and council. So it's obviously a big supporter of the motion. Thank you. Councillor Pascoe? Yeah, just very briefly, Chair. My question was not intended to deny resources to that committee. I was simply asking whether or not we could resource it from within the existing um, um, personnel structure that we that we have uh, within the organisation. Thank you. No, thank you. I understood that. Um, Councillor Forsyth? Sorry, I'll save it for the next item. Member for the next item? Okay, thank you. I'll just say a few words too that I, I'm really excited about the work that Councillors Hamilton and uh, Wilson are undertaking on behalf of Council in this e economic development space. Uh, actually, we're seeing a lot of engagement in the community, a lot of um, pick-up of enthusiasm about our role to play in um, creating a, a better economic future for Hamilton. And uh, quite clearly, it would be hopeless if um, they came back into the organisation and our staff to do a little bit of work on a proposal or an idea and we're told that well, we can't because we haven't got any staff resource to do it. So this is, this is quite clearly makes sense to me. We'll go to the vote on this one, please. Uh, oh, is that right there? The, Sean? It's just for the annual plan for the April the twenty. It's for the next meeting. The yeah, yeah. Because nothing, the, these may not stand that next test, that, or they might, but you know, okay. So you can vote, don't vote please. Everybody done it? The motion is carried, 12-4, one against. Thank you. We'll go to the uh, sustainability resource um, in speaking to that. It's very much a repeat situation, uh, a new, a new committee uh, needing resourcing so that they can act on some of their initiatives that they're um, foreseeing on behalf of the community. Also, just note that we have, um, as a council, been charged with doing more around our adaptation to climate um, and our response to climate change. And we've all committed to that. And therefore, this is about a little bit about putting some money where your mouth is on that one. And uh, this committee is going to drive that. Um, you can moving? Move, Councillor Forsyth, second, and Councillor Thompson. Any discussion or debate or question? Well, it's questions first. Any questions on it? No? Any debate on it? Um, Councillor Wilson? Yeah, look, thank you. I just want to briefly speak to this item. Um, one of the things I love about this current council is the areas of portfolios and expertise. 
and how invigorated the chairs and the deputy chairs are in pursuing their areas of focus. And I'm really comfortable that with Margaret and Sarah's leadership, this uh, really important area that I am the first to acknowledge I um, am a little bit at a loss of how we can make a meaningful and immediate uh, improvement to what is, I think, uh, a huge challenge facing this city, this region, this country. But I know it's in really good hands, so I'm, I'm really supportive of it. Um, and um, and will watch and help in any way that I can. So just a confirmation of my support. Thank you. Councillor Forsyth. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Wilson, for those uh, supportive comments. Um, so I just wanted to emphasise that this is not business as usual uh, for this council and that we really do need to step up not only one gear, but more like 10 gears to get to get moving. We've got the direction, but we really need to put the pedal to the metal. And uh, this funding, and it, I'm really pleased that it's not uh, proposed to be in, uh, just for one year only, that it does need constant resource over the next at least three to five years uh, for us to, to uh, make some change. And um, might, it's already been uh, brought to, again to our attention, but that we are obliged um, from, uh, um, as a result of an environmental court decision, that we need to get moving and, um, and uh, deliver our uh, biodiversity targets and our indigenous uh, flora and fauna targets as well. And that will require resourcing too. So I thank you all for your support. It's, this is a, a major step for us and uh, I'm sure there'll be more to come, but uh, uh, acknowledge and, uh, as I said, uh, appreciate the support from councillors in this, this direction. Councillor Thompson. Thank you. I also just want to acknowledge everyone's support for this. Um, we are facing urgent issues with our environment and I think our community is rightly sensing that this is the council to turn things around. Um, and I feel really positive about the direction that we're taking. Uh, the funding is critical in terms of doing a good job on our climate action plan. Um, we have seen that it's been delayed and so this is a way to keep moving things forward. Um, and it's also really critical that as a committee we have um, a staff member to go to and to help lead this. Um, I think it's been really hampering progress so far, not having that key staff member. Uh, and I think that um, we also, as an organisation, need someone who leads in this area, a uh, Chief Sustainability Officer or whatever we call it. Um, we used to have staff in this area, um, and but for many years we haven't, so this is once again turning things around, um, putting things in the right direction. So thank you for your support. Councillor Pascoe. Thank you, Chair. Look, I will support this, um, not because I'm enjoying spending $280,000 of ratepayers' money, but having attended the recent uh, Environment Committee meeting, it showed to me that we are <laughs> under-resourced uh, particularly in responding to the uh, climate action plan that the last council promised uh, to get back to the community on uh, early this year. So um, I'm hopeful that if we do spend that money, we will see those results um, and we'll be able to respond back to the community in terms of having a, a, a climate action plan. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Councillor Pascoe. Also speaking in support of this um, for the obvious reasons of uh, resourcing a committee in a fair way so that they can get on with the business that they're charged with. But also personally, I acknowledge that we have been be a little bit tardy in coping, well, we've been a bit late in responding to things like biodiversity and climate. Uh, and uh, we've heard from some impassioned groups this morning uh, in our gullies Mai Whakariki from the university who've all pleaded with us to support some work that's coming up in the next uh, suite of recommendations as well. But they're right behind this committee and what you can achieve. And thank you to Sarah and Margaret for 
uh, the amount of work that you're also doing out there, because I know that you're here, there, and everywhere in the in the community talking with stakeholders in this space, and it is appreciated. And there again, people are the passion is lifting. People are starting to respond to the fact that we see some value in looking after our natural environment, and they're coming along with us. They're good to go. They're really champing at the bit to do the best for the city, and that's exciting. So thank you, everyone. Councillor Gallagher. Um, obviously, the previous council with Mayor Andy, we, we, and thanks to Bruce Clarkson's uh, great uh, uh, advocacy in the beginning, was the allocation of extra funding to open up Lake Paifakariki. Um, also, if we're talking about uh, the bigger picture of climate, environment, sustainability, uh, the previous council's initiative in terms of making it easier for younger people, people with disabilities, to use our public transport network, you know, developing all those alternatives. So it, it, it's, it's the complete picture. I want to particularly shout out the praises of Professor Clarkson and others who have been for years and years um, amazing in their advocacy and also the very critical partnership with our tertiary institutions, particularly the University of Waikato, Wintech and others. You know, we have an incredible expertise uh, out there to join us on the journey and obviously along with the unanimous <coughs> view of this council, um, and that's what does differentiate this council from the previous council, on these areas we are unanimous. That wasn't exactly the case in the previous council, so um, that's really good and, and all power to um, the new committee as well and your work of leadership and oversight. Thank you. Councillor McPherson. Yes, I, I do support the fulsome praise from my colleague on the right here, um, but uh, I just want to um, remind the, part, the people that part of the work of this should be to coordinate across the council too, because there are actually a lot of activities that impinge on climate change and uh, contribute towards our um, work against, you know, to reduce the impacts of climate change, etc. But they're not connected in many cases. Um, transport is one in particular that there needs to be strong coordination. So I'd seen any extra resource in this area being heavily informed, if not involved, in those in those other areas of council so that we can tell the whole council picture. And then, of course, with the community as well, which has already been spoken about. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor McPherson. I'll go to the vote on that one, please, everyone. She should try your thing. Does anyone dare vote against this? The motion is carried unanimously. Thank you, everyone. We'll go to attachment three, which is the partnership with Māori. Um, this has come a, uh, it's been informed by our Māngai Māori, by Muna, and by the partners that we currently work with in the space of Māori um, relationships and the work they do for us. Um, I can't give you that much more, more detail than that, unless you want to make some additional comments, Sean. Uh, um, no, I would or say it's a, it's a it's a proposal is simply to um, the partnerships we have, <coughs> excuse me, with um, those Māori partners. Um, so there's um, $45,000 um, relating to that to reflect the um, sort of major, mainly the increased volume of um, work that we're doing um, with those Māori partners. Uh, and then there's an additional $30,000 just in year one um, relating to um, some contract resource to help complete a Māori strategy. Mona, do you want to add anything to that as the person? No, that's fine. OK, we'll see what questions come up. Councillor Gallagher. Two questions. Does the budget acknowledge um, you talked about training just as other elected members, uh, you know, has specific um, extra training work? Do, do, does the budget allow for that? No. For a Mungo Māori? No, so the budget, the, this doesn't include any um, training for elected members. So probably that, that's, a, that's a discussion we're not, we don't have to have today, but that's an ongoing discussion we have, particularly in terms of the elected member support policy. And I, I acknowledge our governance managers doing a whole heap of work in a lot of areas, including that, so that's really good. Uh, the other question is, does the budget acknowledge the fact that um, we will, I hope, be getting a Matawaka representative on the Strategy and Growth Committee. Is that is budget inclusive of that? 
Uh, no, so budget for um, for Mangai Māori has been considered separately. So that was a previous decision of council, and right. the budget implications of that have flowed through. Becca looks like she's about to comment on that. Yeah, yeah so we're still just undergoing conversation around uh, what that might look like and the costs associated with that once we get further on in the conversation. So we've got a conversation with um, Richard and Paula tomorrow actually to discuss moving forward with this. So it's not included in the annual plan at the moment. At the moment. Um, and it will, it will come through the Finance Committee at a later stage if we need to include any extra funding for that. Sure, okay, no, th yep. thank you. Councillor Naidu Ho. Thank you. I just note that um, in the report it says that it's it hasn't been reviewed for more than six years. Has there been something that has prompted it to be reviewed now? Um, the so it initially came from a um, elected member request, and I from from memory I think it was Deputy Mayor Jeff. Although I might be putting words in your mouth. So oh sorry, it was Councillor Ryan, <laughs> um, and. Uh, it was off the back of um, our mana whenua group presenting on some of the capacity constraints that they were facing, uh, and that prompted us to uh, look across the other partners as well. And so it's really about the volume of work that um, we're asking those partners to do uh, and making sure that we're resourcing adequately for that, for that work to be done. Thank you. Councillor Taylor. Thanks, Mayor Southgate. Mine, mine is just an extension of the last question in that um, the annual plan I, I sort of see as, as um, a place for uh, requests that are um, I don't know, urgent, I suppose, semi-urgent. And I just sort of wondered it, this is why this has been brought forward now and possibly not as an LTP wider discussion. Um, the, I think the broader conversation around how we um, engage our Māori partners and how we um, uh, had deal with that will be something that comes out of the strategy work that we're developing. Um, so the potentially kind of the, the bigger questions will be an LTP discussion. The reason this is coming now is um, just to deal with the immediate capacity constraints. So over the next year, we expect that the demand on um, Thorke, uh, on Tame, on Matawaka will be um, significant, and we want to make sure that we are funding that. So it is to do with the volumes in the next 12 months, not, not beyond. So have we not been keeping up over the last six years? We haven't increased it for six years. Is there suddenly been a, is it suddenly ramped up from from year six to seven? Or, I mean, I'm just trying to get my head around why why now just plonk after six years. Of so it's I think a lot of it has to do with um, in the long term plan we approved a you know a significant increase in the capital program. So all of those projects um, that require. Uh, yeah, all those uh, sort of reasonably significant projects we engage with mana whenua on yep. uh, and we get their input into. Um, so the number of projects and the complexity of those projects has increased and we're starting to see that flow through from LTP decisions now. Does, okay. that, does that make it clear? Yeah, it does. I am just just had a question about the 30000 for the strategy. So that is completely out of the bounds of any, any resource we have at present. Yep, so just to, um, yeah, it is. Um, so our um, our resource in this space is Muna, uh, and he's a, he's a, you know, one person, and the, uh, when we originally looked at this, we had talked and we discussed at the briefing with elected members about potentially another um, um, person. Um, what we got from that um, briefing discussion was that that should be something which comes out of the development of the strategy, and that would be something which might be sort of an implication of that. Um, but in order to get the strategy complete, uh, we do need um, to get some extra resource in to help get that across the line. And last question, thank you. So what is that strategy going to give us? So what that strategy is, so we had a, um, just for a bit of context, so we had a hui with um, representative, representatives from Matawaka, from Mana Whenua, um, from uh, Waikato Tainui, along with um, Mangai. Uh, and at that, uh, we discussed the need, we discussed the need to 
pull together some of the strategic plans that those different groups had and actually what does it mean for Hamilton City Council? How do we um, fulfil our um, obligations to um, build minor enhancing partnerships? Uh, what we concluded out of that was that we should have a, um, a strategy or a plan which makes clear what council's ambition is and what council's role is. So that would then inform further discussion and debate for council to be considered in the long-term plan. So really it would sort of set our, um, similarly to sort of the climate um, sort of plan, would sort of set out um, areas of focus or ambition uh, and then would identify programs of work that we might consider to fund or not through the long-term plan. Okay. Thank you. Uh out of interest, if um, if the th forty five thousand dollars per year, which I'm I'm not disputing because I've had good conversations with staff, is required right now, if out of interest that was for this year and subject to the completement of the Māori strategy, and going forward in the long term plan, is that possible? Because at the moment you've got it per year, so that assumes it, it continues out, but we haven't got the Māori strategy in place. And in having that whole picture of what we're doing and why we're doing it means we could have another look at it in the long-term plan with some longevity behind it? Yeah, absolutely. So when, when approving um, the annual plan, you're, you're only approving budget changes to year three of the long-term plan. So in, a, in approving um, the, the $45,000 for next year, you're not committing to the, the funds beyond that anyway? Although in the report, if anybody from the general public were reading that, they'd see it as per year. Yep. So, so to, look, to, to be to be transparent, we're saying that that's not a it's not a one-off cost. That's actually the um, essentially what we think would be the ongoing annual cost to support um, those partnerships. Um, regardless of the strategy. Yeah, regardless of the strategy. Yeah, I hear that. But I'm yeah. just saying the strategy so, might create some information, new information around more or less just about right or whatever. Stuff. Absolutely, yep. Yeah, and so that would be, so once that Maori strategy is complete, <coughs> then that would inform uh, when you are approving the long-term plan, you are approving budget for the next 10 years, uh, but in the annual plan, you're only approving changes to, um, to next year. Just through the chair, just to help with that, um, even though that it was, uh, so, so what Sean said is true, but in terms of having a look at the financial strategy at the end, we represent 10 years. So to be clear, if we've got something that we're approving, we look just like we do through the Finance Committee, that we think would be enduring until there was a different decision of council, we include that in all the, all the following years to the end of. So when you're looking at your financial strategy graphs, you're looking at those ongoing costs as being in all years, and those graphs include that. So David, if we wanted to say something different, it would say um, the recommendation would be $45,000 for this this upcoming year, excuse me, <clears throat> and the 30000 one off to do the strategy, and then we would look at all this fresh. Is that how we'd do it? Yeah, you would need to inform us. If you, if you don't intend it to be an ongoing um, cost, then then we need to know that so that I can not put it in later years in the financial strategy graphs. But if we think about previous councils and pr previous decision making, we sort of not fell into a trap, but we were only looking at the current fiscal year and we mm. were not taking into account the impact on following years. Mm. And where we've matured to as a council is having a look at the full 10-year plan in terms of if we make a decision this year, um, what does that mean for the full 10 years? Mm. Okay. Okay, Councillor Hamilton. I'm just seconding. I'd be happy to move as is worded currently. Okay, seconder, Councillor. Okay, let's go into some debate. Councillor Hamilton. Yeah, thanks. Um, look, I came across the <coughs> the comment. Most of us read a briefing in the chair of Thorpe. It could have, it could have been taken as a throwaway comment, but I actually took it as an insightful um, comment that it was something that we needed to address as council. And I think it's important when we look at our relationship with Māori from an authentic um, point of view and honouring our relationship with them, and they do, and certainly in the short time I've been in council, we rely more and more and more on Thorpe to help us bridge those, those cultural processes and protocols 
and they do it willingly and they do it and they really honour our role and our partnership is growing so I'm really keen to support this. Also our elected member salary recently went up and although that's set independently from us, there is a set by us it's and within our discretion and so I don't think it's too far apart to elevate theirs based on their performance while we're equally being elevated. So I think it's a case of rising tide and authentic partnership. So I'm happy to support it. Thank you. Councillor Bunting. Thank you. Um, I'll support it going through to the next stage um, because just to sort of reframing it, and that's really what we're voting on here, is um, taking it to the to the, the real gnarly debate we're going to have on in April the um, 23rd. So I wouldn't want to kill it dead now. Uh, I want to learn a little bit more about it and speak to some more elected members on it. So for that reason, I'll be supporting it. Councillor Taylor. Thank you, uh, Mayor Southgate. I totally acknowledge um, Councillor Hamilton's comments there, and, and I agree uh, with it. I, I think my um, I, I really just wanted to probe a little on the strategy, because um, 30K is a significant uh, amount for a strategy, and I just wanted to get a more fulsome idea, uh, really, of what it involved and, and if it was uh, value for money. Yeah. Thank you. Councillor O'Leary. Thank you. I'm really happy to support this. Um, I often, when when items like this come up, um, like to remind the chamber of my experience when I first started, and um, we had no budget line um, for, um, we, and we didn't even have a, a Maori advisor on the team. So, you know, we are obligated um, via the local government act and um, the treaty to. Uh, make sure that our partnership with Māori is um, a solid one, and this is um, a small, you know, a small a small pocket of money really for um, some strategic work that I think is probably a decade overdue. So I'm very happy to support. Thank you, Councillor Thompson. I support the words of both Councillor Hamilton and Councillor O'Leary, um, and note that you know, having a strategy or a Māori plan is actually you know something that. I'm surprised we don't have. Um, uh, Mangai Norm Hill brought it up with me back on Waitangi Day and I thought it was a great idea, so I'm really excited to see that it's in here. Um, other councils say Auckland Council, they've got an independent Māori statutory board and they have a plan and it gives direction in terms of what are aspirations for Māori and, and, and here it'll be you know, from Māori and Hamilton um, and how we can help to and work together on that, so really supportive. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Forsyth. There's this opportunity to have a bit of a plug, so hopefully somewhere in that uh, perhaps 30,000, if it's strategy only, uh, we can actually have some sort of uh, presence or representation or some sort of um, art presence here in the chamber that's that has a... Um, as a voice for Māori. I mean, it's a bereft of anything Māori at the moment, and um, I've said it before, so an opportunity to have some sort of um, artwork, some sort of uh, photography, anything, but some sort of acknowledgement would be fantastic. Mm. Thank you, Councillor Forsyth. No, Councillor Gallagher. I won't. I think it's, it's, I'm very pleased that Councillor Forsyth has raised that specific issue and the broader issue uh, which started informally in the last term of council at the sort of mayor's office level, uh, is <coughs> with the, the, this civic precinct. And I really live for the day when Captain Hamilton can be kept lots of company. Uh, so when you walk into this civic precinct, when you walk into the... I, you didn't hear that interjection, fortunately. But when you uh, walk into this precinct from uh, the, the town square, garden place, whatever, uh, hopefully you, you have a greater sense of, of the totality of our history. So it shouldn't just be in the chamber here. I'll leave it at that. But I think I'm looking forward that obviously the mayor's office, one would assume, you know, you'll, you'll be pursuing that. And that's really good. And we, we wait for, for further advice on that. Mm. Thank you. Mm. I was nodding. I was nodding when you were talking about the artwork, Margaret. So just in, and I'm going to vote in support of this. Um, I think Angela articulated very well our legislative responsibilities, but we have responsibilities beyond that too. 
to show some leadership in this area with 40% of Māori coming from this area. Uh, you know, we have an obligation to represent their interests and to do that we need to have them as partners at the table. So I'll go to the vote on that. Oh, like the no, I've got ideas for that. I'll tell you. I'll tell you at lunchtime. The motion is carried unanimously. Thank you. Um, now we're on to uh, attachment four, which is the city events focus. Um, this is predominantly around the work of Tracy Wood's team, the city events, the civic events in particular, and council-based events, um, and some engagement in our neighbourhood with your neighbourhood events. Um, do you want to speak to this some more, or does uh, No, I'm, I'm happy, to, happy to take questions on it. OK, we'll go into questions on this bit. Hang on. Got, um, there are no questions. Right, somebody going to move, move that this event strategy money per... You're going to move it? Councillor Van Oosten, seconder. Councillor Gallagher. Discussion, anyone? Comments, discussion? Maxine, you're the move, mover in this case. Do you want to say anything to it? This, this, this is not, this is just addressing a significant resource issue we have at the moment. This is not a extra in the sense, this is just covering the enormous shortfall and will relieve the pressure, incredible pressure. Uh, and frankly, it's been, I, I don't know how our staff team have, have done this part with the resources they have, so I'm, I'm very focused on getting this wrong, righted. Councillor Van Oosten. Thank you, Martin, for, <laughs> for doing that. Um, but what I'd like to say is that this is uh, often the face of where the community sees us at these larger type events at, uh, out in their communities and in their environment. And uh, by under-resourcing um, this area, we fall short of our promise to our residents. And uh, I, along with Martin, um, uh, agree that this should be righted uh, into the future and am happy to move that these funds be made available to Tracy and her team and uh, help her to continue to do the great work that she does. Thank you very much. Speaking in support of this, I absolutely agree. And we had another fine example of the outreach that we get in running a really good event, which is done uh, from the staff driving it, but with a huge um, pool of volunteers also. We were at Children's Day. And um, the amount of work that goes into that is amazing. But if you had come, were able to have come to that meet at that, that particular event, you'd have seen thousands of children and families connecting, feeling like this was their city, having such a great deal of fun. And I think that's good. But also I attend um, the citizenship ceremonies and you can't underestimate how important that is to new citizens to become New Zealanders and to have chosen Hamilton as their home. And the team work incredibly hard to make the best of those occasions, but we are seeing more and more need for civic events. They're not going to get smaller. There's not going to get less people involved. They're only going to get bigger and more people. And we do have a high-quality job, and to continue to do that, we do need a bit of resourcing. So that's why I'm in favour of it. Go to the vote. The motion is carried unanimously. Thank you. Thank you, and please pass on our regards to the team for the fantastic work that they do out and about there. We're now moving to community engagement a5, and I think this is one because I have, thank you, Natalie, I was going to say, this is one because um, uh, I have heard a number of questions coming from councillors as to what it looks like, what it means, but I do think we need a little bit of a lead-in too. Um, but I will say that um, this is driven from a staff lens based on the amount of they, resources they have in hand to deliver what we as councillors have long said we want to deliver, which is better, wider,
public engagement with our public. We've all said that. And I know that it appears like it's something that I'm promoting, but I'm not, I'm not although I'm fully in support of this. I want to make sure that our staff can do the job that they have to do in talking with and engaging with our community to the best standard. And I think we're scratching the surface on that, and there's so much more we can do. Natalie gave the most stunning um, presentation to local government conference with a whole amount, a range of tools and ideas that can really refresh this space and make people want to talk with us in meaningful ways and often. And I think this is partly what this is about. Natalie. Uh, thank you, Mipol. I'll just, just quickly before I sort of hand over to Natalie, I just wanted to um, reiterate um, what the Mayor has said. So what we had heard from elected members this term and last was that we need to be better um, at understanding what our community wants, what their expectations are, so that we can reflect that into um, the things that we do. This proposal um, is responding to what we understand to be those elected member expectations. Uh, and this is our um, this is how we would respond to what we to understand that elected members want to achieve. Um, but we're the you'll see there's a number comp a number of components um, in the proposal. Um, they are they can be considered in parts, but there are some um, I guess implications of only doing some bits and not others that um, there might be sort of flow on effects to those. But that's that's absolutely a discussion that we can have. Thanks. And sorry, I'll introduce Nat Natalie Palmer for those that don't know, or for those watching in the public gallery, um, our head of communication and engagement. Good morning, all, um, and thanks. I guess a lot of it's already been covered by Sean and by Mayor Paula, but essentially, just to um, add to this, that over the tw past 12 months, we've really been stepping up our community engagement activity across council. I think that um, it's very clear that our community, as, you're, as you all are aware, that they want to talk to us, and they want to talk to us more. So this strategy and the, um, the proposal that we've put forward is really about how do we best make the most of, I guess, capturing the voices of the community, making it easy for them to share their voices with us. And then the second part of that is actually making sure we're using the insights gained from that engagement to inform council decision making and how we run, um, run our city. So just on that, um, the, just a bit about the communication and engagement team. So we're a very um, fast-paced, diverse team. We've got, um, we cover all aspects of communication, so gone are the days where it's just about media and press releases. We're a lot more focused on that community engagement space, the digital engagement with our online communities, managing our corporate channels, such as our website, um, social media channels, running events, um, from marketing to brand, so everything that comes out of this council has gone through my team. So it's a very diverse area, so just, I guess, you'll see that when you see through the business case just how much we kind of do cover across the council. So we work right across the council and as a team, really, really committed to doing the best that we can and improving our engagement with our community. So over to you for any questions. Councillor Pascoe. Yeah. This uh, community engagement has nothing at all to do with Andy's team, does it? This is just the communications side of community engagement. So, yes and no. Yes, we work really, really closely in partnership with Andy's team and community, community development. So what we do in this space will obviously impact what they do in their space. So we work really closely together. But this has come from yeah, largely the communication engagement unit, but obviously working really closely with Andy and right across the board with all parts of council. So, so Bev Gattenby's report that was done last year that has nothing at all to do with your comms team? It had a, nothing to do it, or was it, not part of her report? They're, they're related, but this proposal doesn't relate. But this relate, proposal is quite does, different. Yeah, OK, OK. I, I guess it's just a little confusing in terms of where the, where the overlap might be. Um, what, what's, what's the current size of um, the comms team? I would call it the comms team, but obviously it's communications and engagement. What's the current size in terms of FTEs? The current size, including so digital and events um, components of our team, is 18, and that, uh, that includes about four, uh, four positions that are covered by our capital um, projects because right. they've been brought in to assist with capital projects there, so 18 all up. So when you talk about community events, that also includes 
Tracy and her team does it as part of that 17 yep. FTEs. <coughs> okay. Yep. Okay. And and I guess what you're telling us is that that team is absolutely exhausted in terms of what work needs to be done, and hence the reason to um, justify a further uh, pers p further personnel. So the, just to be clear, in this proposal, there's um, one extra um, person um, included. Um, most of the the rest of it is relating to. Um, more engagement events, um, there's a, um, a more digital um, communication, um, so increasing our social media um, presence. Um, it includes so more your neighbourhood events, uh, potentially a mobile um, engagement unit, so yep. a yep. You know, caravan bus type um, thing, um, and some casual staff to support um, support those as well, but there's only uh, there's, there's one additional FTE included in the proposal. So why haven't we combined the two together and, and instead of having them separate for the purposes of, given that that Tracy's team is part of and, and we've previously agreed to the increase in that spend, why aren't we combining the two together for the purposes of um, this? Uh, we we wanted the events bit to be considered separately because it is. Um, there are slightly different reasons for that. So with the events team, that is responding to um, essentially kind of under-resourcing or sort of work pressure and the amount of um, work that we're trying to put through. When we say Tracy and her team, there's Tracy and one other person. Uh, this is sort of taking a, a sort of a broader approach to responding to elected member um, requests for more, better, different types of engagement in the community. So this this is essentially a... Um, providing a higher level of service from an engagement point of view, whereas the events one was more around responding to some existing pressures. Thank you. Councillor Bunting. Thank you. Um, I'm really interested to hear more about it as time goes on. I'm quite excited about the work you're doing. Um, one thing, though, has, has, has picked up my eyes a little bit, and that's the purchase and operation of a mobile engagement unit. We had a briefing about this recently, and... The team couldn't be too specific on how much that was going to cost. I think you'd put in somewhere around 100 grand, etc. Can you give us some detail on what that is, what it's going to look like, and what you expect to get for that amount of money? So, um, as discussed at the briefing, still more details to come to actually explain exactly what it will look like. But essentially, um, if it is, you know, um, gets to the next step, some sort of uh, mobile trailer. If you think type kind of like life education trust, as you. Well, as I grew up, went along to Life Education Trust, and we, what we're wanting is some sort of vehicle, whether it be a trailer or a caravan, whatever is appropriate, that can be fitted out with all the required technology. So it will have the screens, it will have areas for our VR goggles, it will have interactive touch screen so we can show our maps and um, things like that. Um, it will be all powered up, have you know the Wi-Fi and the Bluetooth. That's required because at the moment, when we do go out for events, more and more things are done digitally because mm. that's a, it's more um, sustainable. It means we can keep reusing things over and over and it also means we can engage with more people and get them involved in a different type of way. When we currently go out, we need to hire all those things. We need to hire screens and te technology. We can't do a lot when we go outdoors because of the sun and the light. So the, I guess a lot of the costs will be, and I'd say about 50 grand at least, would be around the actual setup of having these things in place. Mm. So then we can just keep reusing them as we create more collateral. So you really reckon you can get a a life education size caravan, all the gear and everything for 50k? It may not be as big as a life education um, right. trust van, but... What's that? Water <laughs> Yeah, yeah. But it'll be some sort of trailer that we can easily park up and remove the need for marquees in our own space. We, I guess the whole purpose of it, and the, I guess the whole reason why it's put forward as, as an idea, is that it will enable us to get to more events more often, and it will enable us to get to, I guess, continue and take our your neighbourhood community engagement program to the next level so we can go out to school galas and school fairs and sports fields and things like that. And rather than requiring set-up fees as well as a lot of resource, you know, yeah. people resource, um, we can probably get a couple of people to go out there and actually be able to be there available on the day. Yeah. So what it is going to look like exactly is, I'm still, you know, we're, we're not sure yet, but I would expect and I'd want to work within the budget outlined in this. Yeah, okay, okay. and I want to be encouraging about it, but I've, as a governor I've got to probe in with these questions, like we've got a heck of a lot of trucks in our fleet, we've got a heck of a lot of vehicles that we could already take, mm -hmm. and I notice that these things we already take, a lot of our very good staff 
So are we using our resource appropriately? And you know, I'm just quite nervous about this one. I think this is going to be a big one. Yeah, and I just want to clarify. So the for that mobile engagement unit, the the costs in here are one hundred and twenty thousand dollars. Right. So the fifty that Natalie's referring to was sort of the sort of fit out of, but there's obviously purchase and and whatever else relating to that. Yeah. But the the capital cost that we've put into uh, for that particular piece of it is one hundred and twenty thousand. Okay. Um, in relation to other sort of council vehicles and what have you, um, if if we want to um, go to a lot more events, so if we want to go to the farmers markets and the school fairs and all those kinds of things, obviously the council vehicles we have are for a for a different purpose and they you know are used for that purpose. Mm. Um, occasionally, when we have the your neighbourhood events, we sort of call on the different you know we call on different parts of council and um, we all sort of turn up with um, different displays. Um, if we're going to increase that level of activity next year, then we do need some more dedicated resource. Okay. We think that having a mobile um, unit is probably the most cost-effective way to um, to attend those additional events. Um, if we don't want to attend more um, of those things, then we wouldn't be recommending to, to do okay. it. I'll look, thanks. I'll, I'll take up enough time on that. We'll talk more in, offline in a minute. Thank you, Mr. Southgate. Councillor Wilson. Yeah, thanks, uh, Your Worship. Look, um, uh, just a couple of questions, if, if I could. Um, currently, the um, comms and engagement team are at 18 staff. Um, what is the current overall budget? Per year, uh, I I don't have the figures in front of me. I'm sorry, um, Councillor Wilson. Okay, so I I, I yeah, will sure need I, I will need that. Yep. Uh, I remind you that I asked a very similar question uh, at the workshop around numbers. So I would have assumed you would be able to tell me the budget spend in our uh, community engagement. Yeah. I'll, so I'll. We'll just get those for you and we'll, sure. uh, we'll answer the question before we um, end of this. So the proposal in front of us right now is to increase um, whatever that budget quantum is uh, by nearly $2 million uh, over the next five years. Uh, that's what the request is in front of us now. Could you help me understand the progression of staff numbers in this department? Uh, I did ask this and you were going to come back to me. Um, we're at 18 now. What were we five years ago? All right. An another question. Why now? If what I hear you say to me is modern times need to be more engaging, need to have technology, need to go to the people with a new fit-for-purpose vehicle. Um, why have you given much thought to living within your current budget, once you're able to tell me what that is, um, and reprioritise? Why does this have to be new spend? And the second limb of that question is... Why now? Why shouldn't this be part of the long-term plan where we get to thrash out uh, our, our strategy in a more meaningful way? It's in response to elected member um, requests. So we could consider it as part of the long-term plan. Um, the implications of that would be that we don't do um, more, better, different um, activity over the course of the next 12 months. That, like, sim simply... Simply put, um, it would mean that we, we don't do the additional engagement. Right. And so we, we absolutely could consider this as part of the long-term plan instead of, instead of now. The reason that we are looking at it now is because it's come through as an elected member request as part of the annual plan. And why would you then have it for five years? Uh, the five, it's, it's, so it wouldn't be for five years. Um, so we are in the annual plan. So the, the business... The, the business case format um, simply shows five years to indicate that it's an ongoing annual, an ongoing annual expense. 
when you're actually approving changes um, to the annual plan, you're approving costs for one year. But again, um, similar to the item um, that sort of David described earlier, we, we reflect that where something is likely to be an ongoing cost, that that's shown so that the financial strategy, impl financial strategy implications are clear. Just before you ask your next question, Councillor Wilson, because I know you've got a, you're primed for it, hold that thought. Um, so basically where this has come from is we've had uh, from previous councils, as in the previous council and this council, there's been an increased um, uh, focus on greater community engagement um, for the right reasons. Fair I'm not disputing your comment about sucking it up within the current budgets, but I'm just saying from an outcome point of view. Um, every time we do a community event, um, in the, we, we get feedback from the community and elected members, that was great, we should do more of these. So we've been having those sort of conversations about, it seems to be a particular approach that's resonating with the community as a whole, but also elected members are enjoying the level of engagement that are coming from it. So we've taken those opportunities to work out, well, if we were to actually make this business as usual, and that's what I just want to hold that term, business as usual, um, what would it look like? And the reason that this isn't business as usual is that um, we have a whole lot of um, uh, existing BAU workload that won't go away. Maybe over time it will, if we have greater engagement with the community, we'd be maybe be more responsive and won't need it, but at this point in time, they're two different distinct things. As a, as a contrast, Tauranga's um, comms engagement team, excluding uh, digital and civic events, is 18. Right, so, um, and one of the things that creates a bit of a furore with the media, I'll say that loud, furore with the media, is the extent to which we have spin doctors in the team, right? That we spend a whole lot of time <coughs> messing with the message to make sure we pitch ourselves in the most positive light. That's not the way we do comms anymore. We have teams that respond to media requests, but our majority focus for this team is engagement. And that's the shift as to what's additional money is. We're pushing the barrow out from an engagement perspective, not from a comms perspective, right? We are improving our comms representation through digital and, and so forth, but this is an engagement pitch. We will get you the numbers in terms of how it's evolved. Um, and if apples for apples with towering if we were to back out the four capital-related items, we're 14 to the 18. Oh, sorry, if we were to back out those four, how many in Tracy's team? <coughs> two. two. Back out two there for 12, how many in our digital team? Ten. 10 to 18 comparable, right? Mm. So on a really crude, in this moment, benchmarking activity, which I put no validity into apart from maths, um, we're actually doing quite well. Yes, one should probably remember the ratepayers of Tauranga are facing a significant rate increase. For growth expenditure. Uh, so I have no doubt that their elected members will be robustly... Uh, let, let's not yes. get into debate. Um, let's ask the or questions. You wish it, well, I, I guess, yeah. look, I'll, I'll hold any further question, but clearly we're not putting this item to the vote until <coughs> we have the information we need, because I asked for this in the last workshop, Okay. And if, if I, 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 I'm not trying to be rude, Your Worship, oh, nor no, will no, I no, be you're rushed. Not. You're, you're um, fine. The reality is I need the information. And we're talking about, uh, I accept the argument has been that we as politicians have said we want more of this. We've got a, a document in front of us that says that that request is going to cost us $1.8 million in five year, over five years. And I want to understand what the current spend of this department is. Yep. And then I think that will inform all of our view of whether or not this is something we kick for touch until we consider it amongst all the other challenging and important issues as part of the long-term plan. Hmm. I don't disagree. I think... What I would suggest we do with this item is that you are entitled to the answer to your questions. And um, I think what we're hearing from Richard and the team is that we'll get that. So what I propose to do, given the time of day it is, is and we've got five questions, possibly more, on the board, is to go through the questions and then to take a lunch break for the, for the information to come back and then we'll come back into debate after, after lunch. Because I, I've... Oh, some questions disappeared. OK, let's go with the questions we have. with lunch. Oh, did I? So, <laughs> Councillor Gallagher. Yes, obviously, word for word, you and asked all my questions, of course, but I'm impressed with that line of questioning and also very concerned in terms of the information, so I'm not proceeding with this until that information is there. But just one of the issues I've noticed over 
um, two previous mayoralties as well, is I want to just, an excellent presentation, <coughs> LGNZ, I want to um, seize up around the how, it's not the matter of the elected wing telling you whether to do a paper edition of City News or not, because you've got expertise to make that call, all right? It's not doing the operational stuff. But in terms of the broad strategic direction and the messaging, uh, and I've used the central government parallel. There's no way Helen Clark would have just had no say over what came out of the government of New Zealand at the, of the day, and I'm sure the current Prime Minister and previous ones. I'm just trying to tease up that relationship you have with, first of all, the office of the mayor, and then the rest of us in terms of us not reading about stuff after an event in terms of, you know, just, you know, direction of travel, how much you, you involve the elected wing, um, and how much you seek the elected wing's uh, input. So, definitely want to work closely with the elected wing. Um, in terms of the Mayor's Office, we work really closely with my team and um, particularly Jeanette Terrell and the, um, the Mayor's Office regarding issues, um, how we communicate them, how we approach the engagement. So the current wellbeing engagement that we're doing is a prime example of that, working together to make sure we're pitching it correctly and working on it to make sure we engage with as most people and as many people as we can. I think um, going forward um, as part of our communication and engagement strategy is to improve that communication and engagement with elected members, i.e. You, know, you are key ambassadors for the community and we need to make sure that you're, I guess we're working really closely together because when we're out capturing this feedback from the community, that's going to be brought back in to help you and assist you to make decisions around the future of the city. So my take on it is that, yes, we need to, we should work together really, really well, and we need to work together going forward um, to make sure that you're fully aware of what's coming up before you read about it in the newspaper or before you read about it in another channel. Can that I just answer that, that comment about other elected members being able to be the voice of those those messages? That is, in fact, happening. I know that Margaret's down to do a... Um, a some, be the voice for the environmental committee. So I am trying to use the chairs and deputy chairs as much as possible in that approach so that it isn't only... It isn't just me, but it is actually the people leading the area of interest. So that is that is planned for. So you will see, people will see and hear from all of you according to your portfolios of interest and so on. So, um, but, you know, that's an iterative process, really. I think, uh, I guess, yeah, just a quick question, because others. Uh, th that, that's fine, and that that's good. But in terms of the, the total strategy, depend, whatever the final budget is, is the ability of this elected wing to see it and tick it off in principle so we, we actually have input because we are the government, all right? And there's a very clear difference between governance, as we know, and staff. And this is, this is the way in which we communicate our program to, the city, to our city is, is real governance stuff. And I'm just, I'm just trying to tease out, obviously, probably improving that a bit, that link. Yeah. And and I, I'll leave it at that. I mean, it's, yeah. And just on that, uh, all, sorry, <laughs> all of the proposals outlined in the business case is in response to the communication and engagement strategy that was sent out to you all um, via the executive update a couple of weeks ago. So this should set the scene exactly of where we're going. Um, and obviously very happy to have any conversations about this particular strategy because these have come from the proposals within the business case have come from this overarching strategy that looks at the four key components of our communication and engagement activity. Thank you. Um, um, Madam Mayor, can I just go back to the budget question? Sure. If I may. If, um, yeah. um, so the, the budget for the um, communication engagement function is $1.76 million. Per year? Correct. And so what that includes is obviously the personnel costs, um, the also advertising and marketing, um, there's also um, event expenses, uh, it also includes the sponsorship costs for uh, the uh, Christmas trust, uh, the Christmas parade, um, and the usual other. So that's part part of your question, Councillor Wilson. Still. Yes. So one point seven six mil per year, and so the additional um, quantum 
regarding staff numbers just, over the last five years? How I'm, I'm just chasing that down. Um, just in terms of the budget, the uh, personnel costs as part of that are 1.37. Okay, we need that all in one place in a cohesive um, um, block of information that we can bring back after lunch. I'm just going to carry on with the questions. Councillor Thomas Thompson. Don't know why you became Thomas then. <laughs> Catherine Thomas. Yeah, Catherine. Yeah. <laughs> That's my new I possibly name. need lunch. <laughs> Thank you, Natalie. Um, I'm really interested in the idea of moving towards a strong emphasis on um, engagement and I've got a few questions kind of around that so we've got some quite potentially ambitious stuff coming <coughs> through the pipeline with this new council say um, a refresh of the biking micro mobility plan and things and um, as uh, Councillor Mark has pointed out before you know the difference between success and failure with things like biking in particular, um, is around community engagement. So how do you see this being able to kind of um, improve our ability to engage on issues like that? So the strategy is exactly, I've been created exactly for that reason. There's a lot of things that we're doing that we, that we require more engagement on. Um, there's more of a drive for, I guess, from both from within to do more engagement, but also more expectations from the community to engage with us better. They want to engage with us in a way that suits them, um, in a way that's targeted and personalised and stuff like that. So all of the, I guess, the um, proposals within this business case are exactly going to enable us to keep ahead of the game and to keep up with the demands from the community and to meet the very valid expectations. It's no longer okay just to send out a letter and a story and expect them to read it on our Facebook page. Um, as you all know, like Facebook is a prime example, it's no, no longer okay just to put a post out and expect people to see it. It all requires funding now. So we're competing all the time with all the messages with you know from corporate organisations, from private organisations, from our partners, um, you know, local councils and things like that out there. So this proposal is exactly what we need to make sure we are doing that engagement properly, mm -hmm. whether it's around the new biking connectivity plans, whether it's around upcoming, um, you know, proposals around the long-term plan, whether it's around what we're going to do with Founders Theatre. All those kind of, I guess, projects require really slick, innovative, bold campaigns to make sure we're capturing the community's voice and that is the whole purpose of this content engagement strategy, to be able to do that for yeah. this organisation and for the community. And in terms, because it was mentioned in the business case, kind of a desire from elected members to get more engagement with underrepresented um, sections of our community. Um, so how can this kind of, I guess, help with that? And then just another kind of related question is around civics education and engagement in our elections. I'm interested in how potentially this ramped up kind of engagement um, program might it, whether um, we can ensure that it uh, increases that engagement in our you know upcoming elections as well. Um, so whether whether we can ensure, you know, whether we can promise that the elected, mm -hmm. you know, voting turnout increases next time round, I couldn't put my mm -hmm. hand on heart to say yes, it's going to increase it. But I think the recent elections and the um, the commitment and the effort from across council, from government and the comms team and community community development, that did show you know, an increase. We didn't, do, there wasn't the massive decline like the most of the other metros saw. So I think that we can only try our best. Um, I. I also think that elections are not just a one-off campaign that we can do in three months and hope to increase mm -hmm. voter turnout. We need to keep going, and it becomes from those genuine, sustained relationships that, as each of you have with community groups and stakeholders, that we need to have as a council. So again, this is the whole kind of backbone to the strategy and these proposals, because mm -hmm. we need to maintain those relationships, keep council relevant. We need to make sure that we are um, targeting our communication and making sure we're out there in the appropriate way. And a big thing is putting a face to council. So having those conversations and making sure um, yeah, we are maintaining that. And that's 
I believe that this is the best way forward for us to be able to um, get those engagement numbers up. Yeah. Civic education is a key part of it. Understanding what council does, why are we here, what do we even do, all of that's part of our on, like our plan is to do mm -hmm. a lot more in that space. Yeah. And this type of the extra resources required to make sure we're doing that, rather than just focusing on the reactive kind of project-based mm -hmm. um, communication and engagement, because that's what always is the. I guess it becomes the priority, the project-based stuff, which is required, which is what we're here for, but we need to actually make time to make sure we step it up and t tell that wider mm -hmm. council story. And I can't remember you're in the Oh, yeah, and the that, other sorry. one was the underrepresented kind yeah. of areas of the community, yeah. so. And very well aware of that, and that's, yeah. again, another priority area for us to look at, working again with the community development team on that and how we can do that better. And also with that, because as we get more and more diverse, reality is that comes with extra costs because we need to look at translations. We need to look at different ways of providing information. So rather than just having one brochure, which may cost X, you know, now we've got to look at, okay, so what languages do we need to um, translate that into? Where should we be advertising? So we, you know, a um, good example is recent advertising within the Waikato Chinese newspaper. We knew that it was really important to get the Chinese community um, aware of that Anglesey Street intersection project. So again, but that costs more to do because we can't just go out again with a media release and expect everyone to see mm -hmm. it. So very high in our priority area and doing a lot of work around how we make sure we capture different um, geographic areas, different ethnicities, different ages and all the different demographics across the city. Mm, okay, yeah, thank you, because something I've noticed is lots of people still don't know what we do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and finally, um, just in terms of, say, uh, how could we be, uh, what measurements will be in place in terms of, you know, say we did, we had 18 months of extra, you know, um, engagement at a higher service level, um, what measures would there be that we could see to see, you know, did it improve engagement, um, attitudes in the community towards council or that kind of thing? So um, existing um, metrics, I guess, and measurements we have is through the quality of life survey that does measure perceptions around the city and around council and trust in council decision making. As part of the business case, there's also some money in there to do more representative like research, market research. And again, that would be how we actually make sure that we are very well aware of what the community think about a, our services that we provide in our city, you know, our services and levels of service, but B, also what their perceptions are of council and, you know, how they see us as an organisation. Um, also along with that is obviously the, it's not always about the numbers when it comes to engagement and consultation. You can't always measure a successful consultation just because you've got lots of numbers. Might actually mean you've actually done not a very good job because people might be and you know, really negative and really against what you're proposing. But it's about, I guess, through each of those engagement and consultation um, campaigns, it's about, you know, not trying to be too cliche, but the conversations and the quality of the conversations and I guess the quality of submissions and feedback in terms of how understanding they are of the issue that we're talking about and then therefore, as long as they well understand the issue, then we can really, I guess, take on board their, their feedback, whether it's support or against. So there's a, there'll be a variety of measures across the next 18 months. Thank you. Councillor Van Oosten. Um, hi, Natalie. Um, thanks, Sean, for um, your input today. Uh, my um, question con is concerned about the um, ongoing cost uh, of the project that you're talking about and taking into account, Sean, your response to that, and David, yours also. Um, one way of being able to get these kinds of projects over the line is to um, set them up uh, as a trial and to be able to um, properly uh, you know, resource um, that with the required personnel and equipment. Um, I'm really excited about the, the digital approach that you're taking, um, but that comes at a cost. Um, is there the opportunity, do you see, to be able to use that trial as, a, as an opportunity to uh, then um, look at providing it on a more permanent basis? I think there's definitely, you could do it on a trial. I'm just trying to think. A, part of, a lot of the stuff, and sorry, a lot of the proposals within here is actually changing our 
how we do our BAU as the comms and engagement unit for, and how we do, you know, deliver comms and engagement for an organisation. That takes time to build up. So we've had 12 months of really, I think, stepping up and building up our commitment to community engagement and how we run our communication um, team here. And so I think that while you could trial certain tools, and to see how they work. So a lot of our things we do trial different, whether it's a new website, whether it's the wellbeing website that we've got currently going, which is a, a bit of a different take on how we engage with our community. We trial new VR gear and interactive maps. So they're all essentially trials that we, we do give them a go. And because we think that they'll work and we know that they will work and they've been proven to work. Um, whether you could trial in terms of you know the, your neighbourhood vehicle, yes, you could probably lease, find something to lease and set it out and see how it goes. So I think, in short, yes, you definitely could, but some of it is a part of our BAU and our culture of how we prioritise and how we want to prioritise community engagement within this organisation, which takes a bit more of a sustained effort over time. Thanks. Just uh, one quick question for me, and then we are going to take a break while you bring all the facts that everybody's raised to the table, and we'll debate it afterwards. Um, <coughs> I've often um, lamented the fact that one of our primary contacts with people around our plans is those dry as toast submission forms that are very responsive. You know, the, um, the workup's already been done by council, the draft plan, whatever it might be, and we send out a three-page um, form that doesn't inspire anyone to fill it out, to be quite honest. Is part of this budget that you're talking about going to reinvent the way that people can inform council of how they feel about what we're doing outside those submission forms. Yep, that's exactly right. So this, the proposals in here will give us the time and the resource to be able to actually have the time to think about doing those things differently. We already are touching, starting to do it, but um, we need to do it more and for all of our things. So a good example is hearings, for example, while they fit our purposes, they're easy for us to manage as a council, they're not exactly the most welcoming for the community. They're done it during work time largely where people can't get to us. They don't really want to speak <coughs> to us because it's quite um, daunting. And so, But that all requires extra time and resource to make those happen because you can have all sorts of drop-in sessions and things like that where people can have their say verbally. Um, this type of process, this, um, these proposals will enable us to try a lot more of those different ways of getting out to the community that will make a big difference and you know, easier ways to submit so they don't have to fill out a form if they, we need to make sure we're capturing all the ways that people are speaking to us. So this will definitely enable us to do that a lot better. And one of the other questions I have if this, if this goes forward in either in part or in total to the next, next um, stage, is just the interplay between what, what you're proposing to do and Andy's team with the community houses, because I agree with you, uh, we can't expect our community to come into our place, our chamber. We have to go where they are, and Andy's team are at least in part where they are. So I want to understand, who you, I don't know if you have a comment on it now, if not, I would like to understand how this fits with the community development team, what they're doing to do their job under the new structure they got to, to reach further into the community using their resources alongside yours, and I'd like to understand how those work together. Um, I won't have the detail exactly of how we're working together, but in principle, and we are working really, really closely together on this to bring our teams together to deliver on all of these things. So, for example, oh, Helen, did you want to say something? Thank you. Okay, councillors, what I intend to do is to take a break until um, half past one, because um, we've gone through a lot of t content. I've got a couple of requests. Um, Mark Bunting would like to uh, talk to the Enderley one, so we might do a little bit of swinging things around. Um, Ewan's going to visit with his mother, and that's important to allow that, and would like to talk back on this. So after lunch, depending where who's all back in the room, we may do a bit of jiggling. But we will get through both items, and I will 
work very hard to allow Ewan to have his stay on the community comms and you on the Enderley. Go have lunch. <laughs>
All right. Good afternoon, councillors. Because um, we've got everyone back in the room, we will continue. Excuse me, everyone. We will continue with the um, community engagement piece. Um, Mark would like to discuss the Enderley before 2.30, so we're just mindful of time. If we, if we go too far with this one, we might stop and go to Enderley. But just to, to keep flow, we're going to carry on around the comms. And I just want to make you aware of a recommendation. Have we got wording for it? I'm just working on the recommendation now. Um, but the recommendation will be that um, to bring back to the April meeting. Can you speak in your microphone, oh, please? Anyway, but, um, the recommendation will be along the lines is that we bring back to that from meeting a budget proposal to enhance the 10-year plan engagement program. So not all the other stuff, but just purely focused on increased engagement around the 10-year plan. Um, and what I've been talking to about um, with um, Sean and Natalie about would be possibly a increased budget of $100,000 for an extra 50 thousand for a part-time resource and fifty thousand for events slash collateral on top of what we're currently doing. So it'll be a, it'll be a, a mild lift in the engagement we're currently underway, um, but it won't be all the additional um, your neighbourhood events or the additional digital and, and so forth. So uh, we're just working through a recommendation on that. Although I think our wonderful governance team are typing as I speak. So the magic of yep. Okay, so I am happy to move that. Oh. Where's the new one? So just in, just in explaining where I'm going with that, I'm going to have, move it. I'm going to second, um, Deputy Mayor Taylor's going to second it. Where we're going with that is that based on the tenure of the questions, we haven't got into debate yet, but we've, um, we're hearing where the, the questions are leading us to um, um, give us some certainty around what doing a better job around community engagement ahead of the long-term plan would look like, because I think we all share that ambition to do a good job of reaching out to our community for the long-term plan, um, and enable comms to do some of the work that they've got underway. This will take us there. The bigger picture about the mobile unit, the other things that might occur, will be part of the long-term plan discussion. So we'll come up against other proposals at that time in a much more robust and informed way that we can digest and tackle. That is the intention. We'll go into discussion and just, you know, in the same way as we've had discussion on all the other items, let's see. Um, but I've moved, we'll see what the, where the discussion takes us. Councillor, uh, sorry. Oh, we finished questions. Question. Too. On the motion? On the, on the report that's coming back on the 29th. So that will obviously, there'll obviously be the total budget. It'll also pick up the staffing trends as per request, request by Councillor Wilson. Uh, and obviously it will also then give us some good, some relatively good micro detail of, of the way in which that budget's gonna be allocated. Yeah, absolutely, and, and I will circulate information on the staff numbers well, uh, well ahead of that. We're just so we've been trying to um, just pull those numbers over the course of the lunch break. The, uh, we haven't quite got um, the confirmed numbers and budgets yet, but I'll make sure that we do that um, ASAP. And g given that this this particular activity is crucial to the way in which the democratically elected members present themselves across to the community because they've been elected, you'll do some detail about the kind of well the interactions that you'll have with us as part of that strategy. Sorry, can you just repeat that question? Well, please, I'm, I'm really wanting to get a bit of extra micro detail as what are going to be the touch points between, um, for want of the better word, the, the comms communications team in terms of the, the overall engagement strategy and the elected members. Yeah. Yeah, we we'll think we've got, we've got that. Yes. Okay, let's go into... Sorry, in the motion. Yep, yep. Because um, we've just had the motion changed and we're straight into debate about a motion that we've had no full warning about. Um, so we had all this rationale about um, of enhancing our engagement, neighbourhood and everything, and all of a sudden that's just gone and it's going to be parked in part well, of... You, you, you're welcome to move an alternative. No, that's... no, I'm just wanting clarity of the mm. rationale for suddenly switching motions in the middle of something we've had major discussion about. 
So, so the rationale is, as I've described, I didn't think that we were going to get the support around the table for the full quantum that was proposed in this report and the full approach. Um, I support having more resources in com community engagement for a variety of reasons, as I've said before, to do better than we did with the last LTP. We need to reach more people. We need to reach more people where they are. We need to give them more tools to engage with us for their long-term plan. So in this recommendation, it allows staff to come back to the April meeting with a refocus on what do we need to do to really turn up the dial in public engagement for the long-term plan. But some of the bigger issues and um, opportunities that were in the report would fall back to a long-term plan discussion. That allows us to have some debate, um, further debate, some have sessions, some workshop sessions, some more information, have all our questions answered. So it was my, it was my um, response to getting a solution we could go forward with in the short term while answering those questions. But in debate, you're welcome to speak to things that are not working for you or an alternative recommendation, if you wish, Councillor. Thank you. Councillor Pascoe. Thank you. Chair, look, I'm just asking the question. Um, the CE uh, mentioned at the beginning of the session today that, that uh, he would be telling us what the risks are of not going ahead with recommendations. Are there any risks involved in not going ahead with, um, and I'm, look, I've lost it because it's down the, underneath yep. that, the risks of not going ahead with the recommended motion that we were discussing before lunch? Yep. Um, so we'll bring that back as part of the 29th of April report. Um, we can, it, we, what we're doing is not precluding you increasing on that 29th of April an increased budget allocation should you wish to. But what you're saying is the starting point is this. I mean, risk will be that we may not necessarily have the resource to fully support some of our engagement or plan changes and so forth with the community, and that's a real risk. But without understanding, working with Natalie, I'm a bit on the fly to actually give you specific risk at this point in time, but we will do our best to bring that back in the 29th of April for you to understand those. So you'll tell us exactly what the risks are of not, um, uh, of not increasing the expenditure by 370,000 plus 120,000? Yeah, I will tell you what the risks are. Whether I can exactly do that, it's probably defies the definition of risk, but I will tell you what the risks are, yes. Thank you. Councillor Forsyth. <clears throat> Thanks. It's my understanding that our engagement and uh, reach, et cetera, given under the current budget has been much improved um, as of recent times. Is that correct? Uh, I, I believe so. Okay. Uh, that's the assumption I'm making, just sort of reading between the lines, et cetera. So if we're already doing a good job the assumption is that we want to be doing better. And my question then is, what's $100,000? I mean, I, I feel like that number's just been plucked out of the air. We've had a 390 quantum put to us, and there's been some rationale behind it. To me, 100K just sounds like, well, we can't get 390 over the line, let's go for 100. But I, I'm not quite sure what 100 m will mean as far as delivery. It's um, earmarked to enhance 10-year plan engagement, but what does what does $100,000 worth of expenditure mean so, that we'll be able to deliver in that? So we've been asked at this point in time to put a recommendation forward <coughs> as an alternative. I attach the $100,000 on it to give you guys a, a feeling of quantum. You could well put forward a proposal for $50,000, $20,000, or likewise. I'm comfortable with that. $100,000 will do the best we can, and the 29th of April we'll bring back a program to support that. But at this point in time, it is a placeholder to give you guys some context and comfort that we're not, not going to bring you back a proposal that adds up to $370,000 again. Well, that's my point. There's no context. It's just a number without anything sitting behind it. And I, I know I hear yep. you say you're going to bring it back, but to me, I'm still thinking, well, um, okay, so why not? We're, we're, yeah. We've lapsed into questions. We had our questions before the lunch well, break. Well, no, but, but um, it's yeah. changed. The resolution yeah, has yeah, changed. So I'm happy on um, motion, for sorry. you to get an understanding on that. And then we do need to go into debate this, and you can hold a position in support or against. But any other questions on the motion? No, no. Sarah? Yeah, my question was on the motion. I'm just wondering, because uh, we talked a lot about you know, some of the real upsides of 
boosting the way that we're doing engagement around mm. you know, the impact it could have on civic education engagement um, and supporting you know, transformative stuff we want to do and different things. Um, I guess this feels quite suddenly cut and dry also. You know, I'm just wondering whether we could actually have this um, so that we've got a couple of options that kind of come back to us you know, and reflecting some of the discussion that happens today, but or or we have a, a workshop for people who are interested just to say, you know, we're if we're going to trim this, what do we prioritise? And you know, here's option A and B for something slightly different. Mm. Well, we could. We started yes. off this conversation with staff where we said um, extending resource for an enhanced ten-year engagement plan full stop. And that has whatever it has around it. So in other words, they would go away and think about how do we do better business around the 10-year plan, which is what you're saying. Yes, just that we can get some well-thought-out options with a bit of chance for engagement from members around that, and then it comes back in April, if that makes sense. So it's not just we're going to go $100,000 and then that's what will work everything into that. Now, do remember, yeah, I get where you're coming from. I'm happy with mm -hmm. that, too. Um, this is to inform a draft yep. position. So it's the ink is not dry on this at mm. all. It's going to be as a starting point to go back and look at it. What does it mean? What does it mean? Like, you're Margaret, you're right, quite right. What does it mean to do a better mm. job of long-term planning public engagement? Yeah. So, I mean, in terms of just some sense of process around this, what could we have like a what could they recommend well we were trying to find a medium ground um, place well we were trying to find a way that meaningfully allowed the debate to go forward to April but so had a context around it so, so what so, would you suggest so we can bring back we can make it even simpler is that council uh, the staff bring back to a to the April meeting a number of options for improving engagement full stop and we can do that, attach resource to each of them in a budget, and we can range it up from a, a, very, a, very, a very low amount up to the maximum we've got here today. Yeah. There's very much a concern from the selected wing um, that we are getting value for money for the community, and mm. um, maybe options will be a good way of actually communicating that value for money, because we're well, going to articulate the differences. I'm happy to amend that to that, Councillor. Deputy Mayor Taylor, would sure. you be happy with a more generic? So can you change that accordingly? And that... Yep. Yeah, doesn't fence us in, mm. but it gives us the scope to really understand better what we get for the... Mm. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Is that what so you're saying? I think this is an area where there's a lot of interest in, and lots more opportunity to kind of understand what the role of, you know, this extra funding will play in things. So it's just ha having a few options then available for us all to consider would be really helpful. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, I'm happy with Right. That. So we understand... What is being proposed? If, if any other members wish, pardon, it's coming. Yeah. If any councillors feel uncomfortable with that and want to go a different direction, of course you have. You're absolutely within your rights to do so. Either vote against or propose an alternative. Those are options that are available to you. Can you see the words? So we can start an options around extending. Does that work? I think that's fine. I think that's broad enough to enable us to have another close look at this and the scale of it. People seem to be nodding, so I'm going to take that as some sort of affirmation that we're heading in the right direction. Yeah? Deputy Mayor Taylor, you happy? Okay, so now we are in debate. Let's go into debate on that. Councillor Wilson. <coughs> Thank you, uh, Your Worship. I'm, I'm pleased with um, Councillor Sarah's um, uh, suggested uh, variation and, and, and the mover and the seconder has embraced that. Um, I think what this enables staff to do from my point of view is go away and have a look in a broader sense of how best they can position the department to do what they now believe with the current environment we live in to deliver the wishes that we've sort of started to articulate. Uh, I think the error has been is that you've said, oh, this is business as usual over here, 
1.7 million a year. And if you want better engagement, we've got to spend an extra 500,000 in the first year, dropping to 370,000 going forward, a 20% increase. And if the Chief Executive is sometimes concerned about the Waikato Times questioning whether or not the current comms department uh, are the spin doctors, I think they would find this news, or the original document, uh, even more uh, concerning, because it doesn't appear, in my opinion, to actually address the issue. The issue is, is we need to review the entire department and see how you can deliver the required services now. Because when I listen to you about digital engagement, uh, a vehicle to go out to the community, they're all really positive things. I think they all make real sense, right? Um, but the real question is, um, what could we not do that we've been doing that may save us some money and create a department fit for purpose. Now, if you do your analysis and say that, in fact, no, 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 everything we do, those 18 staff, the 1.76 million a year is, is delivering on what we need, and this new desire to be more engaged with our community, we must have this additional funding, then I guess we need to have that debate because this is the early, easy steps the harder steps start when actually we have to decide which items we go ahead with and which ones we don't. Um, so don't take my critique today as being not at all supportive of the Mayor's request for additional resource to enable engagement. I just think the staff's response could have been more in depth and it could have started by saying, well, what we currently spend is that fit for purpose rather than simply saying we need to add on 20%, 500,000. So I'm supporting the motion and looking forward to seeing the depth of what you bring back to us on the 29th of April. And it should be more than just business as usual and an extra 500,000. Thank you. I was going to, wasn't going to stop your flow with a point of order, yes, but this sir. is not a mayor's request. This is an informed request for, through senior leadership team, supported by staff, senior leadership, the chief executive, that I have put into this raft of proposals. I unreservedly apologise. I, I thought it had originated from the mayoral office. No, it hasn't. And I want to be quite clear about that. None of these proposals have originated from the mayoral office. I'm sorry. So these are not my projects or my suggestions. These are informed proposals. Just want to be clear That's because cool. that could go... Right. So I blame the chief executive? No, I'm saying they're <laughs> informed by a lot of people, including Sorry. elected members' feedback at various briefings. So let's remember that we have had a couple of bites at this cake and given points of view before. Anyway, that point of order is dealt with. Councillor Forsyth. Thanks. I haven't got too much more to add, really. I think uh, Councillor Will uh, Wilson has mm. articulated the uh, points of view that I share. Um, I'm really happy that that original motion uh, has changed because I would not have supported the other. I uh, think that this gives us some time. And the important thing is the context because when we line this request up with a whole lot of other uh, items on the wish list, it'll find its place uh, and it'll be appropriately um, decided upon along with uh, everything else. Thank you. Councillor O'Leary. Yeah, thank you, um, Mayor Southgate. I realised fairly early on in the discussion um, that I would be a, a bit of an outlier because I was prepared to move the 370, not the 120, because I think that's an LTP. Um, but I'm very happy with this uh, and um, absolutely support members around the table getting more information. You know, for... Uh, Sitting around the table for a few years now, for me, the comms department feels like it's a low-hanging fruit in terms of cutting budgets. And I've seen in the last 18 months, 12 months, that significant change 
um, in what we're doing, and I want to invest in that, and I think it's worthy to invest in that. You know, during the election campaign, constantly, Pete, for the first time in my 13 years, people would come up to me and say, I went to a neighbourhood event and I spoke to so-and-so and I spoke to, to Ian and, and Roding and I, and I found this out and, and, I, um, and they called them, the or neighbourhood day was mainly the thing that people said and, and I found this and I got this free balloon and I took the kids and it was a great day and it was at every single election event that I attended, people would come up to me and say this, and we attended a lot of election events. So I've seen, I've seen the world completely change in this space. Um, I like the idea of a mobile unit, but I do uh, think that that does need to be LTP. But this, apart from elected members' Facebook pages, this is actually <laughs> the only tangible way that this, that the business that happens in this chamber and the decisions that we make are expressed to our public. And no longer are people saying to me, don't know what council does, you know, we shouldn't have elected members, you're not worth anything, um, have no idea what services you deliver. People are engaging and excited and telling me what's going on if they've been to an event that I haven't. So if you're in the business world and things are tough, you know, it's easy to let's not advertise anymore, let's not market ourselves anymore, but it's the one thing you need to invest in. And so for me, um, I'm, I'll be looking at what this uh, this list of things comes, but don't. Uh, uh, my request to staff was would be don't limit it to a small envelope, because I have seen the value, and I want to continue with that investment. Thank you, Councillor O'Leary, Councillor Gallagher. Um, I, th I think, and and how we can suddenly over lunchtime move an envelope so dramatically and quickly. I think we need to give great reflection and thought to Councillor Wilson's question and I think constructive critique. And I don't want to publicly criticise our management team, but if you had been in the Parliament Finance Expenditure Team and you and had been an opposition member and you were government officials, uh, his questioning would have been incredibly mild in comparison. And this is about us having an absolute, as elected member, lay people having an absolute understanding what exactly is the totality of, of the budget should be at the fingertips. Where are the trend lines in terms of FTE uh, equivalents uh, and all of that? So, so I think there's, this is just about improving our process. This is the budget committee. This is literally where, as we move through the process, uh, we are going to have to make some hard choices about what actually survives and what doesn't to stay within certain key uh, financial parameters. Let not this uh, proper, correct, robust Ewan Wilson type of questioning uh, detract from the fact that men most of us have a great admiration uh, for the work that is being done, and I have to tell you, I've been to neighbourhood events, particularly the one I recall in the Glen, what, what was uh, the Te Wanganga, uh, you know, the Peacocks one. I mean, that was just exceptional. That was just incredible. Went to one in Norton, and I want to say that how proud I was of our total team and their professionalism and their dedication from all walks of our, our uh, staff engagement. Love the interaction with people would write notes and write things and the 3D stuff. And I do agree that there were people who thought council was ho-hum where the lights were, were absolutely switched on. So I, I certainly do get that. I do get the importance that we don't ever fall into the trap of just... Uh, thinking that the people who are assertive, who come and speak to us, pick up the phone and lobby us, represent the broad cross-section of the community, all right? And I do get that we have to go beyond what I call the legitimate democratic pressure groups, whoever they may be, into the street level and into other forms of engagement, so, so we get that. And finally, I'm going to say that I'm so thrilled to have... 
Deputy Mayor Jeff Taylor sitting next to me, the former Deputy Editor of the Waikato Times. He will no doubt give us an incredibly incisive journalistic view as to where we should travel on this one, re-communications. Thank you. What a segue, Councillor Taylor. Wonderful. Look, I, I um, certainly support the sentiment of better community engagement, and I've said in the past uh, I'm a big fan of the Your Neighbourhood events. Uh, I think we are doing some spectacular mm -hmm. stuff there. Uh, I can support us looking again in April uh, to add some emphasis to our pre-LTP engagement. Um, I don't, doesn't necessarily mean I'll support it then, but I'll, I'm keen for it to come back then. I'll need to have a few questions I have answered first. Um, the original proposal we got today was a, a significant amount of money, and it really felt more to me like an LTP discussion than an annual plan discussion. I think that's part of the resistance it got. I understand the reasons you brought it back, because there'd been requests. Um, I felt uneasy too, because right now, um, I, and this is just a personal view from a ex -juno. I'm not overly satisfied with our whole communication strategy at times, um, and I'm not going to support putting significant funding into it until there's been one or two issues addressed. Um, we're doing engagement, great. We can do it better, sure, but we're doing, I think we're doing really well. I think some of our comms at times I'm just not so sure about. I think we are a richer organisation, uh, and our comms with the public is richer, uh, when we work together, both elected members and the organisation. Uh, there's been the odd time uh, over the last couple of years where I've thought that we're a little disjointed at times and the organisation is sailing down this direction and elected members are here. And I don't, I, I, I don't think it's deliberate. Um, it may be a structural. It, it may just be the way the organisation has evolved in the last few terms. Um, I think that times is a degree of silo mentality and I think the message that we put out to the public, to the residents, to the ratepayers, is a lot better if we are including elected members and the organisation as a whole, and, and we are focusing it that way. Um, it may not take a lot to address, uh, but until it is addressed, I'm not pre prepared to support a large um, figure. So I will uh, look to see what we get in April and hope that some of my concerns are addressed. But again, let me say, uh, please don't take this personally. Um, I just think uh, my view is that there are some issues that we can uh, address, which will make us a better organisation in the terms of the way in, in terms of the way we communicate. Thank you, Councillor Van Oosten. Uh, thanks, Mayor Paula. Um, uh, I'll um, be supporting the motion, um, primarily because I think that options are really important, and it's critical that we have the opportunity to explore um, all of what those options might be before we make our um, decisions on spending um, ratepayer money. Um, I think asking our community and giving them a voice is also um, a really critical part um, in making council um, relevant to them. And I've got no doubt that it can and will uh, have an impact on civic education, um, civic engagement and participation. Um, and I look forward to the up um, uh, scope on that. Um, getting out of the building um, and getting into the community is nothing new to elected members. Um, uh, and I've seen some change in um, the behaviours of our, um, our council staff and with that engagement. And, that makes me really happy. And I want to see that become our usual business. Um, by simply layering more and more on our existing staff in the department, um, it's doable for the short term, but it's just not sustainable without having budget to support it and other dedicated staff to ensure that it happens. Um, and that's what I worry about. Um, uh, there's argument to be had for money being put into uh, the now um, and into the future, into that 10-year plan. Um, I'm really looking forward to further debate 
and, um, and exploring what those options might be. Um, I know that we've got a department now um, in our comms that look after not just their Facebook page, but all parts of council. And I think um, it, you know, putting more work on them uh, on the limited uh, numbers that they have already and also the workload that they carry um, is unreasonable. Thanks. Thank you. Councillor Thompson. I firstly just want to acknowledge um, Councillor, Councillor Angela's words. I thought um, you know, she made a really good point that we have seen some great engagement uh, from Council and Natalie's doing a fantastic job in helping to lead that, so thank you. Um, I'm really encouraged by the refocus from our comms to actually what's genuine engagement with our community um, and so really keen to see that continue to progress um, and I think that you know when we do look at things like our turnout at our elections I don't know how many doors I knocked on on certain streets and people were like, uh, first they didn't know the election was on or they just didn't know what council <coughs> did so they didn't know why it mattered. And that's not fixed in a few months before an election. That is something that we have to work on um, in the long term and it's a continual kind of engagement that will help people to understand the importance um, of those elections. So, in, and same thing, you know, Community engagement is going to be so critical when we want to do stuff which is different, you know, which isn't business as usual of what council's been doing for the last however many decades, you know, however many years. So um, I just, yeah, I want to emphasise how important that community engagement is. Um, and also I think it's clear that, you know, we've been doing better but it's not necessarily sustainable. You know, Natalie's been pulling money from here and there, dropping, stopping some things to be able to do the Your Neighbourhood events that we keep talking about and things, but <coughs> are we going to be able to keep doing that in the long term? We need to really, you know, be asking that. Um, and also, just to remember, this is not just one department. They're doing work which spreads across 27 departments in our... Uh, organisations, so, um, and that's going to support all of our ambitions um, going forward over the next two and a half years, and then hopefully uh, longer for many of us. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> so I'm just. Election, no. <laughs> so really, I think it's an age statement. <laughs> no, no, no comment on age. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not go back to Inauguration Day. Um, so <laughs> really, this is just a comment to say that I'm keen to see options on that genuine community engagement, understanding that some of this may be a long-term plan conversation, but... Um, that this is an important area, so let's have some opportunity for engagement before the next meeting as well. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll, I'll speak to it now. Look, you know, it's no secret that I'm um, a fan of better public engagement. I've been saying that for some time, that we need to reach more people in more ways. And I'm not going to apologise for that. But I know that I'm not an, a lone voice in that because I've heard the criticism from other people as well. I've heard the pleas for doing things fundamentally different. I do believe the comms um, team and, and engagement team, because it's not just about communications, it's about public engagement across the organisation, they do a great job. And I'm not going to reiterate all the comments around your neighbourhood events, but just to support those. We can't rely on the same old crusty, dry ways of engaging with the community. They don't go far enough. They just don't. Digital engagement, which is one of the issues here, is very important given that we have the youngest population in New Zealand with a median age of 32 years. And they're not interested in four sheets of white paper with preformed <laughs> questions. That's not how they engage with the world. And if we want to hear from the young, we need to do something fundamentally different to engage the young. But then I looked at some of the other bullet points and I thought there are other communities uh, Natalie alluded to the Chinese community, which takes an amount of translation. But we're leaving some other communities behind. 
We've done some work, but we haven't got enough resource to reach out as often as we should to our hearing impaired community, to our sight impaired community, and very many others as well. So I do believe in looking at new and exciting modern ways, using all the technology that's available to reach as many people as practical. And we just can't expect people, though we were very lucky today, we had six in the public forum, and I really appreciate their time, because all of those people work and they have to give up their time. But we can't expect them to come to our place in our time to talk to us. We have to go out to them, let's be real. So um, I'm pleased that we're able to have another look at this. Given that we've got the rollout of our new waste bins in less than a month, a month and a half, which public are going to have to know about because it's so new to them. They're going to have to understand what they do with these four new bins. And we've been working really hard on that, and that must continue. We know that the public get very disengaged with us when they don't understand why our river slips on our path, river paths are not being repaired. So I can think of a myriad of reasons why we need to be the best in business at engaging with our community. That's where I'd like us to see us headed. I agree that some elements of this particular proposal are probably best sitting in the LTP, but we can't leave everything to the LTP because we need to do a better job about the actual LTP. So we need to start talking with people now. So I'm happy with this recommendation as a way forward. And we'll go to the vote. <clears throat> The motion is carried unanimously. Gosh, that was a lot of work, wasn't it? <laughs> oh, we're going to very quickly race into Enderley uh, discussion because um, we have some councillors here who are very interested in that. Which is um, attachment eight. I'll come back to the natural areas after that. So, <clears throat> I can't speak to this in much detail because I've had very little oversight of this until recently. Yeah. Helen. Good afternoon, councillors. Uh, this proposal was a response to um, some of your earlier discussions around uh, Enderley community and specifically the community centre there, but obviously the community centre is one part of the wider community. Um, and the initial discussions focused on potential upgrade to the community centre. Uh, what this proposal uh, or this business case is proposing uh, is uh, a, a, a bit of a segue into any upgrade. So it's a bit of investment to um, potentially save money, I guess. Um, you could look at it one way. Um, so before, uh, the, the idea is that before putting any money into upgrade, we need to really work with that community to understand what their needs are and also to understand what the options are for that building. It is a really underlized, uh, underutilized building currently. It hasn't had a lot of investment over the years. Um, and it isn't fit for purpose. De Papa Nui, you would have heard from this morning, are doing a fantastic job of building their own capability. They currently don't receive any funding from council, so they're a group that are uh, relatively self-initiated. Um, they've, um, yeah, they've, they've drawn on their um, membership from within that community and um, have a real commitment um, with what they're doing. So they are obviously keen to work with council to look at how we can um, better build the wellbeing of that community. And the community centre is um, a part of that picture. The $60,000 is to um, support some community-led development and also to investigate options for the community centre. And we'd want to do that in conjunction with some potential partners, so Tarunanga, Waikato Taina. We were still, were still in the early stages of those discussions. In fact, we're still to reach out to some of those organisations, but they'd be key players in this as well. OK. Councillor Taylor. Okay. Um, so yeah, I'm just so uh, I'm just trying to get my head around it. So so this is this money is for engagement. It's it sounds like it's for finding out what's going on there. It's for community that's led the way development. It was this morning. Yeah, yeah. So oh, that's the way, so the Papua Nui um, very much talked about it from their point of view in terms of how they'd like to be involved in the um, 
in the engagement side of it, so that community-led development. But the money is, is, is one to support um, some of that community-led development, so that's um, some of the yeah, some of the engagement that we talked about, but very much that that would be led with partners like to Papua Nui, but that money is also to look at options for the community okay. centre itself. All right. So it says in the second paragraph of the business case on page 74, it says mm. um, the proposal is to undertake engagement uh, with the community on options for the centre and to gain a better understanding of community aspirations. So I'm just wondering, do we not have community development people out in the community who must have some idea about this already? Uh, why do we have to start afresh and spend 60 k Do we not have people out there to, oh, yeah, we who, could, who, um, who we, are involved with the community? Yeah, we do have people that are involved with the community. What we don't have is we haven't done any real focus on the community centre. We've had, um, I guess, our direction in the past is to maintain it at you know current levels. It's not a fit-for-purpose community centre currently. So um, if we were going to investigate options, we'd need to do some more detailed work around that. We could make... Yeah, we could draw on the information that our um, current advisors have, but I think it's really important if we were going to invest any money into a building, that there should be um, that that should that that the op that those options need to be investigated in detail and you know with the community and in fact led by the community with our support. Okay. Yeah. So that some of that funding would be for that investigation work and right. sketching and costing up so that by the time we got to the 10-year plan, you had those options in front of you, what what th what any upgrades would cost and the options around those upgrades and who any potential partners should be and the timing of it. So it would be that we wouldn't be going into the 10-year plan with no, in no good information. Mm, okay. Rather, we'd, we'd going into the 10-year plan with good information for you to make your decisions on. It just feels like there's an element of it being at cross purposes because the message I seemed to get from them this morning was, "Don't worry about the building. Don't. We don't want it for the building." So yeah, uh, yeah, there was. Um, so that so that was something that any. I mean, there were two groups that yeah. pitched this morning. So I guess. Um, yeah, I, so there's always going to be multiple views in any com community. What you've got there is a communi community, and I often don't like to be the one um, talking about a community in this way, but there is, a, is really high deprivation in that community. There are also a lot of strengths and resources in that community, and Annie is obviously you know, a part of that picture, right. um, along with Papua Nui. Um, but they are an under-resourced community with you know, high deprivation, sure, sure, obviously. Sure. So... Um, Okay. Yeah. All right, thanks. Just to help with that, there's, there's also other parts of the community as well. We heard from two groups this morning, yes. and I know yep. that Councillor Mark and Councillor Keish have been talking to a number of mm. groups there as well. Um, so it's about talking to all of those groups, and, and probably, uh, probably where, where we are in the picture is um, around facilitating that community-led development, but also we own the asset, so it is about when we identify what are the issues or what are the opportunities within that community, then we've actually got some money to actually um, cost up those options, and then we can bring those back to you and the LTP, and council can make a decision from there whether okay. you want to invest further. Okay. Well, and I, I and mean, some I of those options might be that we do, as Annie said, that we do that we do wait, but it might also say that there's a need for it earlier. So that's what we'd be. That's the information okay. we'd be able to I, give I you. I think my, yeah. my concern, it's, it just feels like this should be business as usual, to me. This okay. feels to me like something we should be doing okay, all the time, question or? without having to put a budget next to it. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Forsyth. Thank you. Thanks, Ellen. Uh, just a couple of questions around um, uh, a bit of history and context, really. Mm. I, I'm making an assumption, but can you just remind me why Enderley has been... I think you've already answered it, but why Enderley has been selected as as the community centre for support, given that we have a number in the city? Um, uh, one, it was, so this is a response to the discussions that have been had around this table. I think also um, someone alluded to it this morning around, in the past it's been a community centre that has been staffed by council staff. Um, in 2012, or just after, you know, the, we, we took those, you know, we removed staff from that area. So they're really in that um, stage of capacity building currently. Um, to Papua Nui have huge potential. Your question around Western Community Centre, um, you know, they are in that process of building 
you know, building their capability, that does mm. take time yeah. um, and it does, and uh, capability does, you know, capability building does sometimes take some additional resources. So a community needs to be resourced to be able to build, yeah. Yeah, and I remember those times yeah. when um, the community centre at Enderley was quite active. I think it was called the Com uh, Community Computer Clubhouse or something similar. Yeah, but the model correct. then, and I suspect it still is, was that staff or council would come in and support and grow yep. capability, but then it, then it would get to a point where we'd step back and allow the community to basically... Um, manage and run themselves, and that, that's where it, that's the point I believe that Enderley got to. But then over time, it's deteriorated to the point now where we're it's ready to yeah. be picked up again. So that might provide a bit of context for you as well. Yeah, Depending it also um, many of our other community centres do receive some council funding through our multi-year yes. funding, whereas um, to Papua New because they're in those early stages, okay. um, have not Thank yet you. come cool. through. For that. And look, I'm really glad that you um, pointed out that Tainui has been approached because I see we will be we're, a, we're well, working we'll be. through those processes and yep. um, the Runanga as well, etc. Because this is a, I mean we have a partnership with mm -hmm. Tainui, and I, I see it as a, a two-way partnership Absolutely. so uh, when that engagement has taken place it would be um, I'd be really interested I'm sure other members would be as well just to see what the nature of that partnership looks like and um, yeah what yeah. sort of support they're willing to to um, come up with as well thanks can I also just clarify so a lot of the work that we are doing with Enderley is business for usual, like we have been uh, working with the community groups there around, you know, how to become a legal entity, um, working with community Waikato around their strategic planning. So that BAU support has been and will continue to happen. Mm -hmm. This is this funding that we're seeking is more around doing detailed inve investigation, particularly of our uh, of the community centre and the surrounds. Okay. Yep. Even more so for that partnership. Yep. Yeah. Councillor Wilson. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mayor Paula. Helen, I wonder, I wonder if you could help me get a better clarity, mm. turning our mind back to 2012, and just remind the Chamber of um, the staff that we had out in Enderley, mm. and why was it cut? So at that time in 2012, we were making reductions in budget um, <coughs> and that was one of the areas so we did re reduce our community development the size of the team. Yep. So somewhat what I wouldn't want to put words in your mouth mm. but have the chickens come home to roost? We've been talking a lot about engagement mm. with the community mm. and back in 2012 we cut community workers in the most vulnerable suburb of the city uh, and here we are now in 2019 oh, sorry 2020 um, and we seem to have to be going back to start again um, I, I would I, I think there's some real opportunities here I do think the most successful models are community-led models so my recommendation would not be that we would go back to putting staff into that area. We, the areas that are, are, are most successful are where the community drive their own outcomes. And I think there's an opportunity here with Te Papa Nui um, and some of those other community leaders to really, um, for them to really take a, a lead. However, what we do know is that uh, communities do need to be resourced appropriately. So I don't think it's so much the chickens coming home to roost. I think that it's a timing thing. I think that um, in some ways, by our not having a presence in there, the community's been able to to rally a bit, and now now and now they and now that some of the needs have become clearer, and we've got an opportunity to provide support in the appropriate way. Just a further question, but. Yep. <coughs> I'm sorry, I don't get the mm. same clarity as you're expressing. The two presentations this morning, mm. I had no clarity about what they wanted. <laughs> I had no clarity about what ideas they had. Mm. Um, if anything, um, I felt their presence. I was pleased mm. they were there. But um, 
I'm as lost now as I was before. Mm. So I'm, I'm wondering if you could tell me where you see this clarity being driven from the community, because it I, wasn't uh, here today. Yeah, I think because what you're hearing is multiple <coughs> needs. So what they're addressing is our proposal that was a response to the need to, 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 to fo uh, focus need on the community at centre itself. Part of what you're hearing is that, that wider need for building up the community resilience. So when I say that they've kind of rallied, what I'm saying is there's now a group of people in Enderley who have come together to support that wider community. So to Papa Nui is a trust. So they're a group of people who have gone, actually, we want to provide some support. Our, our community needs help, and we want to provide that support. Right. So final question, yep. what will the $60,000, which yep. I am very happy to support. Yep. After all, there's a lot of talk about the need to engage with our community, yep. and we're happy to consider other much larger quantums. Yep. Um, but what will it deliver us? It will deliver us. So it will deliver us a couple of things. One, it will deliver us the ability to work with Te Papa Nui and other partners to look at what the specific needs, so getting some clarity that you've talked about today. So we know that there are issues that need it, and we know there are issues and opportunities in the area, but being really clear about what those are and how they need to be supported to happen. We'll also have some detailed op investigative options for the community centre there. Do we upgrade or don't we? If we do, what does that look like? What does the community do need? And how much will it cost? And how much money do you need to be put, uh, put into the LTP for that, if any? Thank you. And who will be involved in it? Yeah. Finish, Ewan? Yeah, thanks. Councillor Thompson? Oh, yes. Um, my question was more just kind of technical, logistical. So the 60000 does that go towards, say, like a part-time role? Or where does that exactly go to, just in yeah. terms of no, resourcing I, that extra time yeah, that goes uh, into this? Most of, most of that 60 So some of it is around collateral, which is, um, you know, if we're doing... Um, so we'd possibly do some, like, workshops with the community, um, so often you need collateral, but our staff would be along with members of the community, so that's us partnering with the community and, and agencies, and we, those are things that we'd like to invite you to be part of, so workshops with the with community and, and community leaders. Um, but the majority of it would be on actually getting some potential um, uh, like options, like uh, concept plans right. and, um, and <laughs> costing costings, yeah. Okay, so actually it would be, you know, for example, if you're then looking at, okay, we think these improvements need to be made yep. to the centre, then yep. it's actually going to an architect or to a design or something like yeah, that. Yeah, probably, getting, um, for, that, for that level of, there'd probably be um, kind of uh, concept, at, at concept level, so yep. not detailed design, more, Q, yeah, not QS, but concept. Okay, so it wouldn't, so it wouldn't be QS, you wouldn't be able to kind of, at the stage we would have like a this is a high confidence no. kind of yeah that's costume. right we do that once we had the um the final option and approval in the 10-year plan to move forward yeah okay Ooh. okay i've Thank got you. a couple of questions and then i know you do mark and i want to hear from you so as well um in in respect to this um i'm i heard heard in the um, public presentation uh, public forum this morning that there is some sort of interconnect with Fairfield but I don't really understand how that works because I'm, I'm very aware that the Fairfield Te Whare Teata, which is in an old house and the Fairfield Hall which is well loved and used but, but just not in a good condition is also a big problem so what I don't see here I see a lot of reference to Enderley and a little bit of reference to Enderley Fairfield but not a total understanding about how all that comes together. <coughs> and um, I would like to hear from you and, and also uh, Mark and Kesh, you've been in the community to get some <coughs> oversight about what's, what that's... Because, I, look, I have strong sympathy for our most um, hard-up communities, really. I mean, look, that deprivation index speaks for itself. But that's not just Enderley, that's Fairfield as well. Yes. And that's Melville and other places. Um, so I do feel for that, and I do want to do something, but I just don't see how it's coming together. So help me through this. How is this small amount of money here relative to what we've been discussing already today? How is this going to actually practically help 
Enderley and Fairfield now as opposed to doing something in the long-term plan that's more transformational? Can I understand that? Yeah, so um, because a lot of our work will be, um, you know, what you've called BAU, so we, um, so that's that reference to, to Fairfield. We uh, intend to, prior to the 10-year plan, uh, be and doing a lot of engagement um, with all of our communities. Um, so if we're looking at Enderley, we can't look at Enderley and the community centre there without understanding that, that wider that wider need, including in Fairfield. Mm. Um, what this will do ahead of the 10-year plan, what this will do is give us more detailed understanding of what those needs are prior to the 10-year plan so that we can make informed proposals to the 10-year plan. Is that, does that answer your question? I'm not quite sure. So, so this money will help us draw all those strands together so that we can make a meaningful investment in the long-term plan. Is that what you're saying? In both, community, yeah. in both communities? Uh, yeah. Pulling those strands to... together we'd be doing anyway within BAU. So be Fairfield won't be left behind? On no. No, that. because that's, we'd intended to do that as well right. within our normal work. Yeah. So, and then just following on with, with what Ewan's questions, I'm still... Uncertain about what this looks like. Um, we've heard from a couple of community members who do great work, great work, and I, uh, I want to help and support that. But I don't understand. I haven't been across this to understand what it looks like. What what's the actual practical tasks that the is hap happening with that sixty thousand? So it? we've so we're facilitating to get clarity that um, Helen explained before, and we will be bringing back then um, what role can the Enderley Community Centre, the asset that we own, play in meeting the aspirations of the community. So those are really the two key things, outcomes from this. And then that will give guidance to councillors and give you um, adequate information to make investment decisions going forward if you so choose. And I say investment, it, um, it probably just wouldn't be council, it would be looking at yeah. partnerships and that sort of thing too. Yeah. Yeah, because I've always expressed, and I want to know if this is part of the work that I think Western Community Centre is an exemplar from a community house mm, perspective. But I do remember when it was just bricks, a brick house, mm. and it, that's, Dave knows more about it than I ever will. Um, so I'm wondering how this is the seed for that to happen in Fairfield. And would this necessarily include if there was to be any amalgamation of services across? Fairfield Enderley, or are we still seeing them as distinct communities? No, I think that's part of what we are continuing to look at. So there is a group called Fern. We are trying to work, look at oh, a called Fern, which is oh. just a group that meet, looking at how yep. that those two communities can work better together. Yeah, this funding really is about getting a lot more clarity on what you're talking about. I guess I'd be reluctant to make any recommendations for upgrades to that building without looking at options. And so this is about looking at those options. Yeah. Can I, am I, is it all right to ask a question of, of uh, Mark and Cash and getting? Um, what we've discovered, Mayor Paula, is as we go along, Te Papanui, by definition, is, is geographically Enderley and Fairfield um, anyway, that whole suburb. Mm -hmm. One of the questions we asked them, should we rename the whole suburbs? What we're discovering with those groups is that, as you saw with the public submissions, is you've got very strong and very passionate people doing a very great job but not necessarily together, um, and we are trying to explore what to do you know, that is best serves all of those groups without destroying what they're trying to do. So we could go in with a lick of paint and do up the hall and beat our chest and say, look, we're fixed Enderley, but we think it's going to require a whole lot more than that. That's, that's what we're <coughs> trying to find out. So to us, it's one thing to ask a lot of questions, which we're doing, but it's how do we compile that information and do the very best thing with it for the long-term plan? So we're trying to really sharpen up what we can bring to council uh, for the long-term plan, and this is to really exact that great information that we're finding out there. But the more we're learning, the more we're learning that we don't know. Mm. And we, if we didn't have this money in the budget, just to pay devil's advocate for this, does that mean staff have no resources to work on Enderley? Um, they'll still be working on Enderley as far as I can see, and they're, they're doing a fantastic job, but this is an area of particular need. Um, okay. And so we can ask the questions for the money we've got, we just can't do anything with the answers. Okay. <laughs> So did you, you were on the list, do you have a question as well? No, I was just happy to move it, thank you. Okay, and I'll second. So we've got it moved by, 
Mark and seconded by uh, Kesh. Um, any other questions or are we going to go into debate? Into debate it is then. Debate, anyone? Councillor McPherson. Oh, yeah, sorry. That's, yeah, he did. And he's, and he's essentially the mover as well. So off you go, Mark. Very much what I've actually just said. Thank you. Um, uh, Kesh and I, um, early in our term in, as, as uh, Chair and Deputy of Community, realised that there is a, there is a need in uh, Endley, as you've seen here. There's some very, very, very brilliant people there. But we've, we've taken upon ourselves, as have the staff, to go out and ask some questions because we thought, gee, wouldn't it be nice just to put a new playground in there or, or zhuzh up the hall or do something. Those are the obvious things for councils to do. But it's not really <coughs> community-led. Um, and our desire is for those very strong people to be enabled uh, to do something really effective within their community. I think Annie put it really, really well when she said, um, we don't like you just throwing the money around. You need to throw it at the right places. And that's what this exercise is about, is finding where to best put that money. So as Helen said just before, um, we're kind of spending money to save money when it comes to the long-term plan. Um, yes, it will probably involve something to do with the community hall, but who's going to run it, we don't know. Like, for example, we had a really great, uh, great chat with Te Papa Nui, um, and they said, look, we're really keen to run the hall, but we're not quite resilient enough yet. And that, that showed me a lot of maturity as a group. You know, they may just need some help on the resilience. Maybe that will be the, the way to do it. Um, they say it's important to speak in a way that people want to listen to you, but it's also important to listen in a way that people want to speak, and that's really what this is about. It's about um, we can ask the questions for free, but it's just we're going to need a bit of resource as a staff to do something really smart with those answers that we get. Thank you. Councillor McPherson. Thank you. Um, look, the discussions and questions that I've heard here today demonstrate to me the difficulty we have in getting community development, uh, the desire for something tangible that you can measure and count uh, is much uh, that doesn't really apply to community development, in my opinion. What uh, people who want answers to that questions, I'd advise them to do is go and spend a day in the reception area at, say, the Western Community Centre and see what comes, the eclectic mix of things that come across the desk there or come in through the door. Um, and not just them, other, the other ones, that just happens to be the bigger one um, that's probably the only community centre that's purpose-built in the in the area and that makes it easier for them to run purposeful uh, activities there than in some of the houses and halls and sports centres and all sorts of bits and pieces that community centres are operating at now. Um, if I was given 60000 for what they call now community-led development, as opposed, it's the latest buzzword rather than community development. Um, I must get Helen to explain that to me sometime. I would actually spend it on on services uh, support and, and the people who provide them, which was one of the answers given there. Not so much on the bricks and mortar, because you, you can make do with that, and they nearly always have to in the community to make do with that. But it's handy at the same time to identify what the ideal situation would be and to perhaps then build cases for that, which may not all happen at once. But we really need the people to provide that sort of link service between the community and the council, between that community and other communities. Uh, looking at the Fairfield Enderley situation, it's a double suburb, just like we've got in with Melville and Glenview down south. Um, I'd like um, our community development people to be working alongside um, the, the work that's being done there, not to, um, not to leave it to this new $60,000 job over here, because it's, it's got, and I understand that is going to happen, maybe it wasn't articulated fully, but that's important that it's also business as usual. Um, Ewan was quite right in using the term chickens coming home to roost. I know Helen didn't um, quite accept that, but the Council of 2012, bless its cotton socks, did dump a whole lot of community development um, support at that time, uh, not just in this area, but in terms of grants to community groups, all sorts of things, which um, you know, me and Paula, you know, we had trouble resurrecting over the last three years. So I'm glad to see we're treating this seriously, but I, but I also seriously suggest go and immerse yourself 
in one of these organisations and you'll get a better flavour of what happens there. Um, I think that we've made mistakes in the past by being too paternalistic at Enderley itself. We had council staff doing everything, so the community let them do everything. At other places, we had the community wanting to do things and demanding resources from council, and that ended up in a much more sustainable situation than we've got now. But I do see agreement that that's where we need to head, head in Enderley now, so I'm going to support the 60,000. I'm not going to be like the people who've caught um, novel Gallagher virus and say they don't guarantee the support the next time coming round. I'm going to support this now and when it comes back. Full stop. Councillor Thompson. I, I liked the words immerse yourself um, in one of these community centres, thinking of the community law centre that I was at for a couple of years. You certainly um, learn a lot more about people's lives and the troubles and things that they face when you see them day to day, face to face. And so, uh, community um, development team and the people in Enderley and Fairfield are going to be the ones that can really um, understand and help us figure out what uh, the right investment will be. Um, I'm going to support this. Um, I think that I'd like to see a little bit more clarity um, before the next, before April, just in terms of um, some of the logistics around this and w a little bit more clarity around what the pro our process is looking like because I totally understand you know we need to come in with an exploratory approach and say we're not going to assume what the right answers are right now and I think it's okay that these groups don't know exactly what they want either they want better outcomes for the community that's enough at this stage we can help them on that journey too but just knowing what the sixty thousand dollars is kind of Four would I think would just be helpful for all members to have some more clarity on that. Um, yeah, and I I just want to acknowledge the work that Mark and Kesh have been doing in this area. We can't all be on top of everything. We've got our own portfolios, and so uh, to some extent we've got to say, you know, you guys get on with this and come back with some of these answers, um, and then we can support that. So, yeah. I will be in support of this today. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Naiduro. Oops, where did it go? Thank you. Um, I'll just repeat something that I heard this morning. Annie said, uh, it's not about the building, it's about the people, and it's about the well-being of the community. And something that Era said was that, which we all know, Waikato Plan, classified Enderley as the second most deprived area in New Zealand. Like, you know, just think about that for a moment. Um, for want of a better word, um, I think that it would be very irresponsible for us to overlook this community. We know how much need there is. Throughout my um, election campaign, I spoke about uh, improving and uplifting communities. Um, because I'm sure we can all understand um, the benefits and the impacts a flourishing community can have on its members, especially the youth, and um, the overall joy and sense of belonging it can bring. Um, the big question is how? How can this be achieved? Um, how do we facilitate this process so that we can create a vibrant, sustainable community center? And uh, the answer, is by giving the community the ownership of this project, by engaging, by discussing, and just by listening to what um, the needs and the aspirations are. Um, a community, a true community-led project. Um, I'm sure most of us have been to um, the very successful Western Community Center, and now imagine something like that, similar to that on the east. Um, Personally, I live in Enderley. I've lived there for 10 years. And um, the signs of deprivation in this area, it hits you in the face every day. Um, <clears throat> and as a council, I think we can do our part to help this community, um, to help them heal and to help them grow. Um, <clears throat> you know, we aim to meet the needs of um, well-being of our residents. And um, this is our opportunity to start that work. 
um, for one of our most deprived neighborhoods in Hamilton. So, as, And I remind everyone that as a city, we are only as strong as our weakest. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Councillor Gallagher. So I'll certainly be uh, uh, supporting this, and I'm not at all provoked by my colleague's outrageous <laughs> accusation. Um, but this obviously goes, uh, you know, if we're looking at deprivation, goes way beyond this quantum, obviously. Uh, if you actually, for example, take an example, if you look at the role of libraries in the new age, uh, Enderley and Norton are outside the concentric rings in terms of distance to those facilities. So this is going to be about in your LTP, is what else are you doing for these areas? Uh, believe it or not, folks, uh, quality footpaths for, and roads for multimodal transport is really critical. What is your interaction with the schools in the area? Are there any schools in that area that fence themselves away from their local communities? Uh, what is the access to green space? What is the, the quality of design that you're allowing through your district plan in terms of the accommodation? So there are all these building blocks that you as local government are right across and, and accountable uh, for. And even, you know, the issue of the difficulty of getting across from one side of the road and to another so that kids can go and enjoy a green space or a playground, all of that. So totally support that. But in terms of our community development focus and, and very inspiring contribution uh, by Kesh, absolutely. Uh, but in terms of all the other tools we can exercise, uh, street lighting, you name it, uh, we, we have got to ensure that we give this particular community, obviously parts of Melville, parts of Norton, Corshaw, uh, very focused attention in our LTP. Councillor Taylor. Thank you, uh, Mayor Southgate. Look, I just want to offer an apology in advance. I, um, I don't seem to be having a good day. I, um, I went to bed. Maybe that, yeah. I, I went to bed last night. I went to bed last night feeling fine, but I think I've woken up as Gary Mallet <laughs> because I just seem to be. Can we have him tested, please? <laughs> I just seem to be seeing things through a strange lens today. Um, I. The 6 to co we're not actually even providing any services here. This, this is basically for a conversation, and it seems to me a hell of an expensive conversation. Um, since when does it cost 60 k to have a conversation with the community and write a report for the Community Services Committee? We do that all the time, as business as usual. All the time, all through the three years, you'll get staff coming to the Community Services Committee with a report. I, suddenly, it's cost 60 k for it, and I just feel like there's almost, it feels ad hoc, and it feels like there's almost an element of opportunism about the timing. I cannot see why this is not business as usual. This is what we should be doing business as usual. We shouldn't have to put a price tag on it every time this happens. So I, I think we're lovely speeches. Uh, we're being enormously generous and ad hoc with other people's money, as Gary would say, damn. But um, I'm sorry, I, I, I'm, not, I'm just not going to support this um, on this occasion. Hopefully things will improve. Thank you. Just to, just to say a few words myself, I probably do want to see this go forward, but I'm flagging the concerns that I raised in my questions, which is I need just a little, little bit more understanding how all these threads come together. But um, I actually have been um, persuaded by some of the um, good arguments that my colleagues have um, have given in their remarks. And I do remember that um, you know when I was Chair of Community Services lamenting uh, how some areas of our, com our community were doing so much better than others. But when we think back to the Western Community Centre, it had a rough start too, and it really needed some resources to get to be the exemplary community centre that it is today. Um, I, I do look forward to the day when all of our community centres, whether they're Western Community, Hamilton East, Enderley, Melville, are all high, fun high functioning hubs of the community where community can lead their own wellbeing. That's what I look, that's my utopia, I suppose, um, but we've got to take some reasonable steps in that direction. Um, I do have some questions though, they came up during the question time of this and when it comes up again in April, 
I'll be looking to understand better what this is getting us. And, and as I say, the interconnection, not just with Enderley, but Fairfield as well. So, okay, Councillor Bunting. I, um, I, I fully sympathise with, um, with my dear friend Jeff. It must have been awful waking up in that state this morning. Um, oh. um, but, but look, we have been doing business as usual, and I mean this with the greatest respect, but our business as usual isn't working. Um, you know, as, as um, Councillor Kesh pointed out, we've, we've reached the lofty heights of second worst um, area in the country, second most deprived area in the country. Uh, our business as usual isn't working. We need, to, uh, we need to put a repair in place. We need to make sure we put the right repair in place. That's the issue. We can't just um, throw money at stuff, as councils are often seen to do. Well, I think this is a really prudent approach, and I agree it needs more clarity in, in, in when it comes back in April. But it's a more prudent approach to what we are going to be doing when the real rubber hits the road around the long-term plan time. Um, and sadly, our business, as usual, hasn't quite met the mark this time. That's fine. It's, it's a sign of a mature council um, that's, that says, hey, we're doing something slightly wrong. We need to fix it. Look, this 60 grand isn't there to buy sandwiches for every resident. Okay? This 60 grand is to sharpen the way we do stuff. So, um, look, I, I thank members for their support. Uh, in advance, and by the time April comes around, we'll have a much clearer picture. And uh, Mayor Paula, we will be asking those questions about including Fairfield because it's not just the Enderley Community Hall, so we need to get our head out of that space. It's a big area um, which requires a big effort, and we're putting it in. So thank you. Let's go to the vote. The motion is carried, 12-4, one against. What is it? Enderley. Okay, councillors, we're going to go and do the That's natural areas. <laughs> then we might have a quick stretch, but we'll go till about no later than half past three. I don't think that hopefully this one won't take quite that long. Uh, so we'll go to attachment seven, natural areas. Um, I won't, I'm, I won't speak to this one either because although, you know, it's, there again, it's no secret that I've been a proponent for a number of years, at least six, of um, restoring some more resource into the gully restoration. <laughs> um, I didn't propose this one. It came from other members and I'd love to hear um, more about the business case and your questions. So, Maria. Um, so I'd just like to introduce this item um, by, I guess, saying that most of you will be aware we have started the development of a nature in the city strategy. This proposal is not designed to fix all of the issues that we have um, in the space, but it is designed to assist um, with some operational budget to assist those community groups who have been with us um, restoring a lot of our gully networks. A lot of them have been raising external funding on behalf of council that has contributed to some really good outcomes in that spaces and just actually supporting the work that they do. So I guess I'll leave it there and um, open to questions. Discussion, questions? Questions, I mean, before discussion. There are no oh, questions? Sorry, I just have one quick question. Um, I was just concerned we are forgoing um, the Lama walkthrough um, and we're reallocating that to another visitor's, uh, visitor attraction. Oh, you're talking about the zoo? We're yeah, talking sorry. No, we're sorry. <laughs> you're ahead of yourself. <laughs> so I was out of touch, so I spoke to my good colleague <laughs> just <laughs> to where we... Oh, she set you up. <laughs> we're... Sorry, no, we, we're back. <laughs> yeah, the needs a break. Yeah. We're going to have a coffee break shortly, but no, we're not talking about llamas. Not this time. <laughs> so are there any questions? The llamas <laughs> <laughs> OK, councillors. Uh, we'll uh, go to a question on the natural area. <laughs> Councillor Gallagher. Just an uh, impact of issue on community. Um, the... Is that that's not the including the Rotary of Fairfield, which is which are these groups? Because um, I mean, obviously, I'm what the, the point of the question is to tease out the actual return that we get as a community for, for the yep. for what are this incredible work 
all those groups too. Um, yes, so we have um, ring fenced the proposal to impact on the Manganoa stream care group, the Mangako Tukutuku stream care group, so that's in Sanford Park and in, um, on the way in to Hamilton on the side of Morrinsville Road is that section. Manga Iti Gali Care Group, which you heard Rex speak on behalf of the combined. Um, Tui 2000 Waifakariki, AJ Seely and Rezi. So we didn't include the Fairfield project. Predominantly their work at this point in time is not on council land. It's not saying that their work is not important. And, yeah. we, and we did indicate yesterday that we will need to, through the development of the nature and the city strategy, broaden our horizons um, in that space. Um, but this proposal is focused on operational money that will help us look after what we currently have. So this is council land? It is council land, yes. Okay. So, but basically, I guess, second question is, within those groups, yep. there is considerable and exceptional um, academic and scientific and community expertise. Is that correct? Absolutely. Um, Waifakariki on its own, um, the group there have brought in a million dollars plus in external funding. We're roughly um, around a million dollars if you equate the volunteer labour that's gone into that place and, and, you know, so there's significant returns coming into the city because of those groups' efforts. Thank you. One question that I have, because I was um, discussing this with Sarah and others the other day, saying if this had not come to an annual plan proposal, which is where it is, I would have been proposing something bigger than this in the long-term plan to stack up against other projects. So explain to me, because I am, don't mistake this for me not being keen about gully restoration, because I so am, but I also want to be fair and reasonable about where the process sits. Why now for the annual plan as opposed to working up something transformational again, game-changing for the long-term plan? So I think um, Rex probably summed it up this morning that this, and um, Bruce Clarkson, that this would be a nice start. Um, it has come out of an elected member request. What could we do immediately to help the groups that have been with us on this journey? So um, I would expect a more detailed proposal and bigger proposals coming to the long-term plan. Does that mean that we would still be looking to rework something uh, more long term. Is this every year or is this just one year? So there's two options in the proposal. The recommended option at this point is to fund it for one year and then revisit during the long term, long -term plan. plan. And that's where we get that longevity. And you'd Absolutely. Done, the, the committee would have done their work about, yeah. Absolutely. Okay, thank you, that's clear to me. Councillor Hamilton. Uh, thanks, Chair. Just a couple questions on the strategic case. I'm nervous now that I'm on the wrong thing, but I think we're on the right thing. Um, <laughs> so in the line under the pl under the pricing breakdown, you took WRC through Project Watershed contributes 245000 to the above operational budget. Yep. What, what is... Is that the $1.3 million? So um, currently council spend in our natural areas estate is um, $1.3 million. The two hundred and forty-five. dollars so Essentially, we spend um, 1.1 and 245 of that entire 1.3 is right. from regional council. Okay. Um, we do have an agreement with regional council, so we can't just use that money anywhere. It has to be contributing um, to uh, outcomes aligned with the catchment committee. Okay. And just on the plant purchases, um, my question is around how many plants that purchases, and I know that might sound a bit silly, Yep. But we've got, you know, targets around environment in terms of, well, potentially we're going to have plant targets or something like that. Does this, or do we know how much this contributes towards that? Um, so we still have got a lot of math to do in that space. Um, and so I think Ali mentioned yesterday that we have um, moved 0.2 of a percent, and that's without any additional effort towards the 10% um, target. So um, we would do some projections and calculations for that long-term plan in terms of what the investment and what we would expect to see for that. Yeah, OK, so there's two things you've raised there. One is um, a percentage of that target, but also just in terms of plant numbers by themselves, it would be quite useful just to know we've planted. That 300,000 buys us 50,000 plants or, yep, or whatever. OK. Um, cool. And also the 0.2 of a percent, is that 0.2 of the 10% the or is it... What, what does that point to of? 
um, it's off the 10%. Okay. So we've moved the dial. I think it, um, in the last 10 years, the dial had moved 0.2 of a percent towards the 10% target. So it's effectively 2% overall. Of the 10% target. Yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you. Mm. Okay, so um, we have a recommendation as a remover and seconder. Oh, Margaret, Councillor Forsyth, you'd like to move it? Councillor Thompson, you'd like to second it? Let's, thank you, let's go into discussion, deb uh, debate. Would you like to start, Councillor Forsyth? You want to say something? Uh, yeah, this is a, uh, a really good opportunity for staff to support and council to support our existing voluntary groups um, and I had the uh, good opportunity to speak to staff at ground level forgive the pun and um, just understood some of the constraints that um, that we face at the moment coordinating um, uh, different voluntary groups, but also managing the different uh, levels of capability within those groups as well. Because all, while we do have some members that are extremely skilled and extremely knowledgeable, there are also other uh, large groups of volunteers uh, that, that do not have the required level of skill or fitness or experience not only just in planting trees, but in, in um, removal, but of maintenance. And I had the I had uh, the opportunity one hot summer's morning to go out uh, to one of the gullies in uh, Silverdale and spent a couple of hours just uh, understanding a little more about what releasing means, uh, releasing plants. And it's actually jolly hard work that. Um, that planting lots of trees is only one element, it's actually continual maintenance uh, that really shifts the dial from um, having a tree that lives uh, to a tree that just becomes um, uh, fodder for, for the local animals. So um, this fund, and I, it's only for 12 months, so it's good, we'll have the opportunity to to uh, measure and reflect and see how if, how uh, well and how much effect, uh, how much effect that the 100,000 will have. I'm, sure, I'm very confident that it'll be money well spent and that it will enable our volunteers to move more quickly and more uh, capably uh, to execute the, the, um, the ongoing groundwork that they already do. It's... Uh, a good question, Councillor Hamilton. You ask about, well, you know, how does this, how can we measure and monitor that, uh, how well we're doing in this space? The reality is we don't have much to start with, and that once our climate action plan, which is a little aside, but is, this is definitely a part of that, once we really get moving with that, and we can we can have some baseline numbers and all all manner of uh, measurement, then uh, we'll be able to to really show um, our effect and how quickly and how well we're progressing in this area. Thank you. Councillor Thompson. Thank you. Just a little bit of background to start with um, of where this proposal came from. So not long after our committee structures were decided, I got uh, a phone call from someone who has, one of the volunteers who has worked in these gullies for years and they said we really just need a little bit of help and so that's kind of where the journey started where I have been uh, met with the different um, gully groups together at GoEco I've gone out to some of the gullies um, to see the work that they're doing to see also the impact that lack of assistance can have in terms of eroding away an investment of time and money that's already gone into these gullies, you know, if they don't have the proper support there to make sure that they're able to keep up maintenance and things. Um, it le there was a court order that came out in 2015 from the Environment Court, and it, 
I quote, it said at least 10% of remnant habitat cover is needed across the landscape in order to protect biodiversity and the functions of ecosystems. So this is the minimum threshold that we need. And that was five years ago that decision was made. We haven't seen any increase in funding since budgets were cut um, back in 2011 and 12. So this is an area where you know, we can see there's a huge amount of work to be done. We need to act urgently on this in terms of stemming the decline of biodiversity loss in our city and actually restoring and enhancing these sites. And this is a small amount compared to what we need to invest in this area. But why I would argue we should be looking at this now and not waiting for the LTP, there's a couple of reasons. Um, one is that we can get some urgent action by assisting these groups now. We can build their capacity. Um, my understanding is that the funding, the groups will come together, they will work with um, our team here closely to decide on how it's best spent and how it can best, um, you know, create, I guess, it can assist all of these groups. Um, and like an investment, you know, when we think of all the hours that uh, we're going to get from these volunteers, we get a whole lot more out of this than what we're putting in. And this is just, example, um, I guess, expanding that. But also, I think it's really important that we are building faith in our community again. I think, you know, they've had it pretty... These volunteer groups have been working on council land, putting in you know, sweat and blood and tears for many years with, with not enough support. They've given so much and they've seen this new council as ready to t take action and this is a signal to them that yes, we, are, we do care, we are going to invest in this and so actually you know, start ramping up your efforts because we're gonna work together on this. So in some ways, the most important part of this is actually community building and building that strength and that partnership that we have. Thank you. Cool. Councillor Taylor. Thank you, uh, Mayor Southcote. Look, I'm going to enthusiastically support this. Go, Gary! <laughs> Break his... <laughs> That's right. Bugs and slugs play uh, no part of this. Uh, look, I, I really... Um, uh, last year, I was very pleased to, you know, to support us taking an urgent line in terms of climate change. Uh, I'm very supportive of where we're going with this, and this is a tangible, good use of money. It's going to voluntary groups that are in place that know what they want to do. They just need a helping hand. I thought, um, and, and look, I will continue to support efforts to lift our biodiversity across the city in the LTP as well. So I'm looking forward to that discussion. I thought Bruce Clarkson made a good point this morning about the rate of growth in the city in terms of uh, the infill, the new housing, and we're doing that for a reason, people need houses. Um, but the other side of that is that uh, they need plants, they need trees, we badly need it. And the, and the point is, um, with 40 odd new residents coming to the city a week, with new houses going up all the time, if we're actually standing still, then we're going backwards. So enthusiastically support it and uh, look forward to it going through. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hamilton. Quote of the day, if we're standing still, we're going backwards. I love it. Um, look, I had the opportunity of helping out, it was a, a gully restoration day or something a few months ago, was it last year? And I ended up in Rex's gully and I was pretending to like move some vines and stuff and then he offered to give me a tour and I was like, yeah, I'll be keen on that. So I don't know if I offered much practical support, but it was very um, enlightening to see the work that they do and that really opened my eyes to the, the work that these volunteer groups do. I thought of... Um, you know, the role of council, I can sum it up in 10 words. I, I had nine and then Sarah said build. So anything that enables, enhances, augments, complements, supports, facilitates, encourages, encourage, aids, strengthen or builds. And like the last item where we've got a community group supporting the community, we can weigh in and support them to get on with the business just like we're doing here. So I'm, I'm really, you know, happy to encourage and support that. Um, taking liberty in my debate, I'm really keen to know what trees and plants produce more oxygen, because we're always talking about plant more trees that produce more oxygen, but I'd love to know 
what trees obviously produce a greater carbon uh, oxygen output than others and which soak up more carbon than others, as I assume all trees and plants aren't created equal. So that's just a little geek out fact that I'd be curious to know. But anyway, happy to support. Thank you. Um, I'm going to talk to it too. Love it. Um, love this. I would have, as I'm quite honestly said, I would have put this into the long-term plan in any case, but in probably in a bigger amount, truth be told, but that conversation's yet to be had. So I pushed hard for this in the LTP last year, didn't manage to get it across the line, uh, but this council looks different and, feel, and feels differently about the green space in our city and feels differently about climate change than the previous council did. So now is the time to strike while the iron's hot and get something done. Um, this tree planting is actually, especially natives, and we are talking about natives in the gully situation, is something that we actually tangibly can do from today to improve our environmental footprint. And so we must do that. So, yep, this, is, uh, this goes forward unreservedly in my opinion. Of course, remember, that all of these things are still in draft, so uh, we live to fight another day on those against other proposals but I get the sense that this council um, is likely to support this going forward, so that's good news. Thank you. Councillor Forsyth. Right to reply? Right reply, yeah. Uh, very quickly, thank you all for your support. I sense that there's going to be good support around the table. Uh, but in response, uh, Ryan, to your question, my understanding is that natives are the trees that absorb more carbon. It's not so much about giving off oxygen, it's more about how much carbon they absorb. And the reason being that they are slower growing, take longer, so they're around longer, etc. But I do say that there is still a place for exotics, <laughs> i.e. cherry blossoms. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Let's go to the vote. So now we're going to adjourn to just after half past three. The motion is carried unanimously. Um, because I don't think we'll get through the other one in a hurry. So we'll take a wee break and then we'll come back. Thank you. Hmm? I
We're going to, councillors, we're going to start so that we can all get away as well. Um, we're going to do the um, community land trust before the zoo one because Mark's on his way back and because I'm very flexible and agile in the way I do business. Mm. So we are going to go to um, the Lands Trust one, which is item, what is it, six? Ewan, it's got nothing to do with llamas. Just... Okay, yeah, you're welcome. Right, so do you want to introduce this, Helen? Good afternoon again, councillors. Um, so this request is for, uh, or this, yeah, is for um, fifty thousand dollars towards the operational costs of the Lance Trust. So um, Ben Scott has been um, working to, um, on behalf of council, to um, get that trust set up. That membership has been um, put together. It's, um, but we're just going through due process currently um, prior to the names being released, but um, that information will be come to, coming to you in due course. Um, and well, Energy has also granted $50,000 towards the operational setup costs of that trust, um, and this is uh, seeking another 50000 to really help get that trust going. Um, uh, obviously, the trust will discuss their needs. Um, once they meet formally, um, but this will be ensure they've got someone to support getting the trust underway and the right policies and processes and managing the investments and um, property portfolio going forward. Councillors, um, I met with the proposed trustees um, last night or the night before, I forget, it's early this week. Um, there are, I can't release their names yet because we're just going through a matter of detail with them accepting their position, um, so that's just a, a, a formal step. But we did have a, have a cup of tea and a biscuit and a good chat about where they want to go with this, and they're a thoroughly impressive group of individuals coming from the banking sector, the legal sector, the um, accounting sector, the housing sector, and the community sector. Um, and they are absolutely, I'm going to use your favourite word, buzzing buzzing about getting started and um, devoted and dedicated to doing things in a way that makes a, a tangible, real difference as soon as possible. They want to be transformational and they want to do, what did they, one of the gentlemen described it as transformation at pace, that this, this area was ripe for that. So I was really impressed, I was really excited by the caliber of people that we're going to have working for us. Um, so this money is to basically give them some resources so they can do exactly what they're wanting to do, which is work at pace to make a real difference in the shortest period of time. Councillor Pascoe. Uh, um, Councillor Wilson had some questions first. It's gone. No, OK, all right. Um, has, the request, has the request come from the trustees for this $50,000? Not that I'm aware of, but they were very um, pleased to see that they would be appropriately resourced. So has anyone prepared a budget, um, anyone associated with the trust prepared a budget to see where our 50,000 might end up? I see there's another 50,000 that's been offered by someone else, um, but is there a budget that gives us some... Um, some um, uh, comfort that our 50,000 is not going to disappear down a hole, um, and I'm sure it won't, but, but you know, we, we have, or we should have some accountability back when we're spending uh, ratepayers' money. So I'm just wondering if there isn't, and given uh, uh, Mayor Paula's uh, introduction that the trustees probably haven't even met, although they've met with Paula. They, they've met this one time, yeah. yeah. Um, perhaps between now and the 29th, could we get some some um, sort of information around how our 50,000 and whatever else is going to come in is actually going to be enough to get them up and running? Uh, sure. So is in anticipation of... Um, so there isn't... The answer to your question is no, there isn't a specific budget. The two $50,000 
obviously it up to 100. Um, so what that would do is get someone in place to do things like the budgeting, setting up their investment portfolio, um, their policy framework. Obviously, it's uh, but fundraising would also be, you know, for the for the ongoing operational costs of that that the the trust would also be part of that role. Okay, um, ha have we got a have we got a record of how much money we have spent? Council has already spent on the trust. Because I know we spent money on legal fees, yes, and there's been a huge amount of staff time that went into um, that trust deed, yes, um, and um, and uh, what's happened since in terms of our our involvement in getting the trust up. Yes, we do have that, and I can bring that to the April meeting. A breakdown of that, um, the hours and costs to okay. date, um, and then a bit more of a. Um, because by then we would have also um, met with the trust a bit further, so we can have a bit more. Ma uh, we'll have a bit more information around their um, initial steps. It would be useful mm. just to have that in place, so that we, if if if, if it does eventually get ticked off mm. as being as being part of the funding and the annual plan, that we've actually got some some uh, um, solid information that gives us the comfort. Yes. No. Uh, we we've got that to provide. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right. Thank you. Councillor O'Leary. Yeah, I guess um, questions similar to Councillor Pascoe's because I recall the conversation here, and it may have been Councillor Pascoe who raised them about when we approved the funding that what about operational um, um, funding to get it up and running? Um, and the comment back might have been from the CEO was that that, that support to get the trust up and running would be met through current budgets because it would be staff time and staff support is what's happened. So I'm a little bit concerned about this one and I'm wondering once this, what is it, 50,000, if this goes through, then what else are they going to come, you know, then the trust will get together, decide that they need more operational funding for X, Y and Z. So I thought we turned the tap off for the $2 million. Um, so maybe, uh, Richard, you're probably not going to remember back then that conversation, but... I have, don't have enough memory to work out whether or not what you're saying is bang on or not, sorry. Yeah. Sounds like something I'd say, though. I, no, I think it yeah. was. Yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, I wouldn't have raised it. Um, yes, yeah, OK. Now, that's all my questions, anyway. OK, thank you, Councillor Van Oosten. Uh, thanks, Mayor Paula. This is um, probably a question for you, actually, in terms of the trustees. Uh, is there um, any stipend or uh, no. anything that they get as becoming a part of that? No. It's not. They did get some cheese and crackers and an orange juice. No. So they do that out of their <coughs> sense of um, yeah, uh, passion do. for the project? Yes. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Councillor Wilson. Yeah, thank you, Your Worship. Question to you: um, Are there some fresh faces in that book, in that group of trustees? Yeah, absolutely. Fresh faces. Absolutely. Yeah. Great. <laughs> <laughs> that and was and it? actually, um, <laughs> by by Friday, I hope to have oh, I hope to have the list of names to you. But Good. obviously, with the busyness of today, I haven't yeah, been yeah. able to sit down. But you will have them, and I, th I think you'll be impressed with the range and calibre of the people included. And, the, and there were some that came close, but you can't have everyone. So, you know, there's a lot of good talent. Put the hand up. Councillor Bunting? Uh, Pardon? No, just kidding. <laughs> I was just trying to get a clue like Ewan was. Um, no, I think we're glass. Are they short? Are they. Right. Um, <laughs> no, this is the, just just uh, this is a one-off, right? Is it just a one-off fifty thousand dollar grant as opposed to an ongoing thing? Is that right? Well, I, I haven't proposed it, so yeah, it's basically um, an establishment um, grant. Grant, yep. yes. Yeah, so, so that once someone, because they are all volunteers, but there's obviously a lot of work to be done. Yeah, so yeah. it's really to make sure that we've got someone um, in place um, to to manage the operational right. activities of the. The trust. Thank you. That was my only question. Councillor Thompson. Okay, good. Um, so, anybody want to move this or? Uh, oh, Councillor Van Oosten. Councillor Hamilton, I saw next. 
Um, any question? Any further questions? Or we'll go into debate. Is there anybody who would like to debate this, Councillor Van Oosten? I hear um, what you have to say, Helen. Thank you very much. And I totally agree um, that a group of volunteers who do this because they have the right motivations um, need to absolutely be set up in the very best way um, that we can do that. Um, remembering, of course, where these funds came from uh, in the first place and the, um, the reasons for this trust are to support um, the ideas of looking for um, affordable housing solutions for Hamiltonians. Um, so the well-being of our Hamiltonians is, is absolutely at their heart. Um, it, it, yes, I hear that it's a one-off, um, and um, I'm okay with that at this stage. Um, I guess would want to be able to engage with the group to hear about what their um, ideas and plans are and look forward to working with that group um, in the very long term. Thank you. Councillor Pascoe. Thank you, Chair. Look, I'm struggling to um, fall over myself with support for this, not the amount, because I don't think the amount is significant, but it does concern me a little bit that Council put up the $2 million seed fund to get it up and running, and I hope that stays intact when it eventually goes into the trust and doesn't get uh, withered away with administration costs. But also we worked with and were told that there was a very healthy and wealthy uh, social housing sector out there who were dead keen on this. And to date, we've set the trust up, we've paid Council have paid for the setting up of the trust, the appointment of the trust, all the time involved in the appointment of the trustees. And now we're looking to get it up and running, and there's only one other uh, group within that social housing sector who's offering some seed money to get it up and running. And so it just concerns me that um, we have indicated um, an opportunity for this trust to get underway. We put some money in um, and we've said we don't want to be part of it. We want the social housing sector to run it and to manage it. Um, and, and really, they're all sitting on their hands and, um, and saying, well, you know, how about you put another 50,000 in? Uh, or we're thinking that we have to put another 50,000 in in order to get it up and running. So I'd be quite keen to see what can come back over the next month. Um, but for the purposes of today, um, I'm not going to support the motion. Thank you. Councillor Thompson. Thank you. So I look at this a little bit differently. Um, we, what, what are we doing as a council about housing affordability? It's clearly a huge issue within our community. Um, I was just reading the other day about you know, a story of someone who was struggling to rent a house um, and was living in an Airbnb you know, situation for six months. We really have a serious issue here in terms of not just buying houses, but also being able to rent affordably and everything else in between. Um, Maxine and I have started some work thinking in this space around housing affordability. Um, and you know, there's a really good opportunity to work with the Waikato um, Housing Initiative, uh, Regional Housing Initiative, to actually look what are some actions that as a council we can take, where, <coughs> what are we already doing, and then where have we got some room for collaboration. And so the Community Lands Trust, the reason I support this is actually something Councillor Ryan said a little while ago. When I asked him about, you know, what can we do as a council around housing affordability? He said, don't underestimate this lands trust. I actually think this has the, you know, um, the potential to be something really big and impactful. And so now looking into what we can do, there's options potentially around inclusionary zoning. There's other tools that we can use as a council to um, support this through our own levers, potentially. Um, and I think that you know there is a real um, opportunity here for this land trust to be something meaningful and to grow in capacity. And so I see this as a way to uh, you know just 
give it that first um, breath of life, that first step, uh, so that it can do a lot of that work in terms of exploring how to achieve that, and on our side, we can do some of that thinking as well. So that's kind of, yeah, why I would be supporting this. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor McPherson. Yeah, the Community Lands Trust was a fantastic initiative by the councillors who put this forward initially, um, and those who supported it. Um, but it did leave a little gap, which uh, Councillor Rob correctly identified as um, someone just said, Angela, uh, a short while ago, what about the operational funds? And I'm mindful of other outside organisations which we have supported facilities, activities that we've supported, where we've put in um, capital, the peak is a good example, we put in capital and we put in an annual operation grant because we don't want it, a, a shiny new building to fall over for want of organisational support on an ongoing basis. We don't provide the whole lot, but we provide enough to give it a, 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 some sort of base there, and I think that is really important. If you're supporting other organisations to get started that are doing uh, a job that you think is important in the community, you don't just cut them loose after giving them a few bucks. You should actually support them. I will be arguing in the LTP, because this is only a one-off, for some sort of level of ongoing support, whether that's best as capital or operational or a mix, I don't know. But I do know that we can't just cut them loose after a measly two million bucks out of the 26 or whatever we got from the ridiculous decision to sell off housing. Um, and I say that's ridiculous not because just because I opposed it at the time, because it is really important if you think about well-being in a community in New Zealand in this day and age that you look at the housing situation. I don't know how many people got an email earlier today from someone in exactly the sort of situation you were talking about, Sarah, out in the community that was sent to Paula and others um, looking for support because of the housing affordability situation she and her family were facing. That was just today, unsolicited. We get that sort of stuff all the time. I bet Paula gets it ten times as much as we do. Um, this is enabling us to get into the strategic game that we should be in. How housing affordability is ensured, is enabled in this city. We're not going to be able to do it all ourselves. We never are, and I'm encouraged that they haven't come to us first for this. We're second after someone else has already put up 50,000. I think that's a reasonable amount to match. I hope that there are, Rob, other organisations that, that do support this, not just the Well Energy Trust, and we've had indications of that, and there's different ways they can support it. It may be like giving land, for instance, in some cases. Down in Queenstown, they require um, major developments to put, I think it's up to 10% of their land aside for their equivalent of this trust down there. In um, Burlington and Vermont in the USA, they have a major organisation that was started up, a uh, community housing trust organisation, was started up by the council there, the city council, putting in the seed money, the start-up money, and is now running stuff all across their whole state because of that, and they have significantly affected the situation of people over there. We could do that here, but we've got to make sure it gets going. Thank you. Councillor Wilson. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Your Worship. Look, I will be supporting um, the 50,000. Um, <coughs> there is no doubt in my mind this country is facing a crisis when it comes to affordable housing. If that has not been, if that is a revelation to you, I don't know where you've been. Um, we've got to do something about it. We as a council, shamedly, a few years ago, sold off our housing. And I'm still terribly embarrassed by that decision. And everybody be, should be supporting this on the basis that even if you regret allocating the two million, surely you would want to protect it. Surely you would want to invest in ensuring there are capable people who are engaged to put together the proposal that will generate longevity and protect the two million we've already committed to. Now, don't think for a second we don't also want them to be held accountable. 
We do. But I think it's about having made the decision to invest in trying to address the issue of affordable housing. It would be disappointing to suddenly pivot and say, and we're no longer willing to invest in protecting it. Uh, so that's why I'm supporting it, and I would encourage others to do the same. Thank you. Councillor Forsyth. Thank you. I'm not going to support the $50,000 allocation. I think $2 million in cash is a great start, and actually if there to be any operational costs, any further costs, I mean, Council needs to draw a line in the sand, as with many other projects we have said we will do. Um, and this is just another example. I totally get that we have a housing crisis, and I totally get that the Council has made steps. I wasn't a part of the Council that approved $2 million, but well done to those around the table that contributed to that decision. Um, the Council has other levers, and as Councillor McPherson pointed out, uh, Queenstown has used its ability to uh, require developers to allocate a percentage of land. I think that's a really useful way that we can be contributing towards our ultimate goal of making housing uh, more accessible, more affordable. We don't have to keep putting our hand in our pocket and coming up with the cash. $2 million is significant. It's a great start. Uh, um, I'll leave it there. Thanks. Thank you. Councillor Gallagher. Thank you. My passionate opposition to a previous tragic decision of Council, re the sale of the Pension Housing Land Bank, that that had also is, is known, and th that is history and that has happened. Having said that, let me uh, compliment people such as Mayor King, um, Dave McPherson, uh, Rob Pascoe, Ryan, Paula, a group of us who were passionate supporters of this new initiative. Uh, and I'd rather the uh, quantum that we allocated, <laughs> two million, was actually spent on purchasing land and not on administration costs. Uh, I think we will have an ongoing participation in this particular exercise. It's one of the tools in our toolbox. And you've got to be really careful that we don't talk social well-being and it becomes a Dave McPherson coffee table book, glossy pages or glossy on the iPad. Uh, this is a rubber hits the road. And what is really important is that we, for a small quantum, uh, resource uh, this particular group. Now, we had a big debate around the co our comms and communication and strategy and engagement strategy. Can I tell you one of the best engagements you could do is to help a few Hamilton families get in their first home and get on with their lives. If you're looking at the significance of the spend, uh, this is life-changing. And let me hats off to Habitat and a lot of other organisations out there who are doing so well. I would certainly expect through the... Um, a community committee for a regular interaction between us and representatives of the new trust. Uh, I certainly going to look very keenly at what wonderful participation the other local authorities have in the Waikato region. I'm sure they're going to join us in, in showing fantastic leadership as they regularly do on other initiatives we take. Um, because clearly we have to be a little bit lackal around where does land get purchased, how do we do it. This is Hamilton Metro, as I, I would see it, but it would be a no-brainer at this point, I would suggest, not to actually provide some um, facility. And prior to our LTP, really look forward to the very comprehensive engagement with this new trust. Also, um, obviously I'm aware there are a number of people who would have been interested in going on the trust. How can they, those wonderful philanthropic people, be engaged as well? You know, so. One of the critical things to me is to identify the friends that this trust will have out there uh, in the community and how we can actually respectfully engage with them in terms of the philanthropic contribution and other things. So I'll be strongly supporting this. Thank you. Councillor O'Leary. 
So I wasn't persuaded by my good friend, Councillor Gallagher, but I have been, I've gone backwards and forwards in the last few minutes, but I have been persuaded by my good friend, Councillor Wilson and McPherson. Um, while I don't, sorry Martin, while I don't think it's going to fall over if we didn't support it, my frustration is that we were told we weren't going to end up being in this space and we could set up the trust without it. Um, I share Councillor Pascoe's concerns from the community. You know, I still don't know, and obviously it's early days, who else is going to put their hands in their pockets to make sure that this land trust gets off the ground. It's not going to get off the ground without community significant community funding and support, um, whether or not we give them a 50,000 operational grant. Um, I am going to ask that we move forward and that we stop talking about the sale of pensioner housing because I looked back on those minutes and a couple of my colleagues who voted against the uh, substantive motion were putting forward um, you know, particular positions and that, that, that I voted against. So I, I'd, I'd, I'd like us to focus on the future would be, would be really good. Um, so I have been, yeah, persuaded, but I do want some assurity that, like Councillor McPherson has raised, if we're going to continue being equitable in this space, as we have with the theatre, as he rightly points out, and we have with other, um, other projects that have come to us over time, that we do that in an LTP, so that in six months' time they're not coming back once they've appointed a manager and asking for yet another $100,000. The community is... Um, Councillor Pascoe has pointed out, has got to put their hands in their pockets. But I'm um, very persuaded to support this. Thanks. Thank you. Councillor Bunting. Um, thank you, Mayor Paula. I come from a similar position. Um, there's been some really worthy um, arguments around the table. Um, but to me, this, this, what we're voting on right now isn't about do we support doing something about housing affordability or not. This is about are we doing the right thing with this amount of money right now. Um, to me, I'm interested in seeing how it stacks up in April against all the other projects we'll be asked about. Um, I share uh, Councillor O'Leary's concern because I was pretty convinced that the two mill was it and, uh, and away we go. Um, but uh, I'm also um, swayed by Councillor McPherson who says you don't just build a shiny new hall and hope it, hope it fends for itself. This isn't um, about should we or should we have not sold uh, the houses. Okay, We've done it. It's done. OK, we, we get it. Uh, we, we, we've got it pretty clear who was on what side of the fence now. Let's please move on and make the right decisions in the future with what we've got. Um, so I'm, I will support it going through to the next stage, and I'm really looking forward to um, seeing how it stacks up against the other projects we have at the time. Thank you, Councillor uh, Deputy Mayor Taylor. No, you're gone? Disappeared? OK, do we have a mover? Oh, we have. We've got a mover in a second. All right, look. Yep, so I'd write a reply to you as the mover anyway. Just, just to add. Oh, were you? Yeah. Okay, write a reply to you in a minute. Just to add to <laughs> what everyone said, um, I was post pensioner housing and I get the challenge and tension and I, I also take Councillor Angela's point. One thing I picked up from the conversation when we set this up was this was almost like a tithe from the sale of those properties. And this was a seed to start this community lands trust. And I think today is really just about watering that seed because although the pensioner housing housed over 400 plus people, this has the potential to house so much more and provide shade for so many families and people. So, <laughs> so let us water the seed today. <laughs> So, <laughs> Councillor Van Oosten, I'm sure you can trump that. Right, um, thank you. Um, and, and in the interest of getting through the rest of the debate, um, I haven't got a lot to add, except that on the way into work today, I was hearing Radio New Zealand news, and while Mark doesn't really want to hear about um, affordable housing. This is absolutely what this is about. Um, and that um, what the news told us today was that 
February had the biggest increase in four years in housing prices, and you know that that is making it unaffordable. This is um, one lever, one vehicle to which might over um, overcome that. So that's I why it has my wholehearted support. In fairness to Mark, I think what he said is he wanted to move on from the conversation about the sale of pension sure. housing. Uh, apologies, Mark. But anyway. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> right, let's go to the vote, please. <laughs> okay, thank you, everyone. That oh. <coughs> the motion is carried, 11 for, 2 against. Who's the other against there? Do we see it? <laughs> it is going to come, but... Uh, Dissenting is Councillor Pascoe and Councillor Forsyth. Okay, thank you. Councillors, we're now on attachment 10, which is Waifakareki, the zoo entranceway. Lance. <coughs> Thanks, Mayor Paula. Um, quite a comprehensive uh, business plan in the uh, agenda on page 80, I think it is. Yeah, yeah page 80 to 91. And um, we've had a briefing on this and there was uh, um, quite a bit of discussion around that and uh, we, I think we showed you the, um, the PowerPoint that had the outline of the stages for this. So essentially there was an allocation of 5.9 million in the 2018-28 long-term plan um, with uh, about three million uh, to be found from external funding, uh, 2.9 from council, which is includes uh, inflation and the LTP. Uh, essentially, um, that original figure was based on um, some uh, concept plans from five years ago um, done for the master plan, uh, and as we said previously, relatively low confidence. Um, the team's done quite a bit of work uh, since then and actually looked at um, the joint entrance precinct and other developments for Waifakariki and the zoo um, so uh, and really looked at um, some higher confidence uh, estimates for this at 15 million um, so what what we've done is actually looked at um, uh, staging this and, and since the master plan was done there's been a bit of work done by the facilities team as well just around the state of the um, entrance precinct buildings at the zoo and you can see on page 81 of your report um, that there's some some issues with the buildings there and um, they're a bit eclectic um, being built onto over time and um, there's water tightness issues, asbestos, a whole bunch of stuff there um, which uh, essentially what Emily's team tell us is that they're end of life and um, the different parts of that of the, the end of life is between one and five years so um, they will need to be replaced um, and uh, so it actually fits in with actually looking at where we go around starting starting probably the, the first tranche of what was in the master plan approved by council. Um, the other thing we found with a couple of external applications to the Tourism Infrastructure Fund and the Provincial Growth Fund, we didn't receive funding from those and um, the indications from those funders and others is that we're more likely to get external funding for the Waifakariki part of the um, the vision, and uh, uh, they actually see that a renewal project at the zoo, um, and also uh, some have said if it's a commercial operation where we're getting significant revenue, um, which is about 50% of our operating costs, um, that they wouldn't fund that either. And um, there was a few other um, bits of feedback on that as well. So, so we've had a look at the funding plan as well, and I think we've um, come back with a more realistic approach um, around that. Um, so we've looked at staging uh, for, for this proposal and essentially um, we've looked at uh, pretty much stage 1A, stage 1B that we talk about, um, which is pretty much the renewal of the zoo entrance building, not the car park, um, also the Waifakariki entrance and linkage and um, then stage two would be looking at the car parking, um, working on the roading and also stage three then would go even further around a new function and education centre. I think a key part of this um, that came out and um, we showed you at the briefing was the, um, the, the cafe at the front of the 
um, arrival area so that you don't have to go into the zoo to go to the cafe. So it could also um, provide a place where people can get refreshments after enjoying Waifakariki. Um, we've got a growing population around that area too, down Brymar Road and beyond. Um, and, uh, and we um, uh, would be um, pretty much having a destination cafe, a bit like the Hamilton Gardens Cafe has become, and also the veranda at uh, the Lake Domain. So that provides better offering. Um, we've closely looked at Wellington Zoo's offering around that. That works really, really well. And it's almost a community hub in its own right. Um, so, so basically looking at, uh, for this proposal, is actually uh, having an arrival area um, that is um, probably this century rather than last century and also provides those uh, additional benefits and overcomes some of the logistical problems we have around getting people into the zoo, um, getting them fed and watered and also um, a retail outlet area and that sort of thing. The other thing is um, uh, you probably ask why now, um, not only the renewals issue um, but also uh, we're getting a growing number of people going to Waifakariki which is probably a really good thing after the opening, the successful opening we had. Um, there's a lot of interest and we believe that's going to continue and um, as we move forward um, having that wider offering of uh, you know, that conservation offering, not only at Hamilton Zoo, but at Waifakariki and linking the two together, which we're going to do operationally. I think we have a, a unique prospect to move this on and probably have another jewel in the crown, um, not just Hamilton Gardens, as far as a, a visit attractions go um, for the city. Uh, so, um, so what we've done is actually looked at staging this and actually being um, uh, reasonably realistic around our external funding. And um, the reason why that this has come forward is not only um, it's come from elected members, um, but also that uh, if we don't move now, then we would have to wait another year, and we'll be a year behind, and um, we've got those buildings um, that need looking at, and also we have um, the prospect of, of getting on with it and actually uh, moving things forward. Uh, I know some of you actually talked about um, what are the other um, components in the master plan that we could put forward in the LTP. I think Councillor Wilson asked for that as well. So um, staff will be working on that. Uh, there's a number of proposals there and we, we, have, um, uh, we have some opportunities to work in partnership with other organisations around those and, and uh, really leverage off those going forward. So, so I think we have a real opportunity here um, to get things moving. And, um, you know, uh, if we look at contributing to um, all the well-beings, then I think uh, this project um, does, does that um, very soundly. I'll leave it there and um, Leanne can probably a answer most of the um, technical questions. I just wanted to clarify that there are no um, llamas running around in our gully system. Um, I've confirmed that after a phone call from MPI during the break. Um, so we've told them that we haven't had um, anything escape from the zoo, so um, we're OK on that thing. Um, the only thing is, I found out llamas, I Googled it, they do actually eat gorse and weed, so um, and maybe, it's something, maybe it's something we can work on. Oh, you're just ahead of your time, Councillor Wilson. Um, just a question myself, and I see a couple lined up here. Um, I, I couldn't understand by the report entirely um, what parts were already funded and what's coming forward quite, quite, I know you've spelled it out here. I was a little bit, where did, what happened to the, you know, I pushed for the money for the opening of Waifokariki in the first part of the zoo, the plaza, the connect to the double-sided cafe, I pushed that through the long-term plan. It appears, am I right in, in saying it appears that that hasn't met, that hasn't been enough to do this next stage or? Um, the answer to that is yes, it's, it's not enough. Um, but particularly because the way it was framed in the LTP was the 2.2 2 million was effectively dependent on the $3 million being raised um, through external funding. So the one was contingent on the other. The total amount, which is in the um, LTP for next year, is nearly enough um, to, as a total amount to, um, to do option uh, 1A. But we wanted to be really transparent about that because, com and coming back and talking to you about it, it's because it does equate to a reduction in revenue if we treated that all effectively as, as capital. So the 2.2 million was there. It was contingent on the 3 million to have a lump 
mm. that we could do something with. And this is partly when Lance says the reason we, we're trying to get a bit of momentum is we can't really do anything with the money that's in there the way the current um, council resolution and, and the way it was put in the LTP was framed. Um, because so it we was spent in there as capital expenditure? Yeah, 2.2 million was. That would be enough to start a building, but in all on, in, in terms of being transparent with you, we couldn't complete a project. So we thought better to come back and, and rearrange, if you like, reframe the way that that money is there. Um, but also that interv intervening period of time has allowed us to get a high, cost conf a high confidence cost estimate. Um, and with the staging, what we've tried to do <laughs> is make it really clear that they're complete stages. So there are points at the end of each stage where we can come back and have a conversation with you about what's next and you have the opportunity to ask mm. questions and decide mm. um, how and when you want to invest. Um, okay, so, so that's that. essentially what we're doing. So when, we came, when it came to the LTP and we got some, schema, some diagrams and it included a... Um, observation tower which looked really cool and included some car park and some improved crossing over the road I don't know how far it went towards it with the, the Lima um, tunnel uh, or the double-sided cafe but I was absolutely certain in my mind that what we'd agreed to at least was that whole entranceway to Waifakariki with the viewing tower with the parking and we didn't get that and you're saying that's because that would have been built off the additional funding had we attracted it, or did the project become more expensive? Both, but essentially the contract, the project became, uh, when it was properly costed, was more expensive than the money that had been allocated to it. So the staff recommendation in this report covers a number of the things that you talk about, Mayor Paula, with the exception of uh, the car parking really. It includes the observation tower at Waifakariki um, and some of the improvements there because funders, the external funders are very keen um, to, to receive an application from us from that is what we've been told. The, the um, car parking in terms of the reorganisation of the road and, and the um, car parking on both sides of the road is, is being put in stage two. Okay, so the, the do you want to split the stages up, Mayor Paul? We can. No, no. I'm just trying to understand. So we've got what's in the annual plan 2021, which is 1A, 1B. You're saying your recommendation is go ahead and do that, right? Yep. Then you're then you're suggesting that we reallocate 350,000 for the walkthrough to something else, to another visitor attraction, and that we pull forward some transport funding. That's what you're suggesting we do through the annual plan. Through the annual plan, that's correct. Okay, thank you. Councillor O'Leary. Oh, there you go. Right, good. Um, Councillor Wilson. Oh, I've just got a quick question. Oh, um, oh well, you got, did you have a question as well? Oh, no, but you go for it. You. So I'll go after you. Sorry, go, Councillor Wilson. <coughs> no, <laughs> neither. <laughs> I just want clarity. I've, I've read all the options, one, two, and three, and then when it came to the staff's recommendation, it didn't refer to option one, two, or three. It referred to this, what I thought, a combination of things. If I misread that... Uh, is, it is is option, the, this recommendation reflects the staff-recommended option, which is option three. Option three in, the, in, in the its business, entirety. In, business, in its entirety. OK. Good. It's now... Very Which are stages 1A, 1A and 1B. 1B. Right. Mm. Yeah. Mm -mm. That's maybe where you, the confusion's mm. happening between yeah. stages and options. You've confused yeah. me. Yeah. Yeah. It's very easy to do. Apologies. <laughs> okay. Um, Councillor Bunting. <laughs> Thank you. Um, just a couple of quick questions. Um, the feedback I've been hearing from um, external funders, other than grant givers and the likes, is that they would be more inclined to join us if they saw some movement from us. Is that the same sort of feedback you're getting? Yes. Yeah? Cool. Yeah, absolutely. Um, how do you see the zoo, as it's currently known, um, fitting in with the gardens and the... Could you perhaps talk about the tourism offering, uh, the gardens and Waifakariki, etc.? So, um, uh, fits in with Hamilton Waikato Tourism's and Tawaka's, uh, the work they've been doing around looking at the offering 
not just in Hamilton City, but also across the region. And um, at the moment, Hamilton Gardens is, like I said before, is probably you know the most um, visited place by people from outside of the region. Uh, and they're quite clear that uh, we need other offerings. But I think with the zoo, if you think about what what it's all about, it's it's not just about fluffy animals. It's about conservation. It's about education. It's about recreation. Uh, so so it's got a lot of outcomes. And and with Waifakariki, what people are recognising is by having that offering as part of um, the way that that wider conservation park, for want of a better term, the zoo and Waifakariki would be managed and can tell the story of their um, indigenous uh, fauna and, and flora, then I think we have quite a unique prospect. Mm. And, uh, and both um, talking to Jason Dawson and <coughs> staff at Tawaka, they actually recognise that as well, that it would be another offering which would help keep people in the city longer yeah. which has all those additional um, uh, discretionary visitor um, spend benefits to it. Beauty. Thank you. <coughs> it's been moved, it's been seconded. Um, we'll go to debate. Councillor O'Leary? Um, yeah, no, look, I'm happy to support this. I, I just can't wait to see some new things open and I remember all those years ago when when I was working with staff on the zoo plan how excited I was and <laughs> it was a really long time ago um, and I always remember coming up with that thing fr from listening to to the community when we put it out there and listening to people and I came up with this thing saying um, that you know these are the pets we can't have at home and that is how we feel about our zoo um, and saying that linking it to the path uh, to the park is really exciting and I'm um, really excited about the new branding of that I won't say any, anything more because that's up to um, that you know that's that's a, a future stage, but um, we you know we talk about our visitor economy, and we've now got an economic development committee. And if we if we want to get people to come into the city to <coughs> stay to spend their money, we have to fix the eyesight issue. <laughs> but this is a real key, um, and I'm really excited that we are moving fairly slowly, but that we are moving. And I really look forward to the day where we are actually having events in the cafe slash centre, whatever it's going to be, that look over to a wildlife savanna if that's how it ends up being, because I know plans are blueprints and can change. Um, and then one day, hopefully, the future of, the, of this plan will also include glamping, because I'm so keen for that. Um, I, th I think it's... I think in terms of an innovative strategy and plan, not because I had anything to do with it, because I'm not the expert, but this was one of the things that excited me the most for our future, for our city, and actually for our region. It's going to be really, really special. So thank you, staff. Councillor Hamilton. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, this is HCC 101 for me. It's so long overdue. It's Hamilton Gardens has been getting all the love. It's got a targeted rate, it's got a governance group, and it's really tilted the access in terms of our offering as a city, not that it's not deserving. But this is the opportunity to do something a little bit back and create a bit of balance in our city. Um, it provides something in the northwest corner, and in conjunction, if Tiawa Lakes is successful with the water park and we've got Zeelong there, we've got a really good north end attraction zone. And so I'm really supportive of it. It ticks all the boxes from an economic, environmental, uh, social, and cultural point of view. And it was also really well supported in our 10 year plan <coughs> feedback um, two years ago. So I'm really excited about this. And in fact, going forward, we'd, we'd really be interested in looking at that you know, sort of governance group, if it's necessary, just to really support and really cement the, the work that we're doing here. Thank you. Councillor Bunting. Thank you. Um, yeah, you can feel it, can't you? It's uh, getting closer. And I, I thank Councillor O'Leary for her patience, because I realise how instrumental she was in the zoo plan all those years ago. Um, uh, Mayor Paula, um, Councillor Ryan for you know jamming it through the LTP last time. That was, that was brave in the circumstances, and, and, and you did a great job. Um, I'm not sure if I have turtle recall, um, and I will finish before my voice gets hoarse. Um, 
I'm not lying, but I just suggest to this council that we get off giraffe and do it. Thank you. Right. Oh my God. Thank you. Uh, just to say a few things on this myself. I won't be anything like that though. <laughs> I I also am going to support this. I have to say, with a little little um, kick though, that I was so when you came and told me that we couldn't do all that we had seen in the LTP with the tower and so on, I felt quite deflated, and it isn't. Um, from, from the point of view of I want to have more confidence going forward that the cost of something is the cost of something and that we don't have to keep nibbling back, nibbling back and then readjust because this project is a good one and um, Mark is quite right to acknowledge the work of Councillor O'Leary who did the original zoo plan which has got very many elements in it that are very exciting but we're not there yet. We're still at this uh, entry level to revitalising the zoo. But I do believe in revitalising the zoo. It's um, one of our top loved domestic tourist destinations and we should remember that, especially as we were talking the other day about not necessarily relying only on international tourism given things that, that can happen. Um, Wai Whakareki is very dear to my heart. I was there at the first planting many, many years ago and Every one, but since every one, but once since, so I was so excited to um, be able to join. It just doesn't make any sense not to join that asset with the zoo, none at all. So I guess that's why I was excited for the opening of Wai Whakareki and then a little bit like, hmm, what happened to the brilliant viewing tower? And sorry that we have to find more money to achieve what I thought we were going to get to anyway. Um, I'll just say that, and so you know. I would hate in another two years' time to have not been able to deliver this with the budget that we've got proposed here. Um, Rud Kleinpast, who's a very nice guy and totally uh, amazing advocate for, for green spaces, said that this was one of the best restoration, community restoration sites that he's been to, and he's been to nearly everything across New Zealand. So that was really exciting. I also learned that earthworms have hair at the same, in the same conversation. And you can tell the difference between, yeah, you can tell the difference between a, na a native earthworm and a non-native earthworm by the amount of hair they have if you would like to touch them, which I don't. <laughs> However, the point, the point being that we have one of New Zealand's biggest ambassadors going, wow, what you've achieved here is absolutely amazing. So we must connect it. Just let's remember that there's some practical reasons for this too, including the fact that crossing the road from Waifakariki to the zoo is an absolute nightmare and dangerous, and we've got to do something about that. Let's open up the cafe, because I believe the people from Rotoko, Bavistock, Rotokori will enjoy it from the other side and spend money there. So, yeah, I'll support it going forward at this time. Let's vote. motion is carried unanimously. Okay, councillors, that's the last, last of those um, individual items, but we've got the attachment 11, which is the forecast of uh, the register of significant forecast changes. And I think it's really important. We've put a, a lot in today. We've put a lot in to the annual plan. So now we do need to be um, as transparent as possible about what the financial implications are that Thank you. So you're leading this one, Sean? Uh, yes, thank you, Mayor Paula. And so just to be clear, what we're dealing with now are the budget adjustments. Mm. So these are the budget adjustments reflecting previous council decisions, which are in table four, mm -hmm. and then the um, what we call the CEO um, adjustments, which are in table five. So the uh, so the resolutions will be uh, so the table four is on the board. So mm -hmm. this is this is essentially the implication of decisions which the council has previously made. Okay, and then we, oh, sorry, let me get discussion up. Sorry, but, um, so about the budget adjustments arising from previous council decisions. I thought Rob wanted to discuss that, but he's gone. 
Um, so this is stuff that we have largely inherited or discussed, and no questions? Okay, then let's move on to the Chief Executive proposed budget adjustments. Are there any questions about that? No? Okay, it is what it is. Right, uh, financial strategy. <laughs> Do you want to raise any questions about that, or David, do you want to make a few comments for Sean? Uh, can I, in, just in terms of the um, the motions relating to those two, um, oh, okay. those two sets of adjustments, can I suggest that we just sort of deal with those first, and then... Okay, that means I have to go back to the beginning. Hang on a second. So it's the um, the motions that are on the board mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. Okay, so those are the budget adjustments. Someone move, happy to move. Councillor Taylor seconded. I'll second it. Okay, we'll vote on that. Go to the vote. The motion is carried unanimously. Okay. Can we, we're now going to the questions or comment debate around the um, chief executive's uh, proposed budget adjustments, which is basically just a title for catching up all those other bits that haven't sat in the other boxes. Any questions? So, me, Paula, if I can just uh, so those. Those motions have been voted on now that are on the board. Hmm. So the remaining recommendations in the report are the, um, what is C, D and um, E, and we had a slight change to E, which was a noting um, recommendation, okay. as I mentioned at the start. So it might be useful to bring those recommendations up on the board. So that's the adjustments made through the Finance Committee Form of consultation not being required. Which one? Yes, Richard, why is that May? Uh, you... So hang on, which are you referring to? Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, will, because you've, so you've assured us that you've yep, so got yeah. some things. Oh, coming. sorry, I thought you were referring to May as in the month of May. <laughs> All right, gotcha. Okay, any questions, comments on that? No. Mover. Councillor, Deputy Mayor Taylor, seconder. Well, I'll second it. Or Councillor for McPherson. All in, uh, let's go to the vote. Do it on the board. It's easier for counting. The motion is carried unanimously. So that um, brings us pretty much to the end of the day. Um, do you want to make any comments on any of the staff on where that brings us to? Yeah, I know. I know. We have got the public excluded, but before we go to that, um, just make a comment, as I've said before, councillors, that this is the first test of this that this all we have done today is to approve a suite of things to go into the draft annual plan conversations to inform the April meeting and go on from there to put out a proper draft. Um, we have put quite a few items in, so we will need to come back and look what does this mean for the finances. And as I said at the beginning to open it up, now it, the pressure will come on us about how we can do this within present budget, uh, mindful of our ability to balance the books, mindful of our ability to uh, keep a handle on debt. And um, if we uh, want to put more in at any stage, we're just going to have to start thinking of some things that are less priorities for us that we need to move out. In regards to when that comes back on the 29th, um, in light of the fact that there are no such things as protected species and all of this will be up for mm. meaningful re-debate, every line item, potentially, um, 
who on earth suggested that we'll go from 9.30 to 1 p.m.? Because currently that's what I think we've got booked in for the 29th of April. Yeah, I, I agree we might need more time, but to be honest, it would be disappointing if we went through the same level of debate on each item as we have done today, um, because I think we've had a really good discussion and digestion of these particular issues, the, the relative merits. It will come down to a balance, uh, a budgeting balance exercise in the next meeting with the things that we haven't seen yet. So we just have to re Look, be mindful of that. Although I never like to challenge you, Your Worship, you know I don't. You do. Um, I'm going to. <laughs> do. Because, um, uh, first of all, I would argue that, in fact, we may want to re-debate some of the issues here today. But more importantly, we're going to be getting a whole lot of new information from the Chief Executive. Yes, I agree. Um, stuff that we've had no optics on, potentially. Yeah. And I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be constructive, yeah. but 9.30 to 1 p.m. No, I hear you. Mayor I'm Paula, if going I... to work. No, I, I agree with you. Mayor Paula, if I can, if I can maybe help. Yeah. Um, so, so we're just having some draft discussions around... The following day, we have the Finance Committee. So I haven't talked to Councillor Rob yet about this, but um, we've had some conversations within staff whether we flip the Finance Committee date and the annual plan date, so we have a full day's meeting for the yeah. annual plan, just in case you need it. And um, the, the challenge will be, through the Finance Committee, if there's anything we need to bring through the Finance Committee, we're going to have to include it in the annual plan discussions if we're to have a look at the um, full impact of the, um, of the on the financial strategy of these decisions. So um, it kind of makes, apart from uh, information purposes for the Finance Committee, it makes recommending to council changes in the financial strategy, quite a moot point, given that we've got the annual plan and we want to use that as a base. So um, I'm, we haven't had this discussion, but I'm just, um, mm. Councillor Wilson, I'm just suggesting that maybe we think a bit differently and yep. see if we can um, swap those over and have a full day so that we can, even if it only takes three hours, uh, we have room for it to right. extend should we need it. Yeah, so those are, those are proper conversations. Because just looking at our calendar, I may have misheard you, but the Finance Committee is the day before not Sorry. the day after. So we might reverse that. Right. Yeah. Sorry, I mean, I mean, sw switch those but, two, yes. And then we've got the council meeting the following day after the original day. Yeah, so there are three days there. OK, look forward to it. No, I mean, on the 28th, we've got the Finance Committee. On the 29th, we've got penciled in the Extraordinary Council Committee. And on the 30th, we've got a, a council meeting. <coughs> so we've got some flexibility to work through that. Yeah. Councillor Forsyth. Yes. Uh, yeah, just from my understanding, so that when we come back on whatever day it is, and we're starting to make decisions about what's in and what's out, we've got our current financial strategy for the year, and I know we're looking at a th it's been approved that it's a 3.8% uh, rates increase, so that's the kind of an en envelope we're working within. Can we also have some options to... Um, presented to us which will um, deliver a less than 3.8% increase as well, please. So we have a range to work within. So it's not just this is what you need to do to get to 3.8. I'd also like to know well, if we cut this or cut that or prioritise this or prioritise that, it'll deliver a 3% rates increase. Or so in the April meeting? Which, yeah, whichever meeting is most appropriate, whether it's that one or because there's a whole lot of annual plan meetings coming up, which, which that's ones? That's a really, really, really significant piece of work to go back and look at level of service cuts across the organisation and the community, and that was not the intended purpose of the annual plan. The annual plan is about maintaining the long-term plan projections. We can do it. I question whether or not we have enough time to have the debate around elected members. This is, a, this is everything we do. We can cut anything, because that's that's what we are. There's already 100, I shouldn't say 100 million, you'll bank me on that, $94.5 million worth of, um, not 100 million, Councillor Taylor, $94.5 million worth of efficiency savings in, in the budget that we're working on, and there's a whole lot of upward pressure, downward pressure on that number. Upward pressure on that number, it's harder and harder to do. Um, if that's what this council wants, it's a significant piece of work. Just I'm, in, I'm, in I'm just signalling my my intentions, because I'm not necessarily going to support a 3.8% rates increase. I have no idea what anybody else's 
um, it's, it's not a discussion with. that we've had, and I, I'm, I, I try to be a very inclusive mayor, but I lead, I lead the annual plan budget, mm. and my proposal is to stay at the predicted 3.8%, mm -hmm. which the annual plan shows. I agree. And, I, and no more, no more. After that, we have discussions in the long-term plan um, that are far more reaching, um, and we can, we can look at the priorities in a completely different way and in more depth. But for this exercise, it hasn't been my instruction to staff to look at cutting below the 3.8% mm -hmm. increase, but I have made it clear that I don't want to go over the 38 And even that in itself, David, is going to require some level of service adjustments. That's right. I think, I think an important fact, and this is um, just adding a comment to the mm -hmm. debate or the conversation, is that the 3.8% the isn't about balancing our books in terms of our spending, it's about creating a surplus to repay debt. So so we currently know that we, uh, per, per the um, graphs and the balance in the books, that we're not going to balance it until another couple of years. The 3.8 isn't, isn't, isn't something that moves based on necessarily on what we're spending, it's about creating that surpluses to repay debt so that we create future headroom to further invest in the city. Which, to be fair, is your conversation about the Finance Committee preceding the next conversation we have about that, because this financial strategy that we have yet discussed, which we will discuss through there, um, which talks to mm -hmm. exactly that, when and how we balance the books, how we start to repay some of our debt and how we move forward, all of those things are encapsulated in those financial policies, am I right, that we're <coughs> going to discuss? So, Councillor Van Oosten. Um, yeah, thanks, Paula, and thanks for the opportunity to debate all of those items today. Um, it has been a considerable investment in our time, um, but I think a worthy conversation. Um, to go back um, uh, and debate them from um, the starting point would be unfortunate, and I wonder whether there's the opportunity to bundle some together um, in order to be able to... Uh, when it comes to our next debate in April um, to expediate some of that conversation. Are we, sorry, are we debating no, this is just feedback because we've, we've finished all of our resolutions. We're just about to move into... This only came up because Councillor Ewan raised a valid question about the timing and of the next meetings, which I think is fine. I do want to move forward, so in, if this isn't... Look, I, I think what Whatever date we agree to hear the information and make decisions, um, I want to get a better understanding of how that will be presented to us. In I can't provide that today, but I'm happy to. No, 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 but uh, because I, I'm just, is it going to be by exception? So is, are we simply saying, well, this is year three of the 10-year plan, and so we can all go look at the 10-year plan and here is the exceptions, and so if there's been any variations, decreases or increases, is that how we're going to manage it? I can't give you an answer today, but I will. Because that will really help to determine the flow of the debate. Um, okay, we need mo to move forward into public excluded, so last, last comment on this, Margaret. Thank you. Is this around clarity around the process, the AP process? So we have this next meeting on the 29th, whatever. Is that... The final day when we start to make the decisions, and then that'll be ratified at the next full council. Or what's what's the deal, please? No. So the so the 29th of April. Let's say 29th for now, and it might be the 28th. Yep. Um, so, a, a, um, Councillor Ewan's question around um, by exception. Uh, the comment we are making decisions that are an exception to the year three of the long term plan. Right. So that's why the proposals that we've looked at today are changes to yep. year three of the long-term plan. We're not relitigating everything else that's in the year three of the long-term plan. Um, when we make those decisions in April, it'll be for the purposes of preparing the, uh, I'm going to say final um, annual plan budget. That's what you will then um, debate and approve on the, tw on the 21st of May. So okay, April thanks. is... Um, it's another go. But the final decision is Yeah, and, and, the, and the reason we've added that April date in is because there are those things which uh, were circulated by email in the last couple of days which haven't got the information ready to be debated today. 
So we wanted to make sure that in April you've got the context for those decisions along with um, along with these. So it's the second to last call. Last call is the yep. 21st of May. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Cheers. Okay. Thank, thank you, everyone. We're going to um, move into public excluded. Thank you, Councillor Taylor. Seconded by Councillor McPherson. All in favour? Opposed? Carried. So we'll just uh, close the doors and... There's only staff in